Ralph. Chapter 1. Lancashire, England, 1794. Come, ye blessed children of my father, receive the kingdom prepared for you from the beginning of the world, grant this, we beseech thee, O merciful Father, through Jesus Christ, our Mediator and Redeemer. Amen, the rector said, stepping back from the graveside, before concluding with the grace. Ralph watched from afar as a final salute was taken, and the mourners tossed handfuls of soil into the open grave. He had never understood such a practice, throwing dirt on a loved one in their final resting place. He sighed, brushing a tear from his eye, and glancing at his mother, who stood stoically at his side. She wore a black veil, her head bowed, supported by Anna, her lady's companion. The funeral had passed in a blur, the military honors, the rousing eulogy in which a military chaplain had extolled his brother's virtues, the prayers and promises of resurrection. It all seemed so final. It was final. Max was dead, and Ralph was now the Duke of Lancaster. It was an honor he had never sought, an honor he had never wanted. But that was the tragedy of aristocracy, for a title to pass, death was necessary, and Max's death had come all too soon. The chaplain had spoken of honor on the battlefield, but Ralph could see little honor in dying on some foreign field in a war which still dragged needlessly on. What a waste of life, Ralph thought to himself. The mourners were dispersing now, and the gravedigger had stepped forward to cover the grave. They were standing in the family plot, in the churchyard of St. James, the church of Burnley Abbey, where generations of Ralph's family had been interred. A gravestone would soon be erected, and the dates of Max's short life carved into the stone. It was final, and Ralph could feel only sadness at the prospect of what was to come, a life lived without his brother, who had been his dearest friend. My deepest condolence is your grace, one of the mourners said, passing Ralph and tipping his hat with a mournful expression on his face. Ralph was still not used to being referred to in such terms. He had been raised as the younger brother, with no expectation of inheritance. He had not yet found his purpose, and now it had been thrust on him through unexpected sorrow. Thank you, he replied, and other expressed similar sentiments as they passed. All the while, Ralph's mother, the Dowager Duchess, Lady Diana, stood silently at his side, her head bowed. She had barely spoken that day, lost in grief over the death of her eldest son. In that moment, Ralph did not know what to say to her, though he had done his best to be dutiful in the weeks following his return from Corsica with Max's body and had taken his responsibilities seriously. He was the Duke of Lancaster, and now he had a duty to his brother to take up his legacy. I want to go home now, Ralph's mother said, as the gravedigger shoveled earth into the grave. This way my lady. There's a carriage waiting, Anna said, taking the dowager by the arm. I'm going to walk, Ralph said, still staring at his brother's grave, such a waste of life. His mother was led away, and it was now Ralph who noticed a woman standing some distance away across the graveyard. It was Teresa, one of the servants, and now she approached, holding a single rose in her hand. It was late summer, and the warmth of the day was giving way to a gathering storm. Dark clouds lay on the horizon, threatening rain, and a breeze was blowing across the churchyard, as though signifying the changes to come. I'm sorry your grace, might I? Teresa asked, and Ralph nodded. Of course you may, he said, as Teresa placed the rose on the now-filled grave. Teresa was with child. It had become more evident in the weeks since Ralph's return. There had been whispers, but Ralph had ignored them. She had been a loyal servant, and his brother had been fond of her. I'm so sorry your grace, she said, with a sorrowful look on her face, and Ralph gave a weak smile. It's kind of you to say so. My brother was. A good man, he said, and Teresa nodded. He was good to me your grace, she said, sighing as though recalling happy memories amidst the pain. They stood in silence for a few moments, and Ralph felt the first drop of rain falling, as a rumble of thunder echoed in the distance. You should get back Teresa. I don't want you catching a chill, Ralph said, and Teresa nodded, glancing at the grave with tears in her eyes. I won't forget him your grace, she said, 
with a look of determination in her eyes. I won't forget him either, Ralph replied. As the rain fell more heavily, Ralph watched Teresa go, bobbing between the gravestones and disappearing through the gate at the far end of the graveyard. It was an ancient place, surrounded by yew trees, the squat medieval church tower rising out of the moorland like an ancient fortification. Burnley Abbey lay a short distance away, on the edge of the moor, and a path ran through woods from the church onto the main driveway. It was this route Ralph now took, sheltering from the rain beneath the trees, though walking slowly, lost in his thoughts. A fitting tribute your grace, a voice behind him said, as Ralph reached the gate leading onto the drive, where the tree line ended. He startled, not realizing he had been followed, and turning, he saw the now familiar figure of Connor Edge the son of Ralph's father's advisor, and now Ralph's own. He was the land agent for the estate, having taken over the responsibility following his father's death, a man who knew Burnley Abbey better than anyone, and following Ralph's return from Corsica, he had been quick to offer his services to the new duke. Max had not trusted him, but Ralph had seen no reason not to, and had relied on him heavily in the weeks following his brother's death. He was in his forties, with a striking head of red hair, and bright blue eyes. Now he hurried forward, clearly having followed Ralph all the way from the church. Yes. I thought so, Ralph said, pausing at the gate, as Burnley Abbey itself came into view through the trees. Your mother seems inconsolable, Connor continued, shaking his head sadly. Grief comes differently to us all. I've had so much to think about, I've hardly had time to. Well, I don't know. I don't know how I feel. I miss him, and I curse him for getting himself killed, as terrible as that sounds. He should be here, Ralph exclaimed, forgetting himself for a moment as his emotions overwhelmed him. Connor reached out and placed his hand on Ralph's arm. He had been a reassuring presence in the weeks following Max's death, always ready to offer his advice on anything Ralph was unsure of. The business of running the estate, of managing the house, and attending to his wider responsibilities had seemed overwhelming, but Connor had been a steady guide through it all, and Ralph was grateful to him for his reassuring presence at this difficult time. But he isn't your grace. A funeral offers finality. It makes the loss real, and the future uncertain. But your brother would have wanted you to take his place. This is your rightful inheritance. It's yours, Connor replied. Yes, whether I like it or not. Ralph replied. They walked together through the gate from the trees, joining the sweeping drive leading up to the house. Burnley Abbey was a fine dwelling, one of the handsomest houses in the county, built around a central tower, in a Gothic style, with a grand entrance on its east side, and windows to the west looking out over the moors. The gardens were in full bloom, and despite the rain, a heady scent of roses and lavender hung in the air. Carriages were parked outside, for the guests at the funeral had been invited for refreshments at the house, and Ralph was expected to be their host. You'll find it easier in time your grace, I assure you. You've so much still to learn. It's only natural you should feel somewhat overwhelmed by it all, Connor replied. I feel as though I'm being pulled in every direction possible. I'm demanded here, or here, or here. Responsibilities lie at every turn. When I concentrate on one thing, it's to the detriment of another, Ralph replied, shaking his head. His brother had often spoken of the burden he carried, even as he had marched merrily off to war, leaving the estate in the hands of Connor. But Ralph was not his brother, and he was finding the burden almost too much. In the army, he had been given responsibilities, but they were contained and certain. As the Duke of Lancaster, it seemed he could work day and night and never finish what he had started. You'll get used to it, your grace. I'll help you in any way I can, Connor said. Ralph gave a weak smile. He was grateful to Connor for everything he had done. Not only for him, but for his brother and his father, too. Without Connor, he would be lost, and he was coming to rely on him ever more in the day to day running of the estate. I couldn't do it without you, Connor. I'll get used to it, I suppose. One can get used to anything if one has to, Ralph replied. I noticed the maid, Teresa Baker, at the funeral your grace, Connor said, 
as they walked towards the house. The rain had lessened, though a strong breeze was driving it in sheets across the moorland, where blue skies and black clouds made a strange contrast of light and dark. Ralph paused, turning to Connor with a puzzled look. Why shouldn't she be? Gregson was there, and a number of the other servant, too. I told him they could be, it's up to the butler how he organizes things, Ralph replied. Connor smiled. Ah, yes your grace, but... Teresa isn't quite the same as the other servants, is she? He asked. Ralph sighed. He had been trying not to think about the matter too closely, but Connor was right, Teresa was different. She was with child, and as much as Ralph had tried to protect her, he knew the matter would soon come to a head. A maid, pregnant out of wedlock, was a scandalous thing, and Ralph knew he could not ignore the matter for long, even as he was uncertain how much of his own involvement in the matter was known. No, I suppose she isn't. But. What do you suggest? Ralph asked, for he was uncertain what to do about the matter, even as he feared Connor's response. She can't stay here, your grace. She'll bring scandal on the house when it's born. Besides, a woman with child can't work as a maid. She can't fulfill her duties. She should be told to leave. Immediately, he said. Ralph was concerned. He wondered just how much Connor really knew about the situation, and at the same time, he felt terribly guilty. The thought of asking Teresa to leave seemed terribly unfair, for he felt duty bound to protect her, and the child, given all that had happened. Where would she go? And what would happen to her once the baby was born? He thought back to the sorrowful look on Teresa's face as she had laid the rose on Max's grave. To cast her out amidst such sorrow was surely a terrible wickedness, and yet Connor was right, if she remained, scandal would engulf them. I, well, I don't want to see her left destitute. I won't do that. She could be paid off I suppose, Ralph replied. If you pay her off your grace, what's to stop every maid in the house taking advantage? You know what these girls are like, Connor replied. Ralph blushed. I, but I can't just send her away. My brother was fond of her. I'm fond of her. She's worked hard here, he stammered. Fond of a maid your grace? Connor replied, raising his eyebrows. I was merely. We have a responsibility to our servants, don't we? Ralph replied, despising himself for even contemplating sending Teresa away like this. And servants have a responsibility to this house and estate your grace. An unwritten moral contract. A maid, pregnant out of wedlock, an unknown father. Imagine the scandal. Why our poor mother deserves better than that, doesn't she? Connor replied. This was the trump card, and Ralph had no choice but to agree, morals would certainly be called into question, if the truth was known and Ralph did not like the way in which Connor left open the question of the child's father. His mother had suffered enough, and the thought of engulfing her in such a scandal was unthinkable. Teresa would be paid off and sent away. There was nothing else Ralph could do, even as he felt a terrible sense of guilt for even thinking as much. They had reached the portico of the house, and the butler, Mr. Gregson, now opened the door for them. Good day, Your Grace. You'll find the mourners in the east drawing room, he said, with a curt bow. Thank you, Gregson, Ralph said, removing his outer coat and hat. Think on what I've said about the maid, Connor said, as they entered the drawing room, joining the throng of guests, who were drinking cups of tea and helping themselves to dainty morsels arranged on a large table by the window. Ralph's mother was sitting alone by the window gazing out at the ever-changing weather, a rainbow now having appeared over the moorland. Ralph approached her, placing his hand gently on her shoulder. She looked up, her veil now pulled back, shaking her head with tears in her eyes. Oh Ralph, it shouldn't have been like this, should it? She said, and Ralph shook his head. No mother. It shouldn't have been. 
but we live with what life presents us, he replied. There were times when Ralph wished it was he who had perished on the battlefield, and in his darker moments, he wondered if his mother thought that too. And what now? A lifetime of sorrow. Your dear brother, buried in the ground. I could hardly bear to leave him. I've asked Anna to take me there tomorrow. I want to sit with him and keep him company, she said. We should let the dead bury the dead mother. He's with God now, not lying in the grave. Think of him as he was, not as he is, Ralph replied, but fresh tears now rolled down his mother's cheeks, and she dabbed at them with a handkerchief, bursting into fresh sobs, as Ralph stooped down and put his arm around her. I can't forget him Ralph, I can't, she cried. No one's asking you to forget him mother. We won't. But we can't live in mourning our whole lives long, Ralph replied. The dowager looked up, taking a deep breath and sniffing. I don't think I can make that promise Ralph, she replied, turning back to look out of the window, where the rainbow cast its covenant across the moorland. Ralph straightened up, not knowing what to say, even as he knew his mother was right. Life would never be the same again. His brother was dead and buried, and the responsibility for the estate was now his. He had made a decision about Teresa, one he bitterly regretted, and now he wondered how many other decisions he would make in the coming months and years, decisions of life and death, decisions to define him, decisions he would have to live with his whole life long. Chapter 2 What a beautiful wedding it was, Miriam said, as she brushed down her horse. Her sister, Claire, was sitting on a bale of hay, and she nodded, smiling at Miriam as she rose to her feet. Didn't Grace look beautiful in that flowing white gown? I've never seen such a happy bride. They were made for one another, Claire replied, beginning to plait the tail of Miriam's horse, Scarlet. The two sisters had just returned to their home at Podmore Grange, following the marriage of Miriam's friend Grace to Henry, the Duke of Crawshaw. It had been a wonderful occasion, even as the road to it had been somewhat rocky. Henry was blind and Grace's parents had, at first, objected to the match, despite the deep love between Miriam's friend and her duke. But the inheritance of title, and the obvious qualities Henry exuded had won them over, and everyone had agreed just how well matched they were. I'm so pleased for her. You're right, she was supremely happy, Miriam replied, as she stepped back and admired her handiwork. Miriam had raised Scarlet from a foal and she was now a fine chestnut mare. They were going to ride in the woods bordering the estate of Burnley Abbey, the seat of the Dukes of Lancaster, and Miriam was eager to set off, even as her sister had complained she could not accompany her. I wish Flash wasn't Lamed. I don't know what that foolish stable boy did to him whilst we were away. I suspect he rode him into the village, despite my instructions to the contrary. He's pushed him too hard, and now I can't ride him myself, Claire said, looking sulky as Miriam led Scarlet out into the stable yard. It was a beautiful summer's day, warm, with a light breeze, and the sky above a deep, cloudless blue. He'll be all right in a day or two, then we can ride together. Don't be so harsh on Digby, he's still learning, and he does care about the horses. He was up all night with Jupiter when he had colic. But I've been dying to ride Scarlet all week. I've missed doing so terribly. Why don't you go and keep mother company? She's not been herself since we got back from the wedding, Miriam replied. I think she's worried about something, don't you? She and father, they were terribly quiet at dinner last night. I don't know what's the matter with them. But all right, I'll go and keep her company. Don't be too long, though, Claire said, as Miriam climbed into the saddle. I won't be. I'll ride out along the edge of the moorland, then into Bluebell Woods and back along the river. I'll be an hour or two at the most, Miriam replied. Her sister nodded, watching her go as Miriam rode out of the stable yard and along the drive of Podmore Grange. The house had always been her home, a fine, red brick building, covered in ivy, with tall chimneys, set amongst lush, mature gardens. 
The drive gave way to a track between two gateposts, topped with ornamental lions, and the moorland lay ahead, its pink and purple hue shimmering in the sunshine. The wind caught Miriam's hair, and the fresh air was exhilarating, she felt alive and urged Scarlet on into a gallop. Isn't it beautiful? She thought to herself, as she rode to the top of an incline, from which the full vista of the moor could be seen, disappearing into nothingness as far as the eye could see. This was Miriam's favorite ride, and now she took the bridleway running along the edge of the moor, entering the woods, whose name was now realized in the carpet of bluebells beneath the trees. Here, Miriam slowed the horse's pace, enjoying the spectacle of the flowers, and wondering if she might pick some for her mother. Her parents had certainly appeared distracted in the days following their return from Grace's wedding, exchanging anxious looks and whispering to one another when they thought Miriam and Claire were not observing them. But Miriam knew something was wrong, even as she did not know what it was. I just hope they tell us, she thought to herself, as she rode through the woodland. She was making for one of her favorite places, a folly in the center of the trees, built to resemble a miniature Greek temple. No one was certain who had built it, an eccentric aristocrat was thought to have been the architect, building it for his lover, the daughter of the Duke of Lancaster, some fifty years previously. It stood in a clearing, surrounded now by bluebells, its white marble edifice rising like an island in a sea of deep purple. Miriam reined scarlet in, dismounting to walk the last few steps, and leaving the horse to graze at the edge of the clearing. A stream flowed past the folly, gushing and gurgling its way in a gentle curve, and Miriam stooped to refresh herself in the cold, clear waters. As she looked up, she was surprised to see a figure sitting on the folly steps, with her head in her hands. She was very pretty, though dressed in a dirty dress, splattered with mud, her head covered with an old bonnet, and her shoulders wrapped in a brown shawl. She had not noticed Miriam, and now she looked up in surprise as Miriam cleared her throat. Are you all right? Miriam asked, approaching the woman, who could not have been much older than herself. The woman wiped her eyes on the back of her sleeve, staring fearfully at Miriam, who now realized she was with child. I, yes, I'm quite all right, she said, even as Miriam now saw a bruise on her temple, and cuts to her hands and arms. No you're not. Something's happened to you, Miriam said, her concern growing as she mounted the first of the folly steps. The woman rose fearfully to her feet, shaking her head. I fell off my horse, it's nothing, she said, backing away from Miriam, who only wanted to help. If you've fallen from your horse, there's a danger to the baby, Miriam said. She had known other women to have lost their babies in a fall from a horse. But the woman shook her head. I don't know. I don't need help though. I'll be all right. I've got to be, she said. But what's your name? You can't just go. You need to be looked at. We're not far from Burnley Abbey. I can take you there on my horse. They'll look after you, Miriam said. She knew there had been changes at the abbey recently, the previous duke had died in Corsica, and it was his brother who had now assumed the title. But their neighbors at Burnley Abbey had always been decent people, and Miriam was certain they would help this woman in her hour of need. But at the mention of the abbey, the woman's expression had changed, a fearful look coming over her face. No, not there. I can't go there, she exclaimed, shaking her head. But why not? It's only a couple of miles. Let me take you. I'll explain everything. There's no shame in it, Miriam replied. She wanted to help the woman, but she was beginning to suspect the baby might be a secret, one she was ashamed of. Many women fell pregnant outside of wedlock, and many took steps to keep their secret permanently. But Miriam was not one to judge. This woman needed help, and Burnley Abbey was the nearest place to get it. I can't go there, miss. I can't, the woman said, and it seemed there could be no persuading her. Miriam nodded, but she was not about to leave the woman alone, when she was so obviously in distress. Please. Won't you let me look at you? 
I might be able to help. There's nothing to be afraid of, she said, taking another step forward. The woman nodded, and Miriam made her way up the steps, raising her hand and gently brushing back the woman's black hair. She had a graze from the fall, and bruising to her temple. Her hands were cut, though the wounds were superficial. But it was the baby Miriam was worried about. A fall from a horse could spell disaster, and whilst Miriam knew little about midwifery, she knew a great deal about Mares and their foals. Is the baby all right, miss? The woman asked. Miriam placed her hand gently on the woman's stomach. She had witnessed many a mare lose a foal in a tumble, but there was no sign of a problem here, even as Miriam hoped the woman would see the sense in being examined. I think so, yes, but, won't you let me take you to Burnley Abbey? We could send for a doctor. You can stay below stairs, I'll speak with the Duke, he might not even be there, Miriam said, but once again, a fearful expression came over the woman's face, and she shook her head. I won't go there miss. I can't go there. I've got to go, she said, pulling her shawl around her shoulders. But the baby, what about the baby? Miriam exclaimed. It seemed the woman was close to giving birth, and the thought of allowing her to leave was tantamount to a betrayal. Miriam could only imagine how it would feel to be with child, alone and scared. I'll be all right miss. I promise you, the woman said and now she hurried down the folly steps, crossing to where her own horse stood amongst the trees. Miriam followed her, anxious to see in which direction she went. But where are you going? You can't ride out across the moorland, surely. Take the track to the village, or the bridleway on to Burnley. Someone can help you there. You can't give birth alone, Miriam said, hurrying after the woman who was already climbing into the saddle and struggling to do so. You've been very kind, miss. But I need to take of myself now. There's no one else to help me, she said, glancing over her shoulder in the direction of Burnley Abbey. Here, at least let me give you something, Miriam said, rummaging in the pocket of her skirts and pulling out her purse. It contained several shillings, and she gave them to the woman, pressing them into her hand, even as the woman tried to refuse them. I can't take this miss. It's not right, she said, but Miriam would hear no argument. Find yourself some lodgings, pay for a decent meal, and seek help when the baby arrives, Miriam insisted. Thank you miss. You've been very kind. Gentler than most, the woman said, and before Miriam could ask her name, she was gone, urging the horse into a canter, and disappearing through the trees. Miriam sighed watching her go, confused as to the woman's strange behavior. The mention of the abbey had brought a fearful expression to her face, and Miriam wondered if it was not from there she had fled. But the duke wouldn't send her away, would he? She asked herself. The woman had the look of a servant, and Miriam wondered if perhaps she was not embroiled in some scandal, unable to trust anyone, even a stranger, with her secret. But there was nothing more Miriam could do, though she intended to make a point of inquiring in the village as to any women who had given birth. She had wanted to help the woman, but had felt powerless to do so. And how did I even know the baby was all right? Miriam thought to herself, as she returned to Scarlet, who was still happily grazing at the edge of the clearing. Miriam had wanted to reassure the woman, but in truth, she had known nothing of what she was doing in placing her hands on the woman's stomach. She had witnessed dozens of foals being born, but it was hardly the same. There had been no signs of bleeding, and nothing to indicate a trauma to the baby, even as Miriam admitted to herself she had not known precisely what to look for. I can only hope and pray she'll be all right, Miriam said to herself, as she rode back towards Podmore Grange. Her sister was brushing down her own horse, Flash, when Miriam returned, and she listened with interest as Miriam described her encounter at the folly. And you don't know who she is or where she comes from? Claire asked. I've never seen her before, though I'm minded to ask the servants when we go in. Perhaps one of them knows her, Miriam said, for the thought of association had suddenly occurred to her. 
Servants knew one another, just as aristocrats knew one another, and having stabled Scarlet and promised to ride her the following day, Miriam and Claire made their way inside. Mother wouldn't let me sit with her. She was crying when I walked into the drawing room earlier on, Claire said, as they entered the hallway. Miriam sighed. She was worried about her parents, even as the encounter in the woods had distracted her. I wish they'd tell us what the matter is, she said, glancing at the drawing room door. Well, you can ask them, I'm not going to, Claire replied. They made their way below stairs, surprising the servants, who were taking tea together in the servants' hall. All of them rose to their feet in unison as the two women entered. My apologies Lady Miriam, the butler, Mr. Weston said, as the servants stood in silent attention. Oh, I'm sorry Weston. We didn't mean to disturb you all. It's just. I was wondering, this might sound, but do any of you know of a servant at Burnley Abbey who might be with child? I've just encountered a woman in Bluebell Woods, I think she came from there. I'm worried about her, Miriam said. The servants exchanged glances, shaking their heads, and averting their eyes, so that when she and Claire returned upstairs, Miriam was none the wiser. I can't believe no one knows of her, Claire said, furrowing her brow. Then I've got to discover the truth for myself. I can't stop thinking about her, and the poor child too. What sort of a life will it lead? Miriam said, shaking her head. She was determined to do what she could to help, and now she resolved to make inquiries about the woman and find her, so that some good might come from her evident tragedy. I've got to find her, Miriam told herself, even as she knew the difficulties her search would entail. Chapter 3 And good riddance to her, Mrs. Mason said, shaking her head. Connor smiled and nodded. He was glad to hear Teresa had fled the house early that morning. It made his own job far easier. He had made the short walk from his home on the estate for his morning meeting with the Duke. Ralph had not heeded his advice to get rid of Teresa immediately, and he had come to insist on it, fearing for the reputation of the house and the family he had served faithfully for many years. He wanted to pay her off. I told him it was a mistake. Pay off one. Connor began. And you'll pay them all off. Quite right, Mr. Edge. I don't know what he saw in her. She was just a little, well, I won't say the word out loud, Mrs. Mason replied. Connor smiled. Mrs. Mason had long been an ally of his below stairs. She kept him abreast of the goings on amongst the servants and it had been some months previously she had voiced her concerns about Teresa. I think he saw rather too much in her, if you catch my drift, Connor said. Mrs. Mason raised her eyebrows. Then thank goodness she's gone. I don't think the other servants noticed. She had the decency to let out her dresses, rather than let it show. But they'd soon have realized if her waters broke, or she gave birth in the servants' hall, the housekeeper said tooting and shaking her head. They were standing outside the pantry, their voices low, as the other servants hurried back and forth about their duties. We've avoided a scandal Mrs. Mason, and saved the Duke from an embarrassment. For whatever reason she left, I give thanks. Let her go, and may we hope to never see her, or the child, again. We'll keep the matter between ourselves, Connor said, and the housekeeper nodded. You have my discretion, Mr. Edge, she assured him. Connor nodded, before making his way upstairs. The house was quiet. The dowager had gone to stay with a cousin during her period of mourning, and the fact of that period meant no guests had been invited to Burnley Abbey, despite it being the height of the season, and the shooting being particularly good that year. Connor gazed around the hallway, smiling to himself. He liked to imagine he was the Duke of Lancaster, and now he drew himself up, adopting a pose of the late Duke, who was looking down on him from a portrait above the wide staircase which curved up to the landing above. I run this estate, not that fool of a younger brother, he thought to himself. Ralph was like a lost sheep. He had not expected to inherit, 
and having done so, he was floundering. Connor despaired of him. He could not make decisions, and when it came to the likes of Teresa, he had proved himself weak. Connor was suspicious of the Duke. A baby did not come from nowhere, and Ralph's insistence on defending Teresa, even providing for her, had led him to suspect the baby was not the result of a tussle with a stable boy or a fleeting romance with a footman. And wouldn't that be a scandal to rock the institution? Connor thought to himself, smiling at the thought of the power he wielded. He looked up at Ralph's father's portrait and sneered. The old duke had been weak, but Ralph's brother had been different, and for a while, Connor had feared his hold over the dukedom was dwindling. But Ralph was proving himself in the mold of his father, and Connor had no doubt he could use that fact to his advantage. He was still smiling to himself as the door to the library opened, and Burnley Abbey's butler, Mr. Gregson, emerged, carrying a tray of empty glasses. Can I help you Mr. Edge? He asked, looking imperiously at Connor, who had never liked the hook-nosed butler, whose bushy eyebrows gave him a permanent look of suspicion. I'm going in to see the Duke, Connor replied, for he had no reason to divulge his intentions to a mere servant, even the butler. Mr. Gregson nodded. I'm sure he'll be happy for you to disturb him, sir, the butler replied, striding past Connor, who made a face at his retreating form. Who does he think he is? Connor muttered to himself. The Duke's study lay along a corridor at the front of the house, lined with portraits of the previous holders of the title, which stretched back several centuries, and was gifted to the family by a grateful monarch at the time of the Restoration. The oak panel door was closed, and Connor raised his hand and knocked loudly. There was no response. He knocked again, irritated to think his appointment had been forgotten. Your Grace. It's Connor. I've an appointment to see you this morning to talk about Teresa, Connor called out. Connor hoped his words would bring a shiver to the Duke's spine, even as he had no intention of playing his hand just yet. But there was still no reply. Connor turned the handle of the door, wondering if perhaps the Duke had fallen asleep in one of the armchairs by the fire. The handle gave way, and the door opened into Ralph's comfortable study. It was lined with books, with windows looking out across the parkland at the front of the house, and a fire crackling in the hearth. But the Duke was not there, and Connor sighed, stepping into the room and closing the door behind him. I'll wait for him. He can find me here, it'll remind him who's in charge, Connor thought to himself. He stepped towards the desk, tooting at the piles of paper and correspondence, Ralph was losing control. He was probably fast asleep, shirking his responsibilities. He's a pale comparison to his brother, Connor thought to himself, though he had used Ralph's weaknesses to his advantage, and had been somewhat glad to learn of Max's demise on Corsica, as much as he had had pretended to the opposite. As he glanced across the desk, an envelope caught his eye. It was addressed to him, in Ralph's scrawling script, and reaching across, Connor picked it up, tearing it open and beginning to read. His eyes grew wide and angry, and he shook his head, a scowl coming over his lips. The fool! He exclaimed, tossing the letter aside. The letter was part apology and part explanation. In it, Ralph explained he had had gone away for a while, where, he did not say. He spoke of the difficulties he had encountered since returning from Corsica, and lamented his inability to follow in his brother's footsteps. He would return, but for now, the running of the estate was left in Connor's hands, and he urged the land agent not to come looking for him. The letter was signed, Ralph, with no allusion to the Duke's title or responsibilities. He had run away, and Connor could only suspect what he had already suspected, that Teresa's baby was Ralph's, and the two of them had fled together. Curse them both, he thought to himself, even as the thought of using the Duke's disappearance to his advantage crossed his mind. With Ralph gone, and the dowager in mourning, Connor was in sole charge of the estate. Mr. Gregson would not speak to him with such disdain now, and smiling to himself, Connor sat down at the Duke's desk, leaning back in his chair, 
and placing his feet on the inset leather. I wonder where he's gone. With the maid, no doubt. A love nest on the moors, perhaps, or even to Gretna Green. Imagine the scandal. It would bring the family down. What a fool, but I don't intend to be dragged down with him, Connor thought to himself, and now he felt only too glad to find the Duke gone, as he wondered what his own next move might be. I'm afraid it's nothing compared to Burnley Abbey your grace. We've nothing more than you see before you, the housekeeper said, looking nervously at Ralph, who gazed around him, nodding. It's perfect Mrs. Hill. It's just what I want. A house hidden away, far from anyone, where I won't be disturbed, Ralph replied. He had left Burnley Abbey the previous day, before any of the servants had risen, and rode to Burnley, taking rooms at an inn, before beginning his search for a place to live. Briar Heights, the house in which he now stood, lay far out on the moors, hidden in a narrow valley, surrounded by woodland. It had been a hunting lodge, belonging to one of the estates, and though modest, it was precisely what Ralph was looking for. He wanted a place to lie low and collect his thoughts. He was confused as to the future and had felt the burden of responsibility acutely. And there's only me here, and old Jackson who sees to the heavy lifting. Not that he's much use, the housekeeper continued. It was as though she was trying to put Ralph off but the duke was determined to take the house, and he would gladly do so without a staff of servants, or any of the advantages possessed by Burnley Abbey. I'm sure you can hire someone Mrs. Hill. A maid and a cook, Ralph replied. The housekeeper, who was a young woman, dressed in a blue dress with a lace collar, her black hair tied into a bob, looked somewhat perturbed. But it's difficult your grace. Maids and cooks don't like to be out here in such a remote setting. They can't go home on their day off, Anne. She began, but Ralph was not interested in the practicalities. Pay them double the going rate. It's no trouble to me. But I intend to take this house Mrs. Hill, and that's that, Ralph replied. As you wish your grace, the housekeeper replied, nodding to Ralph, who made his own tour of the house investigating the rooms, and feeling thankful to have found a place he could be alone. Burnley Abbey had become oppressive, and whilst he knew he was shirking his responsibilities, the burden of his title had become too much. He needed time to grieve for his brother, and to come to terms with the new life he now had. Will you stay here tonight, Your Grace? Mrs. Hill asked, when Ralph returned to the hallway. Yes, I'll write to the agent tomorrow and take the house immediately. But I want you to promise me one thing, Mrs. Hill, no one can know I'm here, Ralph said. He feared reprisal for his flight. Connor would be looking for him, and whilst he had not fled out of the county, he had come far enough from Burnley Abbey not to be known. Briar Heights, in its splendid isolation, was the perfect place in which to hide. He would be found eventually, he knew that but for now, the remote house on the moor represented a sanctuary, one he wished to maintain. Very good, your grace. I'll make up a room for you, and when you write to the agent tomorrow, we can send word with Jackson and advertise for a cook and a maid. It's a long time since anyone made their home at Briar Heights, she said, shaking her head. The whole house was covered in dust sheets, and Ralph now began to remove them, revealing ancient pieces of furniture and raising clouds of dust into the air. He opened the nearest window, coughing and spluttering as he rubbed his eyes. I'm sure we can make it habitable again Mrs. Hill, he said, turning to the housekeeper with a smile. I'll do my best your grace, she replied, shaking her head, as though she considered the duke to be quite mad. Gone? What do you mean he's gone? Mrs. Mason exclaimed after Connor had explained to her the details of the Duke's letter. I mean just that Mrs. Mason. He's left. I don't know where he's gone, but he's gone, Connor replied. The housekeeper shook her head in astonishment, throwing up her hands in frustration. And does that mean he's gone with her? The little. She seduced him, didn't she? The housekeeper said. 
Connor smiled. Don't be so hard on the girl Mrs. Mason. I wouldn't be surprised if it was him who seduced her. He had no cares, no responsibilities. He was going off to war. What did it matter if he left a maid behind him with a child? Second sons can do that. It can be hushed up. But he didn't expect to come back as the Duke, now, did he? Connor replied. He had decided to enjoy the moment of Ralph's humiliation. The secret of his flight could not be kept hidden. All the servants would soon realize their master was gone, and it would be impossible to prevent them from connecting the Duke's disappearance with that of Teresa's. There had been rumors as to her being with child, and whilst only Mrs. Mason had known of it for certain, the others would surely guess as to a link between Teresa and Ralph. It was all playing out rather well for Connor, even as he would make a pretense to the opposite. No, Mr. Edge, he didn't. I can't believe it, eloping with a maid. And not just for marriage, but, oh, I can hardly bear to think of it. And what about the dowager? What's she going to say when she hears of this? If we're not careful, she'll hear of it in a drawing room, she the object of pity and ridicule, Mrs. Mason said holding her hands to her face in horror. Your devotion to the dowager is most touching Mrs. Mason. But it's the Duke we need to think about. If he can be found, the scandal can be averted. Have we any idea where he might be? Connor replied. He did not necessarily wish Ralph to return to Burnley Abbey immediately, but he knew he must be seen to be doing something, if only for the sake of appearances. The Duke's return would only complicate matters, and he would be forced to confront the truth as to the scandal of a baby born out of wedlock. I don't know. There are houses on the estate I suppose. But he'd be easily found there. Perhaps he's gone to London. A couple can live in sin there and no one would notice, Mrs. Mason replied. I'll begin to make inquiries. For now speak only as necessary and see if any of the servants might know the whereabouts of Teresa. If we can find her, I'm certain we'll find the Duke too, Connor replied, smiling to himself at thought of how foolish Ralph had been. Chapter 4 But what do you mean it's all gone? Miriam exclaimed, staring at her mother in disbelief. I mean what I said Miriam. Your father's wealth, it's gone. We've known for some time but your father promised it would be all right. It seems now, it won't be, the baroness said, promptly bursting into tears. Miriam and her sister were sitting opposite her in the morning room, having been summoned there after breakfast. Their father had gone out, a desperate last attempt at raising funds. He had business interests on the continent, but recent conflicts with the French had brought them to an end and his fortune had been swallowed up in failed trades and feudal ventures. The money was gone, and Podmore Grange, its contents, and all the family owned would be sold. They were poor, as poor as the servants who had, that very morning, been dismissed. But it can't all be gone. Didn't he keep reserves? Didn't he have something to fall back on? Claire asked, but their mother shook her head. I'm sorry Claire. We should have told you all this much earlier. But I didn't want to upset you, the baroness replied. She was a handsome woman, tall and elegant, with long, auburn hair like that of her daughter's. But her face was sad and weary, and the sparkle in her eyes was gone. She was no longer the mother they had once known, but serious and anxious. I knew something was wrong. Before Grace's wedding, I knew. You were different both of you, Miriam said. She loved her parents dearly, and Podmore Grange had always been the happiest of homes. But lately, her parents had seemed distant, wrapped up in their own affairs. They had been arguing, and Miriam had heard her mother crying in the morning room, and in the evenings in her bedchamber. That's the reason why Miriam. We've been trying desperately to make things better, but to no avail. Things are going to be very different from now on, her mother said, looking forlornly at her. Miriam glanced at her sister. Claire was crying, 
and Miriam put her arm around her, trying to comfort her. It's all right Claire. We'll manage. We'll get through this, and I'm sure father has a plan, she said, wanting to sound optimistic, even as she felt far from so. All familiarity was slipping away. Podmore Grange, and the happy life she had enjoyed there, was all Miriam had ever known. She had expected it to continue, and now it was being snatched cruelly away. Her mother was dabbing her eyes with a handkerchief, and now she rose to her feet with a sigh. We need to begin making preparations. We'll live in rooms at the top of the house for now, and once we've sold, we'll find somewhere smaller to live, she said. Miriam looked up at her in desperation. Was there nothing they could do? But what then? How will we live? Miriam asked. Her mother looked at her fearfully. We must hope your father manages some means of investment. In the meantime, we must do what we can. We could take in mending, or, something like that, she said, her voice vague and uncertain. It was terrifying. Everything familiar was gone, and now another terrible thought crossed Miriam's mind. What about the horse's mother? What about Scarlet and Flash? She asked, glancing at Claire, whose eyes grew wide and fearful. Their mother shook her head sadly. I'm afraid they'll have to go. We can't keep horses when there isn't enough money to put food on the table. Tears welled up in Miriam's eyes. She had raised Scarlet from a foal, she was like a sister to her, as Flash was like a brother to Claire. She shook her head, determined to find a way to keep the horses, even as she knew the futility of her intention. I can't let her go mother. I can't, she exclaimed, but her mother shook her head and sighed. We've all got to make sacrifices Miriam. I'm sorry, she said, and now she left the morning room as Miriam and Claire put their arms around one another. Oh, it's too awful. Why didn't father tell us anything before? Claire asked. I don't know. I suppose he didn't want to worry us. I'll ring for some tea. One needs tea at a time like this, Miriam said, rising to her feet and pulling the bell cord by the fireplace. But as she did so, she realized the summons would bring no one running. The servants were gone. There was no money to pay them, and Miriam would no longer have a maid to bring her tea, or a butler to pour her wine at dinner. There would be no more parties, no more soirees, no more balls, or picnics on the lawn. From now on, they would fend for themselves, and no one would be there to help them. Perhaps we should make our own tea, Claire said, as the realization seemed to occur to her, too. Miriam nodded. It's all going to be very different from now, she replied. There now, boiled eggs, buttered bread and a pot of jam with tea, Miriam said, setting down the evening meal on the small table in the upstairs room of Podmore Grange, now serving as a dining room and drawing room combined. Miriam had boiled the eggs in a pan on the grate, and she had found the jam in the pantry downstairs. The bread had come from the bakery to which she and Claire had walked earlier in the day, and she felt proud at having provided a meal for the family, albeit in their now vastly reduced circumstances. Thank you Miriam, her father said, helping himself to a boiled egg and a slice of bread. The baron had aged considerably in the past few months. His hair had gone gray, and his brow furrowed. He had always been such a cheerful character, doting on his daughters, and Miriam in particular. But that cheer was gone, replaced by the look of a man who carried the weight of the world on his shoulders. You've done very well Miriam. You've learned a great deal in these past few weeks, how to cook, to clean, to make the beds. Everything necessary in fact, her mother said, giving a weak smile. It's not that difficult, really, it isn't, Miriam said, helping herself to a slice of bread and butter. Had it been a game, she would rather have enjoyed her attempts at cookery, and keeping the rooms they now occupied neat and tidy. But it was not a game, rather, it was a practical necessity, one Miriam had been forced to undertake in their newly reduced circumstances. 
she did not enjoy it, even as she knew it was necessary. But we can't live like this forever, can we? Claire said, glancing around her at the shabby room, they now called home. Selling Podmore Grange was proving difficult, and without servants, the house was falling into disrepair. The rooms they inhabited, what had once been the housekeeper's bedroom and sitting room, were barely adequate for their needs. The shabby furniture, small heart, and narrow windows were a far cry from the lower rooms, with their opulent furnishings, and large windows looking out over the gardens. To be reduced to such circumstances was a humiliation, and they had already endured the sympathies of several well-meaning women who had called on them to offer their condolences. It was as though a close relative had died, and whilst tea and sympathy were welcome, little by way of practical help was forthcoming. I've heard of women taking jobs, one of the well-meaning visitors had said, and Miriam had watched as her mother's face had turned ashen. But the thought of taking employment was not as far-fetched as it might have seemed. Indeed, it would soon become a necessity. Despite her father's title, and the trappings of their class, the family were poor. They were poorer than any of their neighbors, and even the farmers roundabouts, and the tradesmen in the village, now had more wealth than they. We'll manage, their mother said, peeling the shell from a hard-biled egg. We met one of the maids in the bakery today, Miriam said, knowing she was about to cause her mother an upset. Oh yes? Has she found a new position without too much trouble? I told them I'd give good references to them all, the baroness replied. She's still looking. But she said she'd heard tell of a position at Briar Heights. The house on the moorland. Someone's taken it, and they need servants, a maid and a cook. She said she wouldn't dream of going there. It's far too remote, but I... Miriam began, her mother interrupting her before she could finish speaking. That's quite right. It's far too remote for anyone. I wonder who could possibly have taken it. No sensible person, that's for certain, her mother said, tooting and shaking her head. Miriam had never been to Briar Heights, but she had heard of it, a remote hunting lodge lying far out on the moorland in a narrow valley, surrounded by woodland. It was approached by a bridleway, treacherous in winter, and a long, hot walk in the summer. It had laid empty for years, and Miriam, too, had been surprised by their former maid's news of it having been let. You wouldn't catch me going there to work, not for anything. I'd be scared in such a place. They could pay me double the wages, and it still wouldn't be enough, she had said, when Miriam and Claire had met her in the bakery. But the remoteness of Briar Heights had not perturbed Miriam from showing an interest, and as it turned out, the rate of pay was double that of any other jobs nearby. Miriam was a quick learner, and she was already doing the job of a maid at Podmore Grange. There was no reason for her not to do it at Briar Heights, for she knew she had to do something to support her family in this time of trouble. I'm going to walk out there tomorrow and offer my services, Miriam said. Her mother stared at her in astonishment, and her father spluttered into his tea. Miriam, you can't. What nonsense. No. I won't hear of it, her mother replied, shaking her head. Miriam times aren't so desperate as to necessitate such a thing, the baron said, but Miriam was adamant. They had been reduced to living in two rooms of their former home. The money was gone. There was no fortune, and no prospect of its return. They were destitute, and if Miriam did not get a job, however lowly, their circumstances would only be further reduced but we are desperate father. They're going to pay twice the rate for a maid. I can send home all my wages to you and mother. Why won't you let me? Claire can manage here, and I'll come back when I can. I'm not afraid of hard work, she said, feeling determined to have her way. Her parents glanced at one another, shaking their heads as though in despair. Oh, what are we reduced to? Our own daughter taking the job of a maid. It's too dreadful, the baroness exclaimed. But I want to mother. I want to help. 
I can't sit here idly and watch you and father suffer, Miriam said. Her mind was made up, and it would not be changed. Reluctantly, and knowing they had no choice in the matter, her parents agreed, and the next day, Miriam found herself on the way to Briar Heights, riding Scarlet, whose fate still hung in the balance. What a lonely place this is, Miriam thought to herself, as she rode along the bridleway towards Briar Heights. It was the height of summer, and yet the more possessed a lonely foreboding, and Miriam could only imagine it bleakness in the depths of winter. Briar Heights lay in a valley, its rooftops barely visible above the trees, and was approached by a rocky path, which crossed a gushing stream at a ford, before winding its way to a courtyard at the front of the house. The house itself was small, made up of only two wings, no larger than a farmhouse, with narrow windows, and a partially thatched roof. Smoke was coming from the chimneys, and as Miriam clambered down from Scarlet's back the front door opened, and a woman in a white pinafore and black dress appeared, her hair tied into a bob. Can I help you, miss? She asked. I've come about the position of maid, Miriam replied. The woman looked surprised, though Miriam was uncertain whether her surprise lay in the fact of Miriam herself or her inquiry. The matter was soon settled. We've had no response. Few women are prepared to work in such a lonely place. Can you cook too? We've no cook either, she said. Miriam was not averse to exaggerating her abilities, and she nodded, believing she could soon learn to make whatever dishes were required. I can, yes, Miriam replied, tethering Scarlet to a hitching post, before making her way up the steps to the door. The woman, whom Miriam assumed was the housekeeper, looked her up and down. You're rather smartly dressed for a maid, she said, and Miriam blushed. I... I need a job, Mrs. She said, and the woman nodded. Mrs. Hill. I'm the housekeeper here. And since we've had few other responses to our search for a maid or a cook, I'm willing to give you the benefit of the doubt. You've ridden all this way after all. Come in. You can have something to eat, then get started, she said, ushering Miriam inside. I was surprised when I heard the house was let, Miriam said, taking off her bonnet and looking around the hallway with interest. It was a dark, wood-paneled room, the ancient furniture, a dresser, table, chairs, and a snug by the fire, all made of seasoned oak. Stairs led up to a narrow landing above, and the pokey windows let in only a tiny amount of light through the thick walls. No more surprised than I was when His Grace arrived, Mrs. Hill replied. His Grace? Miriam said, looking at the housekeeper in surprise. She had expected the house to be let to an eccentric gentleman, the sort of man who wrote books on obscure topics and wanted a place of peace and quiet in which to work. The Duke of Lancaster. But it's a secret, mind you. You're not to tell anyone the name of your employer. Do you understand? The housekeeper replied, raising her eyebrows and fixing Miriam with a look of warning. Miriam knew of the Duke of Lancaster, of course, she did. He was one of the largest landowners in the county, and the news of the former Duke's death had been in every periodical and the talk of every drawing-room between Lancaster and York. But she was surprised to hear the new duke had taken Briar Heights, a house so remote, he could not expect to conduct the business of a dukedom from its confines. Why is it a secret? Hasn't he the right to go where he pleases? Miriam replied. The housekeeper narrowed her eyes. Maids don't answer back. If you want this job, so be it. We've had precious few other inquiries. Ask no questions and you'll be told no lies, Mrs. Hill said, and it seemed the matter was closed. Miriam was not used to being spoken to like this, but she knew her circumstances had changed dramatically, and she could not be choosy as to where she worked and what she did. She was willing to put up with the strange arrangements and keep the Duke secret, knowing she would be helping her parents in sending home her wages. I'm, sorry, I was just curious, that's all. And is anyone else here? 
Miriam asked. Old Jackson works in the garden, what little there is, and there's another maid, Teresa. You'll, well, you'll see. Now come down to the kitchen, you can have some soup, and then get started. A maid's work is never done, rather like a housekeeper's, Mrs. Hill said, and she led Miriam down a narrow flight of stairs to a kitchen, where a fire burned in the range, and a well-scrubbed table was laden with vegetables from the garden. What a different life this is going to be, Miriam thought to herself, as she sat down at the table. But she was determined to do her best, and despite the strangeness of her new circumstances, Miriam was glad to be doing something to help her family. You can start with the brass, Mrs. Hill said, when Miriam had finished eating her soup, and having never polished anything in her life, Miriam knew she had a great deal to learn. Chapter 5 Ralph was glad to have escaped the confines of Burnley Abbey. He knew he had shirked his responsibilities, and left others to take the strain in his place. But at Briar Heights, far out on the moor, he had at last been able to grieve for his brother. Max's loss had left a deep chasm in Ralph's life. He missed his brother terribly and would gladly have exchanged places with him on the battlefield. But fate had not allowed it and fate had brought Ralph to inherit the dukedom. As children, both Max and Ralph had always known their place. Max was the heir and Ralph was the spare. He had been raised to believe his life would be lived away from Burnley Abbey. Military service would give way to a worthy position in philanthropy, or perhaps, even the church. As the second son, little was expected of Ralph, he was meant to wait in the wings and when Max married and had a son, his waiting would be over. The line would pass down, and Ralph could look forward to a life of ease at his brother's expense. But that was not how it had happened, and Ralph had come to resent his inheritance, as new as it was. He was not meant to be the Duke of Lancaster, even as cruel fate had decided otherwise. It had never been a position Ralph had courted, nor one he and his brother had argued over. They had been the closest of friends, each understanding their role, and supporting the other in it. When their father had died, Max had stepped purposefully into his shoes, and Ralph had assumed he would continue in that legacy for many years to come. But then you went and got yourself killed, Ralph thought to himself, shaking his head, as he pushed aside the paper he was writing on. Ralph had spent the morning in one of the rooms at the top of the house, looking out over the untamed garden towards the moorland beyond. He had been trying to write an account of his time in Corsica and of his brother's death, but recalling such memories was only causing him further pain, and tore the paper in half, tossing it idly to the floor. I can't do it, he said to himself, rising to his feet and pacing up and down the room. It served as a bedroom, with a bed and washstand in one corner and the writing desk he had been sitting at positioned in front of the window. It was a far cry from the book-lined study Ralph was used to at Burnley Abbey, and he had banged his head several times on the low beams of the ceiling. Briar Heights was an oddly built house, uneven in every way, its rambling rooms and low roof, almost blending into the landscape, and with the feel of a house that had grown, rather than been built. I'm not going to achieve anything today, am I? Ralph thought to himself, and he was minded to take a long walk across the moorland, just as he had done the previous day, and the day before that. The solitude of Briar Heights suited him, though there was little by way of distraction, and Ralph had found little by way of diversion from his thoughts, which chiefly concerned his brother. He had heard nothing from home and could only assume his whereabouts remained a secret. His mother would worry, and Connor would be angry but Ralph was past caring about the sensibilities of others. He had come to Briar Heights to grieve, and he was glad to have done so. They'll find me eventually of course, he thought to himself, as a gentle knock came at the door. I'm sorry to disturb you your grace, I've just come to lay the fire in the hearth. Mrs. Hill told me to stay upstairs, she brought the coal up, Teresa said, standing in the doorway with a coal scuttle in hand. Ralph smiled at her and beckoned her into the room. He was glad Teresa had come to Briar Heights. She had been waiting in the village for his message, 
and he had sent a horse and trap for her, much to Mrs. Hill's consternation. A maid with child? She had exclaimed, but Ralph had been firm. When Connor had dismissed Teresa, supported by Burnley Abbey's housekeeper, Mrs. Mason, Ralph had felt terribly guilty. He knew he had a responsibility to Teresa and could not simply allow her to fend for herself. He had told her to take a horse and given her money for lodgings in the village. Bringing her to Briar Heights had been the final part of his plan, and now he was glad to see her settled, even as the birth of the baby was imminent. Let me help you with that. You can't carry a scuttle in your condition, Ralph said, hurrying to help Teresa, who blushed. His hand touched hers for a moment, as he took the cuddle from her, and she drew back in embarrassment. Oh, I feel so useless, Your Grace. I'm no good for anything, she exclaimed, sighing and slumping down on the bed, as though exhausted. You can't hide upstairs all the time. Why don't you go down to the kitchen and ask Mrs. Hill for something to eat? I want you here, Teresa, I don't want you hidden away. That's the whole point of coming here, we're hidden away, there's no need to hide further, or has the housekeeper never heard of a woman with child before? Ralph replied. He was angry on Teresa's part. She had nothing to be ashamed of, and if she was ashamed, it was the fault of others making her so. Thank you your grace. But Mrs. Hill says she's expecting answers to the advertisement for a cook and a maid. She told me to stay up here for the day. There's one just come, Teresa said, looking fearfully at Ralph, who sighed. He and the housekeeper did not see eye to eye. She was a formidable woman, as most housekeepers are, and treated Briar Heights as her own, even as Ralph was its new master. Well. What nonsense, I'm not going to. He began, but a sudden shout, echoing from below, caused him to pause. I won't hear of it. I won't be told what's what by the likes of you. You're not at Podmore Grange now. I do things differently here, and you'll have to get used to it, Mrs. Hill was saying, her angry tone echoing up from the hallway. Teresa glanced fearfully at Ralph, but the Duke had heard enough. The new maid? He asked, and Teresa nodded. I overheard them talking. She's a lady, fallen on hard times. I think. She arrived earlier today, from Podmore Grange I think. Her name's Miriam. I've not seen her yet, it's just what Mrs. Hill told me. I was nervous, you see, your grace, Teresa said, glancing fearfully over her shoulder, as the housekeeper's voice continued to reverberate from the hallway below. Ralph rolled his eyes. He had come to Briar Heights for peace and quiet, and he did not appreciate the thought of the housekeeper bringing in trouble from outside. He had heard of Podmore Grange, it was the home of the Baron of Mowbray, but Ralph knew little about the man himself, nor of his family. You don't need to hide Teresa. This is my house, and I won't have you confined upstairs by the housekeeper. Now I want you to go and rest. There's to be no more lugging coal scuttles around the upper floor. I don't want anything to happen to you, Ralph said, smiling at Teresa, who blushed. You've been ever so kind to me, Your Grace. It's more than I deserve, she said, but Ralph shook his head. I've been nothing of the sort. I was horrified at the prospect of seeing you put out of Burnley Abbey without so much as a shilling. I wasn't about to see you destitute, not after, well, I want what's best for you and the baby. I know it's a difficult situation, but I owe you that much, at least, he said. Teresa smiled, and she was about to reply, when another voice echoed up from the hallway below. Well, if you don't want my suggestions, so be it. But I think you'll find it much easier this way, a woman's voice said. Her tone was crisp, eloquent, and with the sound of one raised, not for the work of a maid, but the leisure of a lady. I think I'd better go and see to this, Ralph said, nodding to Teresa, as he crossed the landing and made his way cautiously downstairs. Ralph hated conflict. He had, by his own omission, been a poor commander of men. 
Decisiveness did not come easily to him, and when decisions were required, he found it difficult to make them. I won't be spoken to like that, you're down on your luck, don't play the high and mighty with me, Mrs. Hill exclaimed, as Ralph stepped into the hallway. He found the housekeeper in the company of a young woman, a very pretty young woman, with long, auburn hair, and bright green eyes. She was dressed simply, and yet had an elegance about her, with the figure of a woman used to the saddle. Her face was flushed, and she was holding her own against the housekeeper, facing her defiantly. I think it's you that's acting high and mighty. I'm only suggesting it would be easier to wash the vases in warm water than to be forever dusting them as you suggest, the woman said. Mrs. Hill was about to respond when she noticed Ralph standing at the bottom of the stairs. Begging your pardon your grace, she said, and Ralph raised his eyebrows. What's going on? I could hear the two of you shouting from the top of the house, he said, fixing the housekeeper with a sharp expression. He did not particularly care for Mrs. Hill. She reminded him of Mrs. Mason, a woman who could present a front, whilst concealing an unpleasant demeanor. Mrs. Mason's treatment of Teresa was evidence enough of that, and now, it seemed, Mrs. Hill was behaving in the same manner towards the new maid. I'm explaining to the new maid how we do things here at Briar Heights your grace. But it seems she knows better, the housekeeper replied, scowling at Miriam, who held her gaze, her eyes flashing with anger. Ralph admired her spirit, even as he felt uncertain as to who was actually right in their assertion concerning dusting or washing the vases which stood on the mantelpiece in the hallway. Well, it hardly matters, does it? Why not try washing them? Ralph replied. He had never understood the capacity of servants to make a fuss over nothing. A vase was a vase, and how it was cleaned was of no consequence. I won't be usurped your grace, Mrs. Hill said, folding her arms. Miriam threw her hands up in exasperation. Do as you please then. Make more work for yourself. I don't care, she replied. Ralph could not help but smile. It was clear the new maid was not used to the hierarchy amongst servants, or to the proper manner in which to speak in front of her employer. Servants were to be seen and not heard, and the less seen, the better. But Miriam was larger than life, a feisty character, whom Ralph had taken an instant liking to. She was attractive, and he was interested in learning more about what had brought her to Briar Heights. You're the daughter of the Baron of Mowbray? He asked, and Miriam nodded, as Mrs. Hill tooted. That's right, Your Grace. I'm afraid my family's fallen on hard time. I had to take a job, and since no one else has applied to work here, it seems you're stuck with me, she said, chancing a glare at the housekeeper, who gave an angry exclamation in return. I won't have it, Your Grace. She can leave now, I won't put up with her. I won't have an upstart little. The housekeeper began, but Ralph had heard enough. Or you could leave Mrs. Hill, he said, causing the housekeeper to gasp, staring at him in astonishment. Ralph had been hoping for an excuse to get rid of her. The meal she had cooked had been tasteless, the beds were not properly made, several of his shirts had been stained, and the house itself left much to be desired for its cleanliness. But, you can't do that your grace, Mrs. Hill exclaimed. Can't I? Aren't I at liberty to decide whom I employ and whom I dismiss? Ralph replied. Mrs. Hill's face grew red with anger, and she pointed her finger at Ralph, who faced her with the same defiance as Miriam. You'll be sorry, you and that little harlot you've got upstairs, she snarled, and pulling off her apron, she tossed it to the floor before marching out of the house and slamming the door behind her. Ralph rolled his eyes, glancing at Miriam, who breathed a sigh of relief. What a horrible woman. I'm sorry if I've caused you any difficulties, Your Grace. I merely questioned her particular way of doing things. I've never seen anyone grow so angry so quickly, she said, shaking her head. Ralph smiled. Actually, I think you've done me a service. It's Miss Miriam, isn't it? He asked, uncertain of what he should call her, 
now her family's circumstances were so reduced. That's right your grace. My father's the Baron of Mowbray. But, well, I won't bore you with the details. He made some bad investments, we've lost a lot of money, and, well, I felt I had no choice but to take a job. I know I've got a lot to learn, but I'm sure I'll manage, and if there's another maid, she can teach me," Miriam said. Ralph nodded. He was not particularly interested in the details of the story. Miriam, like himself, was the victim of unfortunate circumstances, and he could only admire her for trying to do something about it, rather than wallowing in self-pity. It was a reminder to himself, for in retreating to Briar Heights, he was doing just that, wallowing in self-pity. Ah, well, yes, Teresa isn't. She's expecting a baby, Ralph said, not wishing Miriam to think ill of the maid, whom Mrs. Hill has described in such unpleasant terms. Really? The poor thing. How good of you to take her in, Miriam said. Yes, well, I, it's the right thing to do. I couldn't have sent her away from Burnley Abbey, not as she is. She was, a good servant, and, well, that's that. Ralph replied. It felt strange speaking to a maid in such a way, but Miriam was not a maid, not really. She moved in the same social circles as Ralph, and he had seen her on occasion at balls and soirees in the district, though he really knew little about her. But compared to Mrs. Hill, he felt certain Miriam would be a far less difficult prospect, and he was glad to give her the chance of employment if it meant helping her family in their hour of need. I'm sure you've proved yourself a good employer, Your Grace. But I'd best get started, I suppose, though I've not been shown where I'm to sleep, Miriam said. Teresa can show you, I'm sure, Ralph replied, glad the conflict was over, and Miriam was willing to work amidst the unusual domestic arrangements of the house. Might I find her somewhere? Miriam asked, and Ralph nodded. Yes, I'll call her, he replied, but calling out Teresa's name, Ralph received no reply. Chapter 6 Miriam had not been intimidated by Mrs. Hill. The housekeeper had set a bowl of soup before her, informing her of her duties, and making it clear as to who ruled the roost. But Miriam was not used to taking orders, even as she knew she was no longer in the privileged position of a lady. You'll do as I say, and nothing more the housekeeper had told her, but Miriam was not used to doing as anyone said, and when Mrs. Hill had set her to work Miriam had immediately believed her own methods to be superior. The question of how to dust the vases in the hallway had ended in an almighty argument, and it was this argument the Duke had unwittingly stepped into. But Miriam was glad of her triumph, even as she felt certain Mrs. Hill would not let the matter of her dismissal rest. I just hope I can live up to expectations, Miriam had said to herself, as the Duke had called up the stairs for the other maid, whose story seemed quite astonishing. Miriam could only imagine what circumstances had led to a maid finding herself with child, and she was curious to meet the woman and discover why the Duke of Lancaster should be so intent on protecting her. He had spoken of doing the right thing and how he could not possibly have dismissed her as she was but it seemed an overly compassionate thing for an aristocrat to do, even as Miriam really knew nothing of the man or his temperament. The entire situation was odd, though Miriam was not about to question it directly. Why had the Duke come to such a remote and out-of-the-way place? Was he hiding from someone, or was he hiding someone? I don't know where she is, the Duke said, a note of panic rising in his voice as he called out Teresa's name once again. I'm sure she's quite all right. Shall we go and look for her? Miriam replied. Yes, she was upstairs before. I told her to go and rest. Mrs. Hill had her lugging coal scuttles around the place, the wicked woman, the Duke said, and now he hurried up the stairs, as Miriam followed. She's probably just fallen asleep, Miriam replied, but as they reached the top of the stairs, she was horrified to see a pair of stockinged legs sticking out of one of the bedroom doors, and it seemed the maid had collapsed. Ralph rushed forward with a cry, 
his tone seeming far more concerned than might be expected for a mere servant. Teresa, are you all right? Oh, goodness me, he exclaimed, as Miriam hurried to help. As she pushed open the bedroom door, her eyes grew wide with astonishment. The woman lying before her was none other than the girl she had encountered by the folly, the one who had looked so fearful at the mention of Burnley Abbey, and whose fate had been playing on Miriam's mind ever since. Goodness me, the poor thing, Miriam exclaimed, for there was no time to question this astonishing sight, as Ralph helped the dazed maid to sit up. I'm sorry your grace, I fainted, she said, staring up at Miriam, with wide-eyed recognition. I told you not to overdo it. Come now, we need to get you into bed. Will you fetch a jug of water, Miriam? The Duke asked, and Miriam hurried down to the kitchen, taking a jug and filling it from the pump in the yard at the back of the house. When she returned upstairs, she found the Duke had helped Teresa into bed, and she was sitting with a blanket pulled up, her cheeks pale, as the Duke sat at her side. I'm sorry, she kept repeating. You've nothing to be sorry for. It's that dreadful woman working you too hard. But she's gone now. There's nothing to fear. Take a drink of water, the Duke said, still with an obvious concern in his voice. Miriam wondered if he was as attentive to all his servants, and now a question posed itself, one she felt curious to know the answer to, was this the Duke's baby? There you are Teresa, drink this. It's nice and cold, Miriam said, pouring Teresa a glass of water from the jug. Thank you. I feel a little better now, she said, and Miriam smiled at her. You're quite well advanced. You shouldn't have been carrying anything, I thought as much when. She began, but checked herself before making any mention of her encounter with Teresa in Bluebell Woods. I'll fetch you something to eat, Teresa. Stay with her, will you, Miriam? The Duke said, and Miriam nodded. It's all right, Your Grace. I'll see to everything. If I'm to be the housekeeper, then I should begin my duties at once, Miriam said. She felt sorry for Teresa, just as she had following their encounter in the woods. But she was glad to see the Duke taking responsibility for the child, and it seemed she had been right as to its lineage. The Duke's retreat to Briar Heights made perfect sense, he had brought Teresa there to have the baby. His baby. Miriam was not scandalized by this fact. She was not so naive as to believe an aristocrat and a maid might not fall in love. Teresa was an attractive woman, and the Duke was an attractive man. Thank you. But if you feel at all worse Teresa, we must summon the doctor, the Duke said, before leaving the room. Miriam and Teresa were left alone, and the maid looked embarrassed, for it was clear she remembered their encounter in Bluebell Woods too. Are you sure you feel better? Miriam asked, refilling Teresa's glass with water. I think so, yes but it came on so suddenly. I could hear Mrs. Hill shouting, and then I was on the floor, Teresa replied. Miriam sat down on the edge of the bed and took Teresa's hand in hers. She felt a sense of responsibility towards her, even as she knew there was nothing else she could have done following their previous meeting. I was worried about you the other day. I made some inquiries, but no one knew anything about you, Miriam said. She had asked in the village, and even spoken to the curate, inquiring as to where he knew of any women in difficult circumstances. But Teresa had disappeared, and Miriam now knew something of the rest of her story. I stayed at an inn on the London Road, miss. Then his grace sent for me, Teresa said. Miriam wondered if they were in love. The duke was acting honorably, as far as he could but there could surely be no future in such a remarkable situation. Dukes and maids, whilst entirely able to conceive a child, did not marry. The scandal would be extraordinary, and Miriam could only imagine what the Duke intended for their future. He's been very good to you, hasn't he? It's all right, Teresa. I only want to help you. I won't judge you, or the Duke. 
I only wish I could have done more for you when first we met, Miriam said, for she was feeling terribly guilty for not having insisted on accompanying Teresa to the village and finding help for her. I didn't want any help, miss. I knew where I was going, and from what I was fleeing, Teresa replied. Miriam was confused. She did not understand why Teresa should have appeared due fearful at the mention of Burnley Abbey, when the Duke himself was its master. But. I don't understand. You ran away from Burnley Abbey, and yet you're with the Duke. Is it because, he's the father of the child? Miriam asked. She had no qualms in speaking her mind, even as Teresa's eyes grew wide with astonishment. Oh miss, no, that's not true. No, not at all, she gasped, and Miriam looked at her in confusion. She had been convinced as to her own version of events. The Duke's concern for Teresa was obvious, and there could be no other explanation for his behavior towards her, save the obvious paternal connection to the unborn child. It's all right, you don't need to pretend with me Teresa. I understand, and I'm sure His Grace is going to do everything he can to help you. I don't want you to raise your hopes as to the future though. No one can know the child's father, of course. Miriam began, but Teresa interrupted her. No, you don't understand. It's not him, it's not. Ralph, it's his brother, Max, Teresa replied. Miriam's eyes grew wide, and she startled, astonished at this fresh revelation, one she had not even entertained as a possibility. The deceased Duke? She exclaimed, and Teresa nodded. She seemed to trust Miriam, perhaps because of their previous encounter in Bluebell Woods. Miriam wanted only to help the maid, and now she smiled at her reassuringly, urging her to continue with her story. It was before he went off to fight. It wasn't supposed to be of course. It just, happened. We were in love. He told me he loved me before he left, and then, he died, and I couldn't tell anyone, except his grace of course. He knew. He'd known for some time. Brothers do, I suppose, she said, her lip trembling, as tears welled up in her eyes. Oh you poor thing, Miriam exclaimed, feeling terribly sorry for Teresa, and now understanding why Ralph has appeared so protective of her. If word got out as to the baby's father, the scandal would still be all-encompassing. The former duke's hagiography had painted him as the hero of the hour, defending Corsica, and the interests of the empire, against a marauding foe. Max was a man of honor, integrity, principle, and was lauded as a hero struck down in his finest hour. For it to be revealed he had fathered a child with a maid would be damaging beyond words to the dukedom, and to the present duke himself. He's protected me, Ralph I mean. I think he feels it to be the right to do. I didn't ask for anything, but Mr. Edge, Connor, and Mrs. Mason sent me away. The duke had no choice in the matter, but he came to me at night, telling me everything would be all right. He gave me money and sent for me at the inn. I owe him everything, though I won't be a burden to him. Once I've had the baby, I'll go away, I'll live in obscurity, and I'll take the secret to my grave," Teresa said, with a tone of defiance. Miriam nodded. She knew it would not be as simple as that, though she could only admire the Duke for what he had done. He could so easily have cast Teresa out, and used the scandal to his advantage, discrediting his brother, and legitimizing his claim. But it was clear he saw in Teresa the continuation of his brother's memory and was willing to do whatever he could to make things right. One thing at a time, Teresa. I don't think it'll be long until this baby comes. Admittedly, I know far more about horses giving birth than women, but I suppose it's the same principle, Miriam said, feeling suddenly anxious at the thought of a baby being born at Briar Heights. Ralph had spoken of fetching the doctor, but with ten miles of rough, moorland track, between them and the nearest place of habitation, Miriam was certain the baby would be born long before any doctor could reach them. I'm not ashamed, miss. I loved Max, and if he'd come home, we might have married. 
He loved me too. And he knew he was to be a father. He didn't try to get rid of me then, either, when he found out, Teresa said, with a defiant tone. No one should be ashamed of a baby Teresa. I'll help you, but you've got to let me this time. Now rest a little, and I'll see what food I might bring up from the kitchen. For all her faults, Mrs. Hill at least made a tasty soup, Miriam said, smiling at Teresa, who nodded and returned her smile with a thankful look. As she made her way downstairs, Miriam pondered all she had learned. She had come to Briar Heights to find a job, and now she found herself in the middle of a secret and the possibility of a scandal. But Miriam was unperturbed, life as a maid was not so dull after all. Chapter 7 Ralph was worried about Teresa. She had clearly exhausted herself, and now there was a very real possibility as to the baby's imminent arrival. He wanted to help her, but he was uncertain how to do so. He had done his best to protect her, but when the baby was born, questions would be asked, and whilst Ralph was determined to keep his brother's secret, he knew it would be hard to do so. He had known about the baby for some time. His brother had told him of his love for Teresa and confided in him his intentions to marry her when he returned from Corsica. I don't care what anyone else says. I've fallen in love with her, and the baby's mine. My heir, Max had said, even as Ralph had reminded him of the absurdity of it all. The Duke of Lancaster can't marry a maid, he had told his brother, but Max had not listened. But the question of the unborn child had raised the stakes. Max had told Ralph of it just a week before he had died, when the two brothers had met at a dinner hosted by their regimental colonel. Max had spoken happily of Teresa's news, telling Ralph to keep it a secret, his fantasy of marriage still in place. But Ralph had known the dangers, and when his brother had been killed, he had vowed to do what he could to keep the matter a secret and protect Teresa, and the baby, at all costs. But when it's born, what then? There'll be questions, and the child has rights surely. He's my brother's heir, if it's a boy, Ralph thought to himself, for there was surely no precedent in such a situation, the title having passed wrongly, even as the child was waiting to be born. But such questions were pushed aside in the immediate moment, for the sight of Teresa lying on the bedroom floor had put the fear of God into Ralph, and now he was anxious she should be looked after intending to do whatever he could to keep her from harm. He was in the kitchen, trying to warm a pan of soup, though failing to get the fire to do anything more than smoke, as he placed another log into the unhopeful embers. Bah! Why won't it light, he exclaimed, spluttering in the smoke rising around him. Because you're using wet logs your grace, a voice behind him said, and startling, Ralph turned to find Miriam standing in the kitchen doorway. Oh, I'm sorry, I didn't see you there. Well, yes, perhaps they are, Ralph said, straightening up. In Corsica, any wood had burned, it was all bone dry, but on a moorland in Lancashire, where the rains often swept across an inky black sky, wood was often wet, and wet wood would not burn without smoke. I think there's some dry kindling in the store cupboard there, and we can use coal from the coal house, Miriam replied. Ralph was impressed. There was a practicality about her, despite her privileged upbringing, and now she set about laying the fire properly and rekindling it to burn with a pleasing heat. The pan of soup was placed on the range, and it was not long before it began to bubble gently, a pleasant aroma filling the kitchen. I hope you didn't think me too harsh on Mrs. Hill, and I hope you didn't mind my giving you such responsibility so soon. Without Teresa being able to help, I'm afraid you'll have to shoulder a considerable burden, Ralph said. He was worried he was asking too much of her, especially with regard to Teresa. There were many women, and men, who would be shocked at the thought of a woman, pregnant out of wedlock, especially under such strange circumstances. It's quite all right, Your Grace. I understand entirely. You want what's best for your brother's baby. I think it's admirable of you to help Teresa in this way, Miriam replied. Ralph was taken aback. 
no one was supposed to know about Max's part in this. The baby's lineage was a secret, and even the likes of Mrs. Mason or Connor knew nothing of it. I, how did you know? He asked, and Miriam looked at him in surprise. She told me. Wasn't I supposed to know? She asked, and Ralph shook his head. No. But you do now, and I suppose there's no harm in it. You've already proved yourself a diligent nurse. She's not in her right mind. I suppose she told you on a whim. But I must impress on you. He began, even as he felt embarrassed. He had no right to demand anything of Miriam. The secret could not be contained forever, her knowledge of it was proof enough of that. It's all right, I won't tell anyone. Besides, I'd already met her. It was the day she was sent away from Burnley Abbey, though I didn't know it at the time. I was out riding in Bluebell Woods, by the folly, and I met her there, though I knew nothing of her then. I felt terribly sorry for her, but she wouldn't let me help her. Anyway, she fled, and I thought I'd never see her again. But I've thought of her every day since. I feel so sorry for her, but I'm glad you've done the right thing, Miriam said as she stirred the pot of soup over the range. Ralph did not think he had done anything by Teresa, quite the opposite, in fact. He was angry with himself for not insisting on her remaining at Burnley Abbey. He had allowed Connor to make the decision for him and been influenced by talk of the possibility of scandal. But the birth of a child was no scandal, and Ralph had been determined to do what he could for the child, his nephew or niece. It was the least Teresa deserved. Have I? I could have done more, or so I believe. And I don't know what's going to happen after the birth. We'll cross that bridge when we come to it, but it's coming soon, I'm certain, Ralph said. He had feared Teresa would go into labor that very day, but he was glad to hear she was settled, if only for now. Then we need to be ready for it your grace. I'll take this soup up to her in a few minutes, and then I'll start making preparations. I think it'll fall to us, you see, to deliver it, I mean, Miriam said. Ralph's eyes grew wide with horror. He had not expected that. He knew nothing about delivering babies, and the thought of doing so filled him with dread. But I, the doctor, he stammered, but Miriam laughed. By the time someone rides from here to fetch the doctor, that baby's going to be two days old, she said, shaking her head and smiling. Ralph had not thought of that. He had taken Briar Heights as a refuge, though now he realized his folly in doing so. They were far from help, and if, when, Teresa gave birth, it would be up to Ralph and Miriam to help her through it. Ah, uh, well, yes, I suppose so. But, do you know anything about, babies? He asked. I've seen a lot of Maras through birth. It can't be much different, can it? Miriam asked, shrugging her shoulders. Ralph did not share her confidence, but he asked her now to wait a few moments before bringing up the soup, wishing to speak to Teresa alone. Since his return from Corsica, Ralph had kept his distance from Teresa, helping her when necessary but remaining somewhat aloof, so as not to give the wrong impression of their relationship. He knew the scandal was brewing and was intent on defending his brother's reputation at all costs. But the thought of disowning Teresa had never occurred to him. She was the mother of his brother's child, and that made her his responsibility. Might I come in? He asked, tapping at Teresa's bedroom door. She was sitting propped up in bed her face still pale, though appearing considerably more alert than he had seen her earlier on. I'm sorry your grace, I shouldn't be like this, she exclaimed, as Ralph entered the room. Nonsense, you can't help it. It's not your fault you fainted, is it? He asked, smiling at her reassuringly. I don't know what came over me. I feel a bit better now, thanks to you and Miss Miriam. Is she really a well-to-do lady? Teresa asked, and Ralph nodded. She is, but her father's lost his fortune, and she's reduced to. 
My apologies. I didn't mean to suggest. He began, blushing, even as Teresa smiled. It's all right, Your Grace. Upstairs and downstairs are very different worlds. They weren't meant to collide like this, were they? She said, and Ralph smiled. It's done now, isn't it? But why did you tell Miss Miriam about, my brother, Ralph asked. He was not angry with Teresa, she had suffered enough for her love of Max, but he was concerned as to what would happen if too many others should discover the secret, and he knew it would do no one any good if the existence of another heir, if the child was a boy, was discovered. I wasn't thinking, or rather. I've kept this secret for so long your grace. No one knew, though I think Mrs. Mason suspected it. I had to tell someone. I wanted to speak to someone about it. She seemed so kind, Miss Miriam I mean, Teresa replied, looking fearfully at Ralph, who nodded. I understand Teresa. I've asked you to shoulder a dreadful burden to preserve my brother's reputation. It's something I had no right to do, but I'm grateful to you for doing, he said. I was glad to do it your grace. Max, your brother, his grace, meant a great deal to me, Teresa replied. As he did to me Teresa. But we'll get through this, I promise. And it seems we're to have Miss Miriam's help in doing so, Ralph replied. He was grateful to Miriam for agreeing to keep silence and for agreeing to help Teresa too. Had it been left to Mrs. Hill, Ralph feared a catastrophe would have ensued, but Miriam, despite her past, seemed altogether taken with practical affairs. If the baby was to be born at Briar Heights, and it seemed certain it was, Ralph was glad he would have Miriam at his side. She thought the baby was yours your grace, Teresa said, and Ralph blushed a deep shade of red. I, well, I don't think, Really? He asked, for it had never occurred to him such an assumption would be made. You've done so much to help me, Your Grace. I think it's a compliment, Teresa replied. Despite everything, Ralph was looking forward to the arrival of the baby. In losing Max, he had lost a part of himself too, and the arrival of the baby would bring with it a memory of his brother. That's kind of you to say, Teresa. I promise you I'll do everything I can for you, and the baby. It won't be easy, I know. But we'll do our best, he said, and Teresa smiled. You've already done so your grace, she replied. At that moment, footsteps on the stairs signaled the arrival of Miriam with the soup, and she entered Teresa's bedroom, holding a tray with a steaming bowl and several thick slices of buttered bread on a plate. Are you hungry, Teresa? You should try to eat something I think. Don't worry if you can't manage it all, Miriam said, smiling at Teresa, who sat up in the bed and smiled. You shouldn't be making such a fuss of me. I'll be all right, I'm sure. I can get up tomorrow and help around the house, she said, but Ralph was hearing none of it. Teresa needed rest, and she was not to do anything to risk the baby's health. I won't hear of it. You're close to the time, Teresa and I won't have my brother's child endangered by the carrying of coal scuttles or rushing up and down stairs. We can manage, can't we Miss Miriam? He said, glancing at Miriam, who smiled. We can your grace, and what you say is very true. You need rest Teresa. I can manage. How hard can it be to run a house like this? She said, setting the tray down on Teresa's lap. Teresa nodded. Well, I do feel better for being in bed, she replied, as she began to eat. Ralph felt embarrassed to be standing over her, and he stepped out onto the landing, as Miriam made sure Teresa had everything she needed. The house was quiet, and Ralph smiled to himself at the thought of a baby appearing in their midst. It won't be quiet for much longer, he thought to himself, as Miriam stepped out onto the landing, closing the door quietly behind her. She needs rest, that's all. When the time comes, it comes, she said, and Ralph smiled. Thank you Miss Miriam. You've been very kind. This must all have come as quite a shock to you, he said, but Miriam laughed and shook her head. 
I'm not so naive as you might think me your grace. I know enough about the ways of the world not to be scandalized by what I've learned today. Besides, I believe your brother loved Teresa, and she certainly loved him in return, Miriam replied. Ralph thought back to the day Max had told him of his romantic attachment to Teresa. He called his brother a fool and warned him of the impending scandal should the truth about the baby be widely known. But despite his misgivings, he had come to realize the value in the love Max and Teresa had shared, if his brother's last thoughts had been of her, then surely, he had died knowing he was loved, and that was important, at least to Ralph. I believe they both did. I don't know what we'll do when the baby arrives, but I've promised Teresa I'll take care of her, and that's what I intend to do, Ralph replied. Then you're a good man your grace. I'd better go and acquaint myself with the kitchen. I'll have your dinner ready for you at seven o'clock, Miriam said, and Ralph watched from the landing as she made her way downstairs. What a remarkable woman, he thought to himself, glad to have been able to help her in her hour of need, and grateful to her for agreeing to keep his secret. His instincts told him he could trust Miriam, even as he reminded himself of the advice a sergeant had once given him on the battlefield, instinct goes hand in hand with reason sir, he had said, meaning the heart should always be tempered by the head, and vice versa. But I think I can trust her, Teresa surely does, he told himself, and as he pondered the matter further, he realized the extraordinarily good fortune which had so unexpectedly entered his life. Chapter 8 Miriam was quite astonished to find herself in the midst of the unfolding drama surrounding Teresa and the Duke. She had not been surprised to learn the truth, though at first, she had believed the scandal to be Ralph's, rather than his brother's. She had hoped for a quiet position, sending home her wages, and getting on with her job but it seemed life at Briar Heights was to be anything but quiet, and in the coming days, Miriam was kept busy, looking after Teresa, and seeing to the needs of the Duke. She was used to being waited on, and whilst the tasks of housekeeper, cook, and maid were easy to learn, she found herself feeling wearied, even as she was determined to do her best. Writing to her mother, Miriam explained she had taken the job at Briar Heights, and would return when opportunity allowed it sending the letter with the grocer's boy, who came by horse and cart once a week to deliver supplies to the house. The duke had given Miriam a small advance, and thus she was able to send home a not inconsiderable amount of money, receiving a response from her mother, thanking her, even as it described a worsening financial situation. Poor mother, and poor Claire too, Miriam thought to herself, as she read of how her mother and sister had been reduced to taking in sewing and were subsisting largely on ship's crackers and marmalade, along with boiled eggs and apples from the orchard. Miriam knew she had to do something, even as the duke had been generous in paying her far more than the wage of a maid in any other house, citing the remoteness of Briar Heights as his reason. But it would only be a matter of time before Podmore Grange was lost, and Miriam's family were forced to move from the only home they had ever known. They were poor, and no amount of sewing and mending would rectify that. But what to do? Miriam asked herself, as she prepared the breakfast trays. She had made porridge for Teresa, and the Duke was to be served sausages and eggs, along with a pot of strong coffee. He was particular about his meals. A remnant, Miriam supposed, of his time in the military, and as the kitchen clock struck nine o'clock, Miriam made her way up to the dining room, carrying the duke's tray. She found him sitting at the table already, reading a book. Have you checked on Teresa yet? Did she pass a tolerable night? The duke asked, as Miriam set down his breakfast in front of him. She was asleep when I took the tray up. I don't like to wake her. She needs her rest, Miriam said. The duke nodded. He seemed distracted this morning, his mind preoccupied. I hope she'll be all right. It's getting close, isn't it? He said, taking up his knife and fork. It's imminent. You can't stop nature I'm afraid, Miriam replied. She had sat with enough maras to know nature could not be controlled. When a foal was to come, it came, 
whatever one's state of preparation. And what happens then? We've got a baby on our hands, and without a husband, she's as good as damned, Ralph replied, shaking his head. It was a cruel world, and the opinion of society, whether high or low, was the same. A baby born out of wedlock was called by a name Miriam had no desire to repeat. There could be no respectability for such a woman, not now, nor in the future. She was tainted, and her child was tainted too. That was the sad order of things, and the usual fate of a woman such as this was the poorhouse, or the convent. Babies were taken away, or the mother was forced, through lack of finance, to give them up. Miriam had heard such tales before, and she held out little hope for Teresa's story being any different. But she has you your grace, and she has me too. We won't abandon her, Miriam replied. Since her first encounter with Teresa in Bluebell Wood, Miriam had been determined to help the maid, and she was glad of fate's opportunity to do so now. She did not know precisely where this determination came from, but it was there, nonetheless. She imagined how she would feel if it was Claire in Teresa's place, and such thoughts were enough to spur on her intention of charity. No, but, what more can I do? I can't very well put her up somewhere and keep her all her life. Someone's bound to discover the truth, they'll assume I'm the father. Do I deny it to preserve my brother's reputation over my own? No, it won't work. But I can't send her away forget about her as though never knew her. It's a terrible mess. One I've been trying not to think about, he said, shaking his head. Miriam was not sure why she said what she said now. Her words came in the spur of the moment, with hardly a thought to their implication. It was meant as a joke, albeit with a sense of seriousness attached. We could take it as our own, she said. The Duke looked up at her in astonishment. What do you mean? He asked, and Miriam laughed. Well, we could marry and take the baby as our own. We could keep it hidden for the next year or so, pretend we were staying together at Briar Heights to get used to one another. Teresa could act as our wet nurse. She wouldn't be giving up the baby, and there'd be no disgrace in it either, she said. The Duke was staring at her, his breakfast forgotten, and now he let out a deep sigh pushing aside his plate and rising to his feet. But, it's too extraordinary. Do you realize what you're proposing? He asked. Admittedly, Miriam had not thought the matter through in its entirety. She knew nothing of the Duke's romantic prospects, but given he had retreated to Briar Heights for the foreseeable future, she felt certain he had no attachments beyond these walls. She herself had always been of an independent spirit. She had been overjoyed for Grace and Henry, but as for her own prospects, there had been little by way of attraction on her part to any member of the opposite gender. With her prospects gone, and her father's fortune lost, the chances of Miriam making a suitable match were lost, and if the Duke was persuaded to marry her, it would surely be to her advantage, too. A proposal, that's what I'm proposing, Miriam replied, shrugging her shoulders. It was up to the Duke to accept or refuse. But the advantage would be his, and Teresa's and the baby's. Miriam was suggesting a marriage of convenience, but convenient to both sides, and for their mutual benefit. As Duchess of Lancaster, Miriam could ensure her family's future, and as a woman, she could take responsibility for the baby as her own. In a year, they could return to Burnley Abbey, presenting the child as their own. No one would question the matter, and whilst it would certainly be strange to tell, their life of obscurity could be explained away by eccentricity. Aristocrats are prone to eccentricity. Well, I don't know, I can't say the idea had occurred to me, the Duke said, still looking like a rabbit caught in a poacher's lamp. You don't have to decide immediately. It's only a suggestion, but one I'd be only too happy to fulfill. I've never thought much about marriage, and given the tatters of my own reputation, I think we'd both be doing the other a service, don't you? She asked. The Duke shook his head. 
I'll need time to think about it, he said, and Miriam nodded. Don't take too much time about it. It won't be long before we've no choice but to have a baby in our midst, she replied. Miriam spoke to the Duke on familiar terms. She was used to ballrooms and soirees, to dinners and picnics, where she moved effortlessly between dukes and earls, delighting them with her conversation. And whilst her situation was different now, her demeanor was unchanged. The suggestion had come out of the blue, but the more she thought about it, the more sensible it seemed, even as, on the face of it, it appeared remarkable. Well, yes, quite, the duke said, sitting back down at the breakfast table, still with a confused expression on his face. I'll leave you to your breakfast, Miriam said, and she left the dining room, closing the door behind her, and hoping she had not shocked the duke by her bold proposal. Ralph had not expected a proposal at the breakfast table that morning. He had been worrying about the future, what to do once the baby was born, and how to ensure Teresa was protected, should a scandal ensue. His was worried about his own reputation, too, even as he cursed himself for thinking such selfish thoughts. If Miriam could believe he was the child's father, then anyone could, and such a rumor would be damaging beyond measure. But getting married to Miriam. I can't do that. It would be, dishonest, he thought to himself, unable to concentrate on his breakfast, his mind racing with possibility. Ralph had thought little of romance since returning from Corsica. The arrangements for his brother's funeral, the taking on of his responsibilities as duke, and his arrival at Briar Heights had left little time to consider his duty to provide an heir. The irony of Miriam's suggestion was not lost on him. To adopt Teresa's child as his own would be to recognize the heir, even as the child may yet prove to be a girl, and thus not eligible to inherit. The child would be raised as their own, without reference to Max's involvement. Certainly, questions would be asked as to such a swift and unusual courtship, though they would be easily weathered in comparison to a I won't say the word, Ralph told himself, even as he knew what so many others would call Teresa's baby. But Miriam's suggestion was extraordinary, even as it had its practicalities. Ralph had always imagined he would marry for love, and, in the past, there had been those for whom he had held a flame, albeit a now extinguished one. His mother had made attempts at matchmaking, but every suggestion had fallen foul, in one way or another. Ralph was simply unlucky in love, and now he wondered if Miriam's proposal was not so remarkable after all. It would benefit her too of course, he said to himself, as he pushed his half-eaten breakfast aside for the final time and rose to his feet. Ralph knew such a proposal required thought, and it would need Teresa's permission too, for she would also have to be party to the deception. It's too ridiculous, he thought to himself as he made his way upstairs, hoping Teresa would share his sentiment. If she refused, then so be it. That would be the end of the matter. But as he explained the matter to her, he was surprised to find her in total agreement. You mean I could stay with the baby? I wouldn't be sent away? She asked, and Ralph shook his head. No. I wouldn't send you anywhere. Whether you agree to it or not. But, don't you think it's madness? He asked. Ralph wanted it to be madness. But the more he thought about it, the more sensible this madness seemed. Not at all. I think it's imminently sensible. I'm astonished Miss Miriam is willing to do it though. Doesn't she have, a love of her own? Teresa asked. Ralph blushed. He had not inquired after Miriam's matrimonial affairs, though he could only assume they were as his own, non-existent. She was making a considerable sacrifice, not only for him, Teresa, and the baby, but for her family too. Ralph admired this, and he was willing to make his own sacrifice, too, if only to honor his brother's memory, and ensure Teresa and the baby were taken care of. I don't think so, no. I believe she thinks it to her advantage to marry me. As Duchess of Lancaster, 
her family's troubles would be resolved. I'd gladly help them, given what she herself intends to do for us. But are you certain you're happy, Teresa? I don't want you to feel as though I'm taking the child away from you. It's your choice, Ralph replied. He knew it was more than Teresa's choice, even as he wanted her to be the one to decide. He wondered what his brother would say at the suggestion of such an astonishing scheme. Would he have agreed to such a thing himself? But it's not only my choice your grace. This baby was your brother's too. He'd want what was best for the baby, and for the dukedom. I know what it means if it's a boy, Teresa said, and Ralph nodded. The situation was a strange one, unique, perhaps. If the child was a boy, he, not Ralph, would be the rightful heir to the dukedom, albeit with the necessity of a regent in place, and if Teresa wished it, she could challenge Ralph for legitimacy. The proof was there in Max's diary, and no doubt in letters sent between him and Teresa. The matter could be proved one way or another, and its consequences disastrous for them all. I know you do, and I know you wouldn't use it to your advantage. That's why I intend to do all I can to protect you and the baby from whatever scandal might arise, Ralph replied. He took hold of Teresa's hand and smiled. He could see why his brother had fallen in love with her. Her face, though pale, was attractive, her long hair, olive-toned skin, and dark eyes, framing a pretty countenance. You've been kinder than I ever expected you to be. Max always spoke of you in the highest of terms, Teresa said, and Ralph laughed. Did he really? I always thought I was a disappointment to him. I was never as good as him, not at anything. He was faster, stronger, and older than I. He has every advantage I lacked. But I loved him, truly, I did, Ralph replied, thinking fondly of his brother who had always seemed a man to aspire to, even as his demise had left Ralph the one whom others looked up to. He'd have been proud of you your grace. I know he would, Teresa replied. Ralph was fighting back the tears. He missed his brother terribly, and to be told of Max's pride in him made him feel more inadequate than ever. Max would never have fled Burnley Abbey as Ralph had done, and yet, Ralph knew he had no choice but to be at Briar Heights with Teresa, helping her in this way. That's very kind of you to say, Teresa. I just hope I'm doing the right thing now, Ralph replied. Chapter 9 Miriam was washing up the breakfast things. She had always been used to speaking her mind, her father had once called her his most formidable opponent when it came to any debate but she wondered now if she overstepped the mark in asking the duke to marry her. It sounds so ridiculous when put like that, she thought to herself, as she gazed out of the kitchen window across the moorland. But her remarkable proposal had been born entirely out of practicality. It was a drastic solution to a situation which had the potential to be explosive if its truth was revealed. If the true lineage of Teresa's child should be discovered, scandal would ensue. If Max was discovered to have been the father, his heroic reputation would be turned to mud, and if Ralph was suspected of fathering Teresa's child, then his own reputation would be reduced to ashes. The baby would grow up an outcast, and Teresa would be forced to live the rest of her life in obscurity. Nothing good could come of the truth. And then there's my own situation too, Miriam said to herself for marriage to the duke would be to her advantage, as well as his. Her father had lost almost everything, and it would not be long before he was forced to sell Podmore Grange and take the family deeper into poverty. Miriam had vowed to do all she could to protect her father, mother, and sister, and whilst taking the job of a maid had seemed an extreme solution at first, this proposal was even more so. But as Duchess of Lancaster, Miriam would have no difficulty in helping her family, and lifting them out of the tragic circumstances they now found themselves in. How could I not suggest it? She reasoned to herself. But it was up to Ralph to decide whether to go ahead with the plan. They would have their detractors, of course, and there would be those who questioned such a hasty betrothal, 
but such questions and detractions were nothing compared to the brewing scandal of a child born out of wedlock, the son or daughter of a deceased duke. And if it's a boy, he'd be the rightful heir, Miriam thought to herself. She finished washing up the breakfast dishes before sweeping the kitchen and fetching logs for the stove. Miriam had taken to the role of housekeeper well. She knew her chores and carried them out with diligence, cooking, cleaning, fetching and carrying. It was a far cry from her previous life, but one she was enjoying, albeit under such unusual circumstances. The Duke was still upstairs with Teresa, and Miriam wondered what they could be talking about. Would Teresa try to talk Ralph out of the proposal? The maid would be giving up her child, to outward appearances at least, but Miriam had no intention of taking the baby from her. Teresa would be the child's mother in every way, even as others would see differently. She smiled to herself, shaking her head at the audacity by which she had made her proposal. It was an extraordinary solution, but one Miriam hoped the Duke would see sense in. He was a good man, he had proved as much by his efforts to help Teresa and Miriam could not help but wonder what it would be like to know him better. And you're sure you wouldn't mind? To the rest of the world, she'd be the child's mother. Between us of course, it would be different, but could you really endure it? He'd be raised as the heir. Forgive me, I'm talking of the baby as though his gender were a foregone conclusion. But the matter remains, would it not upset you to see the child in Miriam's arms? The Duke asked. He was concerned Teresa was simply agreeing with his own half-decided deliberations. He felt torn between head and heart, though he knew there was sense in the possibility. To marry Miriam would solve a considerable number of problems, not only for himself, but for all of them, his deceased brother included. But this was Teresa's baby, and only she could decide to give the child up in such a way, as practical as the suggestion might seem. I'm sure it would at times your grace. But, well, I want my baby to have all the opportunities one never had. If it was a boy, he'd be heir to a great dukedom, and if it was a girl, she'd have the life of leisure I always dreamed of. And it's not just my child your grace, it's your brother's too. What would he want for his son or daughter? Not the life I could give them, that's for certain, Teresa said, shaking her head. She placed her hands on her stomach beneath the blanket. Ralph nodded. He knew Teresa was right. This would have been what Max wanted for his son or daughter, to enjoy the inheritance that was theirs. But another question now arose, one which left a bitter taste in his mouth. I just don't know why she's being so generous. I worry. Well, she could blackmail us Teresa. Why doesn't she? Her family's down on its luck, and now she's discovered a secret, the revealing of which would create a scandal from here to London, and on every point of the compass. Why not threaten me with ruin, rather than propose marriage? Ralph replied. It was a question he could not answer for himself, but Ralph, whilst not always the best leader of men, had been something of a strategist during his time in the army. He could see possibilities ahead and had an eye for eventualities. If he had been in Miriam's shoes, the possibility of blackmail would surely have occurred to him, and long before a resort to marriage was considered. Perhaps she's just a good-hearted soul, Teresa replied, raising her eyebrows. Ralph felt guilty for even suggesting, or thinking, Miriam could intend anything more than she appeared. But her arrival at Briar Heights had been somewhat convenient. Her family was down on its luck, and if Miriam had chanced on the secret, having met Teresa in Bluebell Woods, it would not be beyond the realms of possibility to consider blackmail as a means of alleviating her own troubles. But the proposal of marriage was something else, and Ralph remained confused as to why this intelligent, determined, resourceful, and pretty young woman should be willing to sacrifice so much for someone she barely knew. I believe she is. But it still seems rather strange to me. Don't you think? Ralph replied. 
He wanted Teresa to tell him he was being foolish and to talk him out of making a terrible mistake. But it seemed she believed Miriam's proposal offered a solution to them all, and given his sense of responsibility towards her, Ralph felt duty-bound to agree, even as he had misgivings as to what the future would hold. When I met her in Bluebell Woods, it was quite by chance. I was rude to her, or at least. I ran away, and didn't let her help me as she wished to. But I remember the look on her face, she was genuinely concerned for me. She wanted to help me, and I didn't let her. I don't know why, I was a servant, obviously with child. She shouldn't have given me a second glance. But she did, and I won't ever forget that. She's offering more now your grace, more than she ever needs to, Teresa replied. Ralph sighed. Teresa was right, and now he felt he had no choice but to accept Miriam's offer. I didn't think my marriage would occur under such circumstances, he said, shaking his head at the bizarreness of the circumstances he now found himself in. I don't think any of us knows what's to come your grace. Look at your poor brother. He marched off to war so full of confidence for the future. He wrote to me, though I'm not very good with my letters, and I found it hard to read them and respond. But I knew he was excited about the future and wanted so much from his life. That's what I want for the child your grace, Teresa replied. Ralph was not about to deny the child such an opportunity, nor deprive Teresa of a future she would not otherwise have. She spoke with an eloquence and reminded Ralph of his brother. It was no wonder the two of them had fallen in love. He sighed and nodded. I'll do it Teresa. I'll marry her, he said, with a sudden determination in his voice. Teresa looked at him and smiled. You sound just like Max. When he made up his mind to do something, he did it. He could have so easily sent me away when he discovered I was pregnant. But he didn't. He wanted to care of me, and the baby. You're so like him, she said, but Ralph shook his head. He felt like an imposter masquerading in his brother's legacy. But I... I ran away Teresa. Coming here, to Briar Heights, wasn't just about giving you and the baby a safe place to be, even though I pretended as much. I didn't find it easy stepping into my brother's shoes. I wanted to, run away, he said, feeling ashamed of himself for admitting it. He felt like a coward. He was a coward, but Teresa shook her head. That's not true Ralph. Your grace. You're everything your brother was. You've taken on his responsibilities. He'd be proud of you for that, I know he would, she said, and Ralph sighed. It seemed Teresa was determined to make him feel better about himself, even as Ralph felt far from so. I just, maybe he felt the same way, though he was good at putting on an act. I want to make him proud. He's dead, that sounds so foolish, doesn't it? I want to think I'm doing the right thing by him. But running away to this lonely place. I've shirked my responsibilities, Ralph replied. But aren't you making amends for them now? By this I mean. If that's truly how you feel, then by marrying Miriam, you're making everything right. You're taking responsibility for your brother's child, and you're proving yourself his worthy successor. Don't compare yourself to him always. You'll find your way your grace, and for now, isn't this enough? But only if you're sure. I don't want you to do something you'll regret, Teresa said, smiling at Ralph, who shook his head. This was a decision no one could take alone. There were four people involved, Ralph, Miriam, Teresa, and the unborn child. Whatever was decided would impact them all. Miriam's offer was overwhelmingly generous, but in taking this path, they were embarking on a lifelong journey. I think, I don't know. I'd never thought much about marriage until it was suggested this morning. I want to do it, but then. Oh, I think I'll go for a walk. The moorland air might clear my head a little, Ralph said, rising to his feet. He left Teresa to rest, and slipped out of the house 
glad not to have met Miriam as he went. The day was bright and clear, the sky blue, and dotted with white clouds high above. The moorland stretched out on every side, an undulating shimmer of heather and gorse. Ralph took a path through the trees, emerging above Briar Heights, where he walked for a mile or so along a rough path, lost in his own thoughts. She's being so generous, he thought to himself, knowing what Miriam's offer would mean for her, too. But at the heart of it all, and the thing which was holding Ralph back, was the fact of deception. A marriage was a sacred bond, blessed by God. It was not to be entered into lightly or callously. The vows they would make were sacred and binding. Wilt thou have this woman to thy wedded wife, to live together after God's ordinance in the holiest state of matrimony? Wilt thou love her, comfort her, honor, and keep her, in sickness and in health, and, forsaking all other, keep thee only unto her, so long as ye both shall live? Those were the words Ralph had heard at dozens of society weddings, the vows made between a man and a woman in holy matrimony. To utter them insincerely was surely the gravest of offenses, how would he be judged? But could I ever come to love her? He asked himself, torn between head and heart, duty and right. There was always the possibility of either of them falling in love with another. A marriage of convenience might suit the current situation it did suit the current situation. But as for the future, who could tell? What if she grows bored? What if she decides to expose it after all and annul the marriage on the falsity of its inception? He asked himself. Just as on the battlefield, Ralph could see a dozen possibilities presenting themselves, the ways in which this strange proposal could play out. Miriam was suggesting a life-changing course of action and whilst it was one each of them would benefit from, it was also an astonishing proposition, when considered for life. To have and to hold from this day forward, for better for worse, for richer for poorer, in sickness and in health, to love and to cherish, till death us do part, according to God's holy ordinance, and thereto I plight thee my troth, he repeated to himself, imagining the moment he would speak those words to Miriam, sealing their match for eternity. He had come to the rise of a steady incline, where a steep slope gave way to a ravine below, a stream flowing between gnarled and ancient trees, their branches bare, stripped by the wind which seemed an almost constant presence on the moor. From here, Ralph could see back towards Burnley Abbey, a faint shimmer in the distance, surrounded by trees. He pictured his brother's grave, the earth still freshly turned. A year ago, Ralph had not a single care in the world. He was a soldier, an officer, about to set off to war, passing his days in the pleasant pursuits of a gentleman. How different his life was now, burdened with such responsibility as he had never imagined. And now a decision presents itself, he thought to himself, wondering what his brother would do, and if the decision he was close to making was the right one for them all. Chapter 10 Ralph passed a sleepless night. He tossed and turned, the exertions of his walk across the moor having done nothing to clear his mind or wear him out. He was wide awake, the matter of Miriam's proposal foremost on his mind. He had avoided her for the rest of the day, taking supper in his study, a tray having been left outside the door, and Miriam's footsteps disappearing before Ralph had peered cautiously out and retrieved it. He knew he was being foolish in avoiding her, but he knew too, the necessity of thinking the matter through. A proposal such as this was life-changing, and his answer would have repercussions for them all. But Ralph's mind was almost made up, at least, he believed so. It was the unborn child that mattered. He or she was Ralph's responsibility. If the baby was a boy, he would be heir to the dukedom and Ralph was not about to deny the possibility of his brother's son inheriting. History was full of those for whom the arrival of a child took away their right to inherit title, power, and money. But Ralph was not the sort of man who would bear such a grudge against his nephew. Indeed, he would be glad to relinquish the responsibilities placed on him and return to the life of the second son, 
if only it were possible. The dukedom was his, for now, but he would not deny its rightful heir, and he would not abandon his brother's child, of that, he was certain. Marrying her surely isn't such a foolish thought, Ralph told himself, as he lay awake, watching the first rays of down creep through the curtains. He slept in a room at the top of the house, simply furnished with a bed, table, washstand, and a small desk by the window. It reminded him of the barracks on Corsica, where first he and Max had been billeted on their arrival on that faraway island. But is she really certain she's doing the right thing? He asked himself, for the sacrifice Miriam was willing to make was immense. He was turning the same thought over in his mind, why? Why was Miriam willing to do this? It seemed utterly remarkable for someone who knew nothing of the situation, save for a brief encounter with Teresa in the woodland, to offer herself up in such a way and for a cause not her own. Ralph was still suspicious of Miriam's motives, despite Teresa's reassuring words of the previous day. He knew she needed help, her family's fortune was gone, and she had only her good name to sustain her. But was she not afraid of the risk she was taking in offering such a proposal? It was life-changing, and Ralph wondered if she had truly considered the consequences. Perhaps being a soldier made me cynical, Ralph said to himself, as he got up and pulled on his breeches. He wanted to believe Miriam's offer came from a genuine desire to be of service, but Ralph was naturally cautious. It was a soldier's disposition, his prerogative, even. Again, Ralph wondered what Max would have done in his place. His brother was often more willing to take a risk, and perhaps that was why Ralph, and not Max, was asking himself the question now. I can't avoid her forever, he thought as he made his way down to breakfast. It was already laid out in the dining room, a dish of fried eggs and sausages, accompanied by a loaf of bread, with butter and preserves. There was no sign of Miriam, and Ralph sat down to eat, glad to be able to collect his thoughts as he now heard footsteps in the passageway. Good morning, Your Grace, a cup of coffee, perhaps? Miriam asked, as she entered the room, holding a silver coffee pot, with a smile on her face. Oh, yes, thank you, Ralph replied. Miriam made no mention of the proposal as she poured his coffee and cut slices from the loaf of bread for him to butter. It's a beautiful day outside, she remarked, glancing out of the window. It was, indeed, a beautiful day. The sun was shining, and there was freshness in the air, the garden covered in silvery dew, and a bright blue sky above the moorland. It certainly is. I, well. Miriam, might we speak? After I've finished breakfast I mean, Ralph said, and the housekeeper smiled. I think we should, she replied, raising her eyebrows. Won't you join in my study? Ralph asked, for his appetite was suddenly diminished, replaced by a churning sensation in his stomach, as nerves took hold. Miriam nodded, setting the coffee pot down on a mat on the table, before following Ralph to his study, where he ushered her to a chair by hearth. He himself sat behind his desk, wishing to convey an air of authority, even as he felt somewhat powerless in the face of what was to come. Have you thought about what I said? She asked, and Ralph nodded. I've thought of little else since you said it, he admitted. His mind had been entirely preoccupied with Miriam's proposal since the previous day's breakfast, and now he took a deep breath, still curious to understand more about her motives. And you've made a decision? She asked, looking at him with a questioning gaze. Ralph faltered. He was on the verge of making a decision, even as a dozen questions went through his mind. Well, it's a most generous offer, and one I want to accept, but... He began, faltering as Miriam continued to hold his gaze. Are you wondering why I'm doing it? Why I offered to marry you on an apparent whim? She asked. Ralph nodded. That was just what he was wondering. I'm sorry, I just... Perhaps I'm far too cynical, but it seems remarkable to make such an offer, when the alternative would be far easier, he said, 
not wishing to speak openly of blackmail even as it seemed Miriam knew precisely what he meant. Do you mean why didn't I demand money for my silence? She asked, and Ralph nodded again. He felt ashamed for even suggesting Miriam could be capable of such an act. But Ralph was naturally cautious, and he knew he had to be absolutely certain of Miriam's motives. Forgive me, my experience with the fairer sex is limited. But things could be much easier for you. Marrying me is quite a remarkable thing to do, he replied. Miriam smiled and shook her head, brushing back her hair, as she continued to hold his gaze. I'd never blackmail anyone. It's a wicked thing to do. But. I understand your concerns. It does seem incredible, doesn't it? She replied. That much was true. The whole idea was ludicrous, and Ralph nodded, even as he knew there was no other choice. Well, yes, but. I don't understand why you're willing to do it, he said. Miriam sighed, and a look of sadness came over her face. My parents have lost everything. My father's a proud man, but he's made any number of foolish investments. There's nothing left, which means I've nothing to lose. I know what the ton are like. If the truth about the baby gets out you'll be ruined, and so will the child, your whole dynasty will live in its shadow for generations. My own mother was the subject of vicious gossip once, it nearly killed her, and I wouldn't wish the forked tongues of the ton on anyone, Miriam replied. Ralph was surprised to hear her say this. He knew about the misfortunes of her father, the Baron's financial demise was, itself, a source of gossip and scandal, but as for those of her mother, he had heard nothing. Then you understand the difficulties I face in making such a choice, he said. I never expected this life. It came so unexpectedly, and I can't imagine it's going to get any better, not as things stand, at least. Don't we all benefit from this match? She asked. Ralph nodded. The marriage would benefit them both, and the advantages were obvious. Ralph would gladly help to restore the Baron's fortunes, and if Miriam kept her side of the bargain, Teresa's child would be raised as heir to the dukedom. But are you really ready to take on a child? He asked. For it was not just marriage Miriam was entering into, but motherhood, too. She would be mother to Teresa's unborn child, and Ralph wondered if she had really thought through the implications of what that would mean. Two people could live separately in a marriage, it happened all the time in aristocratic circles. But as for parenting a child, such responsibility could not be easily shirked. Miriam would be connected to the child for the rest of her life, and it would grow up believing her to be its mother. I've always wanted children in a family, she replied, with a sudden wistful tone in her voice. Ralph felt sorry for her. She had lost so much, and none of it was her fault. Her reduced circumstances had been brought about by the failings of her father, and it was only surprising she remained apparently unbitter towards him for that which he had reduced her to. Miriam was a lady, used to balls and soirees, theater visits and picnics, pretty dresses and tea parties. Now, she was housekeeper in a remote dwelling on the moorland, reduced to the menial tasks of domesticity, and forced to set aside her hopes and ambitions. Was it any wonder she clung to the possibility of something more? Of course, forgive me, Ralph replied, feeling suddenly embarrassed. My life was supposed to be like so many others, my coming out, the passing of the seasons, an eventual courtship and matrimony. That's the lot of people like us, isn't it? She asked, and for a moment, Ralph did not see the housekeeper in her simple dress, her auburn hair tied back, and the marks of hard work on her hands, but rather, an elegant lady, used to the finer things in life. This should not be Miriam's lot, and yet, circumstances had reduced her to it. You don't deserve any of this, he replied, shaking his head which is why I want to find a purpose. I want to be useful, and if I can help my family, Teresa, and you, then so be it. I'm willing to do it. 
what's the alternative? A life in service, and to see my parents reduced to living in a hovel, and my sister with no prospects to speak of. I won't do it. I won't give up, she exclaimed, with a defiant note in her voice, and Ralph could not help but admire her tenacity in the face of such overwhelming odds. He understood her now, and he felt a fool for having thought ill of her motives. There was no guile here, only the desire to do something, anything, to help herself, and he family too. No, I don't think you will. And I'm sorry if you believed I doubted you. It's just, well, I haven't encountered a woman like you before, Ralph said, knowing how naive he sounded. He had led men into battle, devising strategies and winning victories. But the ways of women were mysterious, and Miriam had certainly proved it that day. Miriam smiled. Is that a compliment, Your Grace? She asked, and Ralph blushed. It is, yes, he replied, for he could not help but admire Miriam for what she was to do and had already done. Then am I to take it we're now, betrothed? She asked, smiling at Ralph, who breathed a heavy sigh. Yes, he replied, sounding more emphatic than he felt, even as he tried to assure himself of the sense and necessity of agreeing to Miriam's proposal. I'm glad you've said yes, Your Grace. My own relief is secondary to that of Teresa, I'm sure. She wants what's best for the baby, and she'll be with the child every day. I'll make sure of it. She'll be his nurse and take care of him, Miriam said. Ralph smiled. It would surely not be so simple, and he could only imagine the suspicion of Connor Edge and Mrs. Mason when they returned to Burnley Abbey with the child and Teresa. They would surely ask where Teresa's own child had gone, and whilst neither of them would question Ralph's explanation, they would undoubtedly be suspicious. I'm sure we can make it work, Ralph replied. Does one celebrate a betrothal of this sort, I wonder? Miriam said, and Ralph laughed. Well, perhaps we needn't pretend as to your position here any longer. I'm sure we can manage the domestic tasks between us. If you're to be the Duchess of Lancaster, you can hardly be my housekeeper too, he replied, shaking his head. Miriam laughed. Shouldn't we keep up the pretense? At least for a little longer? She asked. But I think you should join me for dinner this evening. Perhaps Teresa could join us too, if she's well enough to get up. We need to talk about the practicalities of what we're doing, and agree as to our story, Ralph said. His tone was businesslike, but secretly, Ralph rather liked the idea of dinner with Miriam. The more he was coming to know her, the more he liked her, and it would certainly not be a hardship to marry her, if that was to be the case. He still wondered if they would go through with it, but for now, the plan was in place, and it would resolve so many of their problems, even as it tied them into an untruth lasting their whole lives long. Very well, I'll see how Teresa is and what might be made from the larder, Miriam said, rising to her feet. Ralph did the same, unsure of what to say in response to the remarkable decision they had just made. I'm very grateful, Miriam. I really am, he said, and Miriam smiled. I'm grateful to you too, we can be grateful to one another, she said, nodding to him and leaving the room. As she closed the door behind her, Ralph breathed a sigh of relief perhaps everything would be all right after all. Chapter 11 Miriam left the dining room with a smile on her face. She was glad the Duke had agreed to her plan, and not just for her own sake, but for his, Teresa's, and the baby's, too. She understood his reticence, anyone would be suspicious of such a suggestion at first, but since her encounter with Teresa in Bluebell Woods, Miriam had only wanted to help the maid in her difficulties, and opportunity had presented her with a way to do just that. Now, what might we make for the dinner this evening? Miriam said out loud, as she returned to the kitchen. Cooking, along with all the other domestic tasks, was still something she was learning to do. Before her father's financial demise, Miriam had never raised a finger to cook anything in her life 
let alone take on the domestic tasks of an entire household. Several experiments had gone wrong, and now she looked around her, pondering what might be made from the limited supplies in the larder and pantry. A syllabub, perhaps, with nutmeg, mother always enjoyed a syllabub, but as for the savory dish, a pie, perhaps, old Jackson could bring me one of the hens, Miriam thought to herself. She was so engrossed in her deliberations, she did not hear footsteps in the yard, and a knock at the kitchen door caused her to startle. A letter for you miss, a young boy said, as Miriam opened the door. It'll be for his grace, thank you. Have you run all this way across the moorland? Come inside and have some bread and dripping, Miriam said, ushering the boy, who could not have been more than ten years old, with tousled blonde hair and big blue eyes, into the kitchen. I've come from Podmore Grange, miss. I was told to deliver a letter to a maid here, he said. Miriam looked at him in surprise. Oh, then it's me you want, she said, taking the envelope from the boy and recognizing her mother's neat handwriting on the front. It was addressed to her, and having cut two large slices of bread, and placed the dripping pot in front of the boy at the table, Miriam sat down to open it. My dearest Miriam, how we miss you at Podmore Grange, and what sad and lowly circumstances we find ourselves in without you. Your poor sister and I are reduced to taking and mending, our embroidery skills, once put to artistic diversions, now given over to darning stockings and sewing buttons onto the coats of footmen. How it pains us to reside in our once beautiful home, which now appears to decay all around us. We miss you, Miriam, but I write to you on a graver matter, still. Your father has fallen ill, the chill and damp of our rooms has burdened his chest, and he coughs long into the night. I fear for him, and I beg you to come home, if only for a day or so, when you can manage it. He would dearly love to see you, as would I and your sister. For now, I remain, every affectionate, mother, Miriam read. She sighed and folded the letter in two. Her heart went out to her parents and sister, for she had been so caught up in life at Briar Heights, she had given them less thought than she should. Thank you for this miss, the boy who had delivered the letter said, finishing the last crumbs of bread and dripping. Miriam smiled at him. You're quite welcome I'm sure. Will you wait a moment, I'll write a response you can take back to Podmore Grange, Miriam said. The boy looked at her in surprise. Can you write miss? I've never known a maid who could write, or read, for that matter, he said, and Miriam smiled. I wasn't always a maid, she replied. Miriam's reply was swift, but she promised her mother she would return to Podmore Grange at the earliest opportunity. She felt certain the Duke would not object, and she would be glad to share the happy news of her betrothal. Her mother would be surprised, but Miriam hoped her astonishment, and any possible objection, would be tempered by the face of their salvation. She would mention nothing about the baby stating only she was in love, and glad to be so. The boy took the letter, thanking Miriam again for the bread and dripping, and promising to deliver her letter that very day. As Miriam watched him go, she knew she would have to return to Podmore Grange, and soon, fearing for her father's health. News of her betrothal would surely rally him, and if she and Ralph were married quickly, her family's troubles could be solved. They'll certainly be surprised, she thought to herself, as she turned back into the kitchen, wondering again what to make for the dinner she had promised that evening. It was a triumph Miriam, utterly delicious, the Duke said, setting down his spoon, the empty syllabub dish in front of him speaking for itself. Miriam smiled. The pie, too, had been received with delight, and Miriam, the Duke, and Teresa had enjoyed a delicious dinner together. It really was wonderful, thank you, Teresa said, smiling at Miriam across the dining table. Miriam blushed. The pie had been delicious, and the syllabub was just as she remembered it from childhood, sweet and light, with the fragrant scent of nutmeg running through it. The Duke had opened a bottle of claret, 
and whilst Teresa had refused to partake, Miriam and the Duke had enjoyed sharing the bottle together, though Miriam had limited herself to only a glass for the sake of modesty. I'm glad you enjoyed it, Miriam said, as she rose to clear away the plates. We're celebrating the start of something new, extraordinary, perhaps, but something new, the Duke said, raising his glass in a toast. I can't thank you enough Miriam, Teresa said, and Miriam felt glad to have brought such happiness to a potentially tragic situation. What might have become of Teresa and the unborn child, could only be imagined, but now, the baby had a bright future ahead, and Teresa, too, would be taken care of. You don't need to thank me. I'm only glad I could help. But I had a letter this morning from my mother. She wrote to tell me my father isn't well, and she asks if I might return to Podmore Grange on my day off to see him. I can get there and back in a day, if a horse and trap bring me back. I want to tell my parents the news of our betrothal, Miriam said, glancing at the Duke, who nodded. I suppose it can't be avoided. But you won't tell them the rest of the plan, will you? He asked, with a note of caution in his voice. Miriam shook her head. She had already made up her mind to tell her parents only the bare facts of the matter. Like the rest of the world, news of the baby would wait until the proper time. Miriam's pregnancy would be immediate and swiftly accomplished, in a time period so as not to arouse suspicion. She and the Duke would live at Briar Heights, far away from prying eyes, and Miriam would tell her parents the two of them were taking time to get to know one another. No, I won't. I'll simply tell them, how happy I am to be betrothed, she replied, and Ralph smiled. Very well. I hope you are, he said, as Miriam left the dining room with the stack of dirty plates. But in all honesty, Miriam was happy. There were far worse men, many far worse men, she might have married than the Duke of Lancaster. But even that seemed unfair. In different circumstances, Miriam and the Duke might have met, and romance might have blossomed. She pondered this as she washed the dirty dishes in the kitchen, smiling to herself at the strange twists of fate leading to that moment. I really think we'll be happy, she told herself, for Miriam knew the Duke would treat her with every kindness he had already shown. The only other person, outside her immediate family, who knew where Miriam was, was her friend, Grace, now happily married to Henry, the Duke of Crawshaw. She had written to Grace on the day of her arrival at Briar Heights, swearing her to secrecy as to her new position, and now she sat down to write again, by the light of a candle, revealing the extraordinary circumstances leading to her betrothal to the Duke, and intending to send the letter from Podmore Grange. Grace was entirely trustworthy, and Miriam was glad to share her own thoughts on the matter, writing of her desire to help Teresa and the Duke so as to give the baby a bright future. She'll think me quite mad, I'm sure, Miriam thought to herself, as she sealed the envelope, smiling at the thought of what the ton would say, when the swift betrothal was discovered. Betrothed? But you've only been away a week or so, Miriam's mother exclaimed after Miriam had explained a limited version of the circumstances in which she now found herself. They were sitting in the upper room at Podmore Grange, where the Baron was wrapped in several blankets, huddled by a single glowing coal in the hearth. Claire was sitting next to him, and she, too, stared at Miriam with astonishment. I must say, it's all rather sudden, isn't it? She asked, as their father sneezed violently. Very sudden, he said, before coughing and spluttering into a handkerchief. Oh father, you sound worse than you did when I arrived, Miriam exclaimed, for the true reason of her visit had been somewhat overshadowed by the announcement of her betrothal. I'll be all right Miriam. But I must say, your news comes as quite a shock, the baron replied. I know it does, but, well, I didn't expect to fall in love so quickly, Miriam admitted. Her mother looked at her suspiciously, as though she could tell Miriam was holding something back. 
But what I don't understand is why the Duke of Lancaster should take such a remote and out-of-the-way house in the first place. Why did he need to? He's got Burnley Abbey, the seat of the dukedom. I'm not in touch with society now of course, but I've heard rumors of his having run away, the baroness said. But you can't tell anyone mother, he wants time alone. He's mourning his brother, and he has so many new responsibilities to see to. He doesn't want anyone to know where he is, Miriam said, knowing the duke would not thank her if his whereabouts were discovered. The facts, in their limited form, were extraordinary. But Miriam was not about to be dissuaded. A whirlwind romance was not unheard of, and if two people were in love, why should they wait to express that love publicly for all to see? I see, but, are you sure about this Miriam? You're not just doing this for our sake, are you? Her mother asked, with a note of concern entering her voice. Miriam shook her head. No mother, I'm not, she lied, even as she questioned her own motivations as to why she had done what she had done. Casting practicality aside, what was left? Miriam knew the Duke to be a good and honest man, his treatment of Teresa was proof of that, and she had begun to wonder whether her feelings for him might change with the passage of time. They were both young, of aristocratic descent, and their circumstances were both unexpected. The Duke had not expected to inherit his brother's title, much less a baby too, and Miriam had not expected to find her circumstances so reduced as to necessitate the taking on of employment such as she had. They were each of them navigating new and uncharted waters, and it made sense to face them together. It will solve our problems, Miriam's father said, raising his eyebrows. But it shouldn't have to. She shouldn't ever have been reduced to these circumstances, the baroness said, and Miriam could see the look of animosity which passed between her parents with these words. It seemed her mother blamed her father for their current circumstances, even as her letter of summons had contained a sentiment of the utmost concern. Tensions were rife at Podmore Grange, and Miriam knew a resolution to the family's troubles had to be found, and quickly. Marrying the Duke of Lancaster was just such a solution, and Miriam was only too glad to bring her parents some happy news. But they were only temporary mother. It doesn't matter now, does it? I'm to marry Ralph, the Duke, and when I do so, you'll all be taken care of, he's promised as much, Miriam replied. Her father sighed, coughing, as he struggled to sit up straight in his chair. Are we really to be objects of charity, Miriam? Will we be offered a dower house, like some ailing relative? He asked, shaking his head with a sigh. No, father. It's not like that. Not at all. The Duke wants to help. I don't know quite what he'll do, but he'll do his very best for you all, I know he will. He's a good and kind-hearted man. I wouldn't fall in love with anything less, would I? Miriam asked. It seems strange to talk of falling in love with the Duke of Lancaster. Miriam was not in love with him, nor he with her, but in the eyes of the world, such would be the case, as far as most society matches were concerned, at least. But Miriam, oh, I suppose it's the best we can hope for. But I'd so wanted to see you traverse the seasons enjoy a courtship, just as any young lady should do in your place, the baroness said, shaking her head sadly. Miriam knew her mother mourned their former life. They had lost almost everything, reminded of that fact by the decaying edifice of Podmore Grange, in which they had been reduced to two rooms, without servants or help of any kind. It was a stark contrast to the life they had once known, and Miriam could only feel sorry for her parents and sister as to the circumstances in which they found themselves. But that doesn't matter mother. I've found my happiness, haven't I? Miriam replied. And when do we get to meet him Miriam? Claire asked. Of this, Miriam was uncertain. She did not know how far the Duke would want to play the game or pretend as to feelings he did not possess. The practicalities of their plan had not yet been discussed, even as Miriam knew they would need to be soon. Well, 
He's very busy at the moment, but I'm sure you will in due course, Miriam replied. I should hope so, her mother retorted. And a lot of planning goes into a wedding, doesn't it? You'll need a new dress, Anne. Well, will you have the money for it? Claire asked. Again, Miriam was uncertain of the practical arrangements. These had not been discussed, let alone decided on. She could not tell her parents and sister the truth about Teresa, they would be horrified. Despite their reduced circumstances and the salvation offered by the wedding, Miriam knew she would be forbidden from ever stepping foot in Briar Heights again, let alone marrying the Duke. I'm sure it'll all work out. He is the Duke of Lancaster after all, Miriam replied. Her mother sighed and shook her head. Well Miriam, this was the last thing I ever expected you to return and tell us. But we give you our blessing, don't we Frederick? The Baroness said. Miriam's father smiled and nodded. We do Miriam. As long as you're happy, he replied. But Miriam was happy, and despite the practical arrangements of the match, she could not help but feel she would continue being happy in a marriage to a man who had already proved himself quite different to so many others. Chapter 12 I'm glad you could stay the night Miriam. There was no need to rush back to that lonely place on the moor. I'm sure the Duke won't mind, you are betrothed to him after all, Claire said, as she sat at the end of Miriam's bed the next morning. It was the Baroness who had suggested Miriam spend the night at Podmore Grange. She had intended to return to Briar Heights the previous evening, having sent her letter to Grace, and assured her parents she would return soon. But her mother had grown tearful and Miriam had been persuaded to stay the night. I never thought I'd have to do without my daughter. I miss you so much Miriam, the Baroness had said, and so the matter had been settled. But staying the night at Podmore Grange had been a very different experience from her previous life there. She and her sister had shared a small room in the attic, wrapped in blankets against the chill, and having to make do without a fire. Once, Miriam had slept in a grand bedroom far below the attics, in a large, canopied bed. A bay window had looked out over the gardens, the room was furnished with pretty furniture in the French style. But all of that was gathering dust, and the attic room was the best they could hope for. I won't be able to stay too long today, they'll be wondering where I am, Miriam said, as she pulled back the blankets. They? Who else is there? Claire asked, with a quizzical look on her face. Oh, just a kitchen boy, Miriam replied, for she had been thinking of Teresa as she spoke. Her sister smiled. It really is so nice to have you back here Miriam. I've missed you terribly, she said, reaching over and taking Miriam's hand in hers. I've missed you too Claire. But I had no choice but to go. And aren't you glad of the news I've brought back? Miriam asked. She wanted her family to be happy for her, and to realize what her marrying Ralph would mean for them all, salvation. I am, I was awake half the night thinking about it. It's all so sudden, Claire said. Miriam's sister was the sort of person to mull over a problem before delivering a verdict. Miriam raised her eyebrows feeling certain her sister had something more to say about the matter. And? Miriam asked. Anne. I just hope you're not doing this for our sake, rather than your own happiness. Don't you remember when we were children? We always used to imagine the sort of man we'd marry, a dashing, handsome stranger, come to sweep us off our feet, Claire said, and Miriam laughed. As children, she and Claire had always made up stories for one another's entertainment. They would be sagas, often told over many weeks, involving a complex cast of characters, and always with a love story at their heart. You always wanted to be cast as the maiden, rescued from the castle by the night. But I think we're both old enough to realize it doesn't always work like that, Miriam replied. Her sister shook her head, still clasping Miriam's hand in hers. I know, but, promise me you're not doing this just for us. 
You are happy, aren't you? You wouldn't let him force you into something you didn't want, Claire said, but Miriam shook her head. When have I ever allowed myself to be forced into anything, Claire? She asked, raising her eyebrows. Of the two sisters, Miriam was the stronger character. Claire was a pretty young woman, but her shyness often held her back. In the past, she had had suitors, but none leading to anything more than a dance or a polite house call. I know, it's just, well, promise me you've told me everything Miriam, she said, and Miriam nodded. I've told you everything. Now come along, we're not ladies of leisure any longer. We've got jobs to do, Miriam said, and getting out of bed, she hurried to get dressed, before helping her sister with the breakfast and sweeping out the hearth. Their father had passed a tolerable night, and it seemed the worst of the fever was past. You do look better father, Claire said, as they sat for a simple breakfast of boiled eggs and slices of bread and dripping. I feel a little better, thanks to seeing Miriam, the Baron replied. I'll not be sorry to see the back of bread and dripping, the Baroness said, looking disdainfully down at the plate in front of her. When they had finished breakfast, Claire insisted they walked into the village to visit the modiste. I just want to feel like I used to feel, when we would go to the dressmakers and choose our dresses for the balls, Claire said, insisting on Miriam accompanying her. Miriam had not thought about a dress, but the Duke had given her an advance on her wages, half of which she had given to her mother, and there would be enough remaining to place a deposit on a wedding dress. I should look the part, she told herself, for even if the wedding was to be merely a front, it had to look right, and the ton had to be convinced of Miriam's sincerity. We mustn't overdo it, Claire, Miriam replied, but she knew her sister was not listening. Claire had taken the fact of their poverty with considerable sorrow. She was simply not used to doing without servants and finery, and whilst the same could be said for Miriam, she, at least, had a sense of necessity in dealing with the practicalities of the life they now found themselves living. Look at all these beautiful dresses, Claire swooned, as they entered the modiste. It was a small shop, in comparison to offerings in London or Bath, but it suited the district well enough, and the proprietress, Miss Lillian Squire, had made dresses for most every young lady within a twenty-mile radius. Now, she looked up from her place behind the counter with surprise, setting aside the pleats of a skirt she was sewing, and rising to her feet. Miss Miriam, Miss Clare, what a pleasant surprise, she said, for she, like everyone in the district, knew well enough the misfortunes to have beset the family. Good morning Miss Squire, we've come to inquire about a wedding dress, Clare said, for she could be confident at times, and the modiste looked at her in surprise. For yourself Miss Clare? She said, but Clare shook her head, turning to Miriam with a smile. No, for my sister. She's to be the next Duchess of Lancaster, Clare replied. This revelation brought with it a response of aristocratic proportions. Miss Squire almost fell into a curtsy, and could not have been more helpful as measurements were checked against those in her register, and material suggested. Ivory I think, or perhaps, Pearl, yes, the shade is so important. I dislike the gaudiness of pure white, though I understand fashions change. Now, perhaps a veil, or don't you think so? She said, flitting around Miriam who now stood dutifully on a plush red stool, with Claire at her side. I think Pearl would be very nice, don't you Miriam? Claire asked. Miriam nodded. She did not have a particular opinion either way. The fact of her betrothal had been one thing, a practical necessity worked out between two interested parties. At Briar Heights, the matter had appeared transactional, but now, with talk of wedding dresses and veils, the matter seemed eminently more real. Miriam was getting married, and whilst she was glad to be helping the Duke and Teresa, she was now beginning to realize the magnanimity of her decision. Yes, pearl, or ivory, or, cream, she ventured. Miss Squire tooted. Not cream, cream suits a farmer's wife. Plain and unoriginal. No no, 
Cream won't do. White's too gaudy. Let's try pearl and ivory. I've some beautiful dresses you can try as a sample, then I'll make up the dress to just your specifications, she said, hurrying off behind the counter to fetch the samples. Miriam smiled to herself. She could not help but feel the modiste would make the dress to her own specifications, whatever Miriam might say to the contrary. Isn't this exciting, Miriam? Claire said, smiling up at Miriam, who was still perched on the stool. Oh, very much so, Miriam lied. All she wanted was to get married and help the Duke and Teresa, but all this fuss was making her wonder just what she was getting herself into. It feels just like the old days, Claire said, as she and Miriam walked back up the drive towards Podmore Grange later that morning. The garden was becoming overgrown, and the shutters on every window of the house, save for the two upper rooms the family still occupied, were a reminder the old days were long gone. Because we spent far too much money on a dress? Miriam replied, rolling her eyes. The cost of the wedding dress was to be considerable, but Miss Squire had merely promised to send the final bill to Burnley Abbey, and assuring Miriam her wedding dress would be like no other. Oh Miriam, can't you be excited about it? There's no harm in being excited. You're getting married, and you're saving us all from terribly poverty. Isn't that something to celebrate? Claire asked. Miriam agreed, though she felt somewhat guilty at having promised so much at the Duke's expense. He was a kind man, but he had so many problems of his own, and her own family's welfare was surely not his first concern. You mustn't expect too much Claire, Miriam replied, for her sister was getting carried away. Claire turned to look at her in surprise. But, aren't you in love with him? She asked. To this question, Miriam looked at her sister in surprise. Once again, the reality of what she was doing struck home. Discussing the practicalities of a wedding made it all seem very real, but the question of love was something else. She barely knew the Duke, let alone loved him. Besides, this was not a matter of love. Miriam was not in love with the Duke. She told herself as much, before answering her sister with the opposite. Of course I am, she said, as though the question was so obvious as to be absurd. Her sister looked at her and smiled. You're so lucky Miriam. After everything that's happened, I wondered if either of us would ever find love. No invitations to balls or soirees, no dinner or picnics or outings to the theater. How was either of us ever to meet a man we might marry? And yet, here you are, about to become the Duchess of Lancaster, the most prestigious title in the county, Claire said, shaking her head, as though she could hardly believe her sister's good fortune. And you'll be lucky too, Claire. You're a wonderful person, bright, witty, intelligent. You've got every quality, and any man would be a fool to ignore that, Miriam said, not wishing her sister to feel downhearted at the thought of her own prospects. But I can't help but feel sad about it all. I don't know if I'll ever meet someone. Not under these circumstances. We're a laughingstock, aren't we? Claire said glancing up at the shuttered house, with a sigh. We hold our heads up high Claire. They'll think twice before laughing at you now. Your sister's to be the Duchess of Lancaster. And as you say, there's not a more prominent title in all the county, Miriam replied. They made their way inside, through the now dust-gathering rooms, once so full of life and happiness. But Claire's question remained in Miriam's mind the question of love. A marriage required it, or so she felt, and in her vows, Miriam would be promising that love to the Duke and he, his own, to her. But this was all a matter of duty, or so she reminded herself, even as her thoughts of Ralph caused her to pause and think. Duty was one thing, but could she really live a life without ever feeling anything for the kind, good-hearted Duke? I'm certain I could love him, in time she told herself, even as she wondered what that would actually feel like. 
Miriam had never been in love before, and whilst she was willing to give up so much for her family's happiness, she realized now what she was really doing in agreeing to marry the Duke. Tell his grace, we must entertain him at his convenience. I'm sure we can put on a good show, Miriam's mother said, when it came time for Miriam to leave that day. We'll visit you soon mother, I promise. But please, there's no need to overdo it. Ralph, the Duke, understands our current predicament. He wouldn't expect us to be at our best, Miriam replied. Her mother tooted. Miriam knew she had not accepted the family's current predicament, and still behaved as though money was no object. I wouldn't want anything but the best for my daughter, the Baroness said, as she kissed Miriam goodbye. A horse and trap would take Miriam part of the way back to Briar Heights, and she would walk the last few miles across the moorland. But as she left Podmore Grange that afternoon, Miriam could not help but think herself fortunate, not only for the help the Duke had given her, but for her family too. We'll be all right, she told herself, even as it seemed the boundaries between duty and feeling were becoming blurred. Chapter 13 as Miriam walked up the path towards Briar Heights, she was surprised to see Ralph watching for her from an upper window. At seeing her, his face disappeared. The door was opened for her, the Duke standing on the threshold, smiling as Miriam approached. I wondered when you'd be back, he said, and Miriam smiled at him. I stayed the night. I hope you didn't mind. My sister wanted to talk and I've missed her so very much," she replied. Miriam thought it best not to mention the dress, or the fact of how she had explained their forthcoming matrimony to her parents. As far as her family was concerned, Miriam was marrying for love. She had fallen in love with the Duke in a whirlwind romance, now about to be realized through marriage. To her relief, her parents had not objected to her returning to Briar Heights, given the necessity of money. She had feared they might object to a betrothed couple living under the same roof, but Miriam had assured her mother there was no impropriety, for she would still be the housekeeper until matters were settled. Not at all. I'm glad you had that time together. I know what it's like to miss one's sibling, the Duke said, his words trailing of, and Miriam blushed. Forgive me. I didn't mean to. She began suddenly realizing what she had said. The loss of the Duke's brother had been a bitter blow, and Miriam knew he missed Max terribly. No no, it's quite all right. I won't begrudge your happiness over mine. But were your parents amenable to our marrying? Didn't they question you about it? He asked. Miriam wondered what he assumed as to her explanation, thinking it best to remain vague with her answer. Oh yes, quite so, she replied, as he led her inside. Good, I feared they might object. It's all very sudden, isn't it? He replied, shaking his head. Miriam wondered if he was having second thoughts, but appeared genuinely glad to see her, relieved, even, as though he had feared she might not return. Not at all. They couldn't very well refuse given their own circumstances, Miriam replied. The Duke nodded. It's a terrible business. I feel very sorry for your father. I'll do what I can to help, after we're married, of course, he said. Miriam was grateful to him. She loved her family dearly, and it broke her heart to see them living under such reduced circumstances. The prospect of the wedding brought hope a mutual beneficence for them all. And what of Teresa? Is she still resting? Miriam asked, and the Duke appeared suddenly grave. I think you should go to her. I've done what I can, but, well, I know little of such things. I can dress a battle wound, or make splint for a broken leg, but as for the role of a midwife, well, I think you'd be better suited to that, he said, blushing, as Miriam smiled. I'll go to her at once, Miriam said, placing her hand on Ralph's arm. He returned her smile, their gaze lingering for a moment. I really am glad you've returned. 
I wasn't certain you would, he said, and Miriam laughed. You won't get rid of me that easily your grace, she replied. I think, well, as we're to be married, such formalities aren't needed. I'd rather you thought of me as Ralph, not the Duke of Lancaster. And if I might be permitted to drop any nod to title on your part too, it might make our familiarity a little easier, he said, a nervous tone entering his voice, as though he believed he was overstepping the mark. Miriam smiled and nodded. I think that's a sensible idea, Ralph, she replied, blushing at uttering his name, even as it felt entirely right to do so. They lingered for a moment, each, it seemed, uncertain of what to say, before a call came from the landing above. Your Grace, might I have a little water? Teresa said, breaking the silence, and returning both Miriam and Ralph to their senses. Oh, yes, I'm coming, Teresa, Miriam called out, and nodding to the Duke, she hurried off to the kitchen to draw a jug of water from the pump in the yard. She found Teresa sitting up in bed, and it seemed it would not be long before the arrival of the child. Her stomach was swelled, her ankles puffy, and she looked tired and withdrawn. Oh Miriam, I didn't think you were back yet, T. Arisa said, as Miriam poured her a glass of water. Only a few moments ago. I stayed the night at Podmore Grange. There was a lot to explain, you see, Miriam replied, holding the glass to Teresa's lips. Did you tell them everything? Teresa asked, her eyes growing wide and fearful, but Miriam shook her head. No, not everything. I didn't mention you or the baby. They were surprised by the swiftness of the betrothal, but they didn't question it, Miriam replied. If anything, she had been surprised by her family's reaction, her father had made no objection, and her mother, despite her initial surprise, had been supportive. Perhaps they realized the necessity of such a match for their own salvation, and Miriam was glad to have their support. And what about when the baby comes? Are you ready for that? Teresa asked. Being a wife was one thing, but being a mother was quite another. It came with responsibilities, those which Miriam had thought herself distant from, at least for the time being. Her maternal instincts were low, and she had never desired children in the way she knew her sister did. Claire was forever playing with dolls as a child, and would speak lovingly of her future offspring, even naming them and creating stories around them, too. Miriam was of a more practical disposition. It was not that she disliked children, far from it but the desire for them had never overwhelmed her, and now she paused, wondering what motherhood would really be like. Well, you'll be here, won't you? We won't need to pretend when we're together. I know I'll love the child. I promise I will, but as for being its mother, you'll always be the child's mother Teresa. I don't want to take that away from you. It's what Max would have wanted, I'm sure, Miriam said. Teresa smiled, holding out her hand to Miriam, who took it and squeezed it. Miriam was surprised to see tears in her eyes, and she shook her head, apologizing for her foolishness. I'm sorry, it's just, well, I know it's for the best, and I know it gives my child, boy or girl, an advantage I could never offer. But I couldn't bear to be parted from it, I just couldn't imagine it, and I was worried I might. She stammered, as she began to sob. Miriam put the glass on the bedside table and kneeled at the side of the bed. She put her arms around Teresa and embraced her. No one's going to take your baby from you, Teresa. Not me, nor Ralph, nor anyone. You're the child's mother, and you've carried it this far, protecting and loving it with every ounce of strength you possess. Don't worry. I'm not going to pretend to be the baby's mother any more than I have to, I promise, Miriam said. She knew how difficult it would be for Teresa. But ever since their first encounter in Bluebell Woods, Miriam had only wanted to help Teresa. She did not know why she felt such affinity towards her, they shared nothing in common, but Miriam had felt a sense of duty towards the maid, 
a duty she intended to fulfill. Thank you, miss, Teresa said, and Miriam smiled. I think you can call me Miriam, don't you? She replied. The maid smiled and nodded. I'd like that, Miriam, she replied. Later that evening, Miriam was stoking up the fire in the kitchen. The day had been warm, but the clear skies had given way to a cold evening, and Miriam had brought in logs from the wood store and lit candles on the kitchen table. She was considering what to make for dinner, some game birds hung waiting to be plucked in the larder, and the remains of a mutton stew were gently heating in a pot over the grate. I hope I'm not disturbing you, a voice in the doorway from the hall said, and Miriam looked up to find the duke, his face illuminated by a candle he was carrying, standing on the step. Not at all. I'm just trying to conjure something from nothing. I never know what to make. We had a cook once, Mrs. Lillington, she could make anything you asked of her. I wish I knew more. I should have brought some of her recipe books back from Podmore Grange. They're still in the kitchen there I think, Miriam said, peering into the larder, even as her inspiration was lacking. I'm sure whatever you make will be delicious, the Duke replied stepping down into the kitchen and seating himself at the table. Miriam had not expected to see him until dinner, but she was glad to have his company, even as there remained something of an uncertainty between them. Their roles were blurred, master and servant, the first flourishes of friendship, a courting couple. It was all very confusing, or so it seemed. Miriam reminded herself of her duty, this was a practical arrangement, and nothing more. But if the Duke also considered it such, why was he now sitting at the kitchen table, as Miriam tried to think what to prepare for dinner? I could pluck these game birds and roast them. If I get the fire hot enough, it'll heat the oven sufficiently, Miriam said, and she brought the birds out of the larder, realizing she had never plucked anything in her life. Do you know what to do? He asked, smiling at her in the candlelight. Well, I just, Pull off the feathers, don't I? Miriam replied, remembering a somewhat traumatic childhood incident when she had seen one of her father's gamekeepers do just that. I'll do it if you like. You don't have to watch, Ralph said, beckoning Miriam to hand him the brace of birds, which she did with relief. I feel foolish. I should know how to do these things, although I suppose the nursery and drawing room weren't the best preparation for such a life. I've never had to do anything like this, Miriam admitted. Up until now, Miriam's life had been spent preparing for the role of wife and mother, and whilst she was about to step into those very shoes, the path she was now taking had been entirely unexpected. Cooking, cleaning, dusting, laundry, all these things were alien to her, even as she had tried her best to adapt to this new way of living. I learned to do this in the army. In Corsica, there was nothing much to eat except birds like this. We'd pluck them and pot them. I'm quite good at it, Ralph said, and Miriam watched as he deftly removed the feathers, his hands working quickly, as he plucked and pulled. Miriam was impressed, and she sat opposite him, watching him in the flicker of the candlelight, his eyes focused on the task in hand, even as she imagined his hands around her waist, his lips pressed against hers. It won't be long for Teresa now. She's getting bigger by the moment, Miriam said, pulling herself back from her daydreaming. Ralph nodded. Are you ready to be a mother? He asked. Miriam thought back to her earlier conversation with Teresa. She did not want the maid to take second place. Teresa would be the baby's mother in all but name, even as the ton would think differently. I think so, yes. But I won't really be, will I? I won't, give birth to the baby, Miriam replied, and Ralph grimaced. Must we be so blunt? He said, and Miriam laughed. But that's what happens when a baby's born. It's not something to be afraid of. But it's Teresa who has to go through it. I'll be there, of course, but it's her baby, Miriam said, smiling at Ralph who nodded. I know that, but… we've both got a role to play. 
I'm pretending to be a father, and you're pretending to be a mother. It's going to be different for us both, isn't it? Very different, he said, and Miriam nodded. It will be, but I'm sure we'll manage, she replied. The sudden nature of the proposal had given way to practicality. There was a great deal to think about. Most couples enjoyed a period of courtship, made plans for their betrothal and marriage, and it was not until after the wedding they thought anything of children. But for Miriam and Ralph, all these things had come at once. Their courtship had not happened, their betrothal had come just hours after they had met, and the baby was due before the wedding would even take place. It seemed overwhelming, even as Miriam knew they had to remain steadfast in their undertaking. It's not something I ever really thought about, the responsibility of it I mean. I imagine children to be a distant possibility, rather than a sudden reality. Do you think we can do it? Ralph asked, looking up from his plucking, and fixing Miriam with an anxious gaze. He had clearly been fretting over the matter, and Miriam wondered if he was even now having second thoughts. It won't be easy, but that's no reason not to do it. We've got to think about the baby, and what your brother would have wanted for his heir, if it's a boy. Then there's Teresa too, and my own family. This isn't just about us, is it? Miriam replied. The Duke nodded. You're right. I suppose, I'm still a little worried about you, that's all. You don't have to go through with this. Not if you don't want to, he said, having now finished plucking the last of the birds. But Miriam was not having second thoughts. She would do her duty, even as it was a duty she did not consider burdensome. Marriage was a certainty for a woman of her rank and class, unless she was wealthy in her own right, but a good marriage, a happy marriage, a loving marriage, was never guaranteed. In Ralph, Miriam had found a man who would respect her and honor her, he had proved as much by the concern he had shown for her, and she was happy to accept the betrothal, knowing full well what it meant. But I do want to, she replied, feeling certain they would both do what it took to make their duty bearable, and perhaps even something more. Chapter 14 Ralph awoke the next morning to the sound of a cuckoo cooing in the tree outside his bedroom window. The roasted game birds had been delicious, and Ralph had gone to bed with a full stomach, having greatly enjoyed the company of the housekeeper, the woman who was to become his wife. It still felt strange to say that, a strangeness Ralph knew would continue, even until the moment of their nuptial celebration. It's not a real wedding, he told himself, yawning and stretching out his arms. But in outward appearances, in every appearance, what they were doing was real. They were to get married and would later announce the arrival of a baby. The coming months would be a test, the baby would have to be kept secret until the appropriate time, and even then, the question of its conception would be raised. It was not uncommon for a woman to fall pregnant in the weeks following marriage, but Ralph knew there would be surprise amongst the ton, especially given the haste by which the marriage was enacted. They knew a baby was coming, they would say, nodding to one another knowingly. But the hint of a scandal was far preferable to the real scandal the birth of Teresa's baby would bring if the facts were widely known. Max was the baby's father, and he and Teresa had not been married. She was a maid, and he had been the Duke of Lancaster. The birth would create gossip from Lancaster to London, and the reputation of the dukedom would be irreparably damaged. And I can only imagine what mother would say, Ralph thought to himself, as he got out of bed and pulled on his breeches. He intended to write to the Dowager Duchess, explaining in high volute terms the whirlwind romance he and Miriam had enjoyed. He would implore her to be happy for them and tell her how very much in love he was with the Baron's daughter. His mother would be surprised, of course, but she would not, and could not, forbid the match. Miriam was of good lineage, even though her family had fallen on hard times. And what about Connor? He wondered to himself, throwing open the window, and causing the cuckoo to flutter off in fright, its song turning to an anguished indignance. Connor Edge, Ralph's advisor, was an unknown entity. 
He had encouraged Max to seek a wife, for the good of the dynasty, and would no doubt do the same for Ralph, too, albeit on different terms to this. But as for preventing the match, Ralph did not think he would go so far, there was no scandal in a duke marrying the daughter of a baron, even as the story behind it was a different matter altogether. But he doesn't know about that, does he? No one does, Ralph reminded himself, and now he made his way downstairs, glad of the delicious scent of breakfast wafting up the stairs. Miriam appeared a few moments later in the dining room, carrying with her a platter of eggs and sausages. The farm boy brought a basket at first light, eggs, sausages, two loaves of bread, fresh milk, and a pat of butter, she said, setting the platter on the table with a flourish. Marvelous, Ralph exclaimed, thinking how fortunate he would be to have a woman like Miriam as his wife, and he tucked in hungrily to his breakfast, cutting thick slices from one of the loaves of bread, which he spread liberally with butter and marmalade. When he had finished breakfast, Ralph opened the dining room window, breathing in the sweet heathery scent of the moorland. Bees were buzzing in the garden, and the sky was blue and bright with the morning sunshine. Miriam had returned to clear the table, and Ralph turned to her, smiling at the sight of the pretty young woman, who had tied her long auburn hair into a bun with a red ribbon, her rosy cheeks and bright blue eyes, framing her pretty face. Will you have anything more to eat, your grace, Ralph? There's plenty. She said, checking herself, as Ralph smiled. You don't have to be my maid and housekeeper anymore, Miriam. It's good of you to do these things. But when the baby arrives, I'll have to do my share too, he said. Miriam nodded. But aren't you just like me? Apart from plucking birds, do you know anything about domestic tasks? How to clean brass or make butter? She asked, raising her eyebrows. In these, and so many other tasks, Ralph found himself lacking. But his time in the army had taught him the necessity of stepping up to the mark. He had learned much about fending for himself and was not about to shirk away from menial tasks or expect Miriam to do them for him. I'm sure I can learn. We'll learn together, Ralph replied, and he helped Miriam carry the empty plates and platters back to the kitchen. They washed the dishes together, elbow deep in the soapy water, splashing one another, both by accident and design. I'm soaked through, Miriam exclaimed, after they had finished. Then come outside and dry off in the sun. Why don't we take a walk across the moors? Ralph suggested. It was a beautiful day and he had no desire to remain cooped up in his study, but Miriam now looked doubtful. What about Teresa? Will she be all right? I don't like to leave her for long, she said. Why don't you ask her if she'll be all right? We won't be long. It's such a beautiful day. I feel like stretching my legs, Ralph replied. He was used to being outside, be it on the battlefield, or the shooting more. In the past, Ralph had been happiest with a gun or a rod, hunting or fishing, often in the company of his brother. He missed such pursuits, for they were not the same without Max, and the camaraderie they had shared. Miriam nodded, hurrying off upstairs, and returning a moment later to tell Ralph that Teresa was asleep, and would surely be all right on her own for an hour or two. Ralph was pleased, he enjoyed Miriam's company and was glad of the chance to be alone with her once again. Isn't it beautiful out here? Miriam exclaimed, as they walked across the garden and through the gate in the wall leading onto the moorland. The heather stretched out in an undulating purple haze around them, with paths leading in every direction. There was a point on a hill, about a mile from Briar Heights, where a cairn of stones had been constructed, and it was in the direction of this height they now went, walking side by side through the heathers, breathless and happy. I could walk across the moorland for hours, days even, Ralph exclaimed, as they paused for breath far above Briar Heights, the view opening out as far as Burnley Abbey in the east. Does the dukedom own all this land, as far as the eye can see? Miriam asked. Not all of it, no. 
but a great deal. Do you see the course of the river there? Ralph asked, pointing to where a silvery slither of water snaked its way through a distant valley. I see it, yes, Miriam replied. That's the extent of the land in the east, and the point we're walking to now, that's the extent to the south. Briar Heights doesn't belong to the estate, though it once did I believe, he replied. But did you really come all the way out here just for Teresa's sake, or was there something more? Miriam asked. Ralph blushed. The baron's daughter was not afraid of asking questions, and this was a question Ralph had been dreading. His arrival at Briar Heights had really had nothing to do with Teresa, even as he had vowed to do all he could to help her. He had wanted to run away from his responsibilities, at least those of the dukedom, and Briar Heights had seemed the obvious place to do so. Thus far, no one had found him, and Ralph hoped for the continuation of that happy face for some time to come. Well, I've not been entirely honest about that. I was struggling, after Max's death and coming back from fighting in Corsica to be pronounced heir in my brother's place, it was all too much, Ralph admitted. He did not like to show weakness. As a soldier and an officer, he had been responsible for inspiring his men, even in the most difficult of circumstances. But with Miriam, Ralph felt as though he could be honest as to his troubles and the difficulties he had faced. In everything, he had only tried to do what was right, even as it had caused him difficulties, and now he wanted Miriam to understand why he had come to Briar Heights and what it was he feared. I understand. You never expected to be the heir, did you? Miriam said, and Ralph shook his head. I grew up as the second son. None of this was supposed to be for me. I wasn't meant to inherit or take responsibility. You must think me a terrible coward, running away like this, and shirking my duty, he said, but Miriam shook her head. I don't think you're a coward at all. I think you've done everything your brother would have wanted. You've risked everything to help Teresa, and is it any wonder you found the thought of such responsibility difficult in the face of your brother's death? Miriam asked. Ralph had not been able to speak so openly about Max with anyone before. He had remained stoic in the face of grief, not admitting his feelings, even to his mother or close friends. Tears welled up in his eyes, and he sighed shaking his head, as he sat down on a tuft of heather at the side of the path. Miriam sat down next to him, putting her arm around him in an unexpected gesture of comfort. I'm sorry. I just, I haven't truly grieved for him, or for myself, either. I thought I'd always be the second, and my life would be my own. But that's not to be. This is my destiny now. I don't have any choice in the matter and as much as I want to live up to expectation, I worry I won't be able to. I feel his shadow lingering, they'll compare me to him, and to our father. I know they will, Ralph replied. He had been hailed a hero on his return from Corsica, but in truth, Ralph felt nothing but a fraud. He was masquerading as a duke, ill-prepared for the rigors of his office, and without any sense of what the future held. Title, marriage, a child. It had all come so unexpectedly, and he felt as though he was floundering amidst the expectations of others. But you're not your father, or your brother, Miriam said. Her tone was gentle and reassuring, and Ralph looked up at her and gave a weak smile. You must think me a terrible fool. I shouldn't burden you with my failings, he said, but Miriam shook her head. I don't count them as failings. You've not failed. If anything, you've tried to do the right thing yet again, to take your new responsibilities seriously, rather than charging in without a second thought. And if you can't unburden yourself to your future wife, then who can you unburden yourself to? She asked. Ralph had not thought about it like that. Miriam had listened to him. She had not judged him, but only sought to be a friend to him, and for that, he was grateful. They were no longer strangers but had shared their intimacies, Ralph, his fears over the future of the dukedom, and Miriam, the troubles besetting her family, and which had brought her to Briar Heights. 
It was an intimacy certain to deepen, and one Ralph was glad of, for he could not imagine marrying Miriam, if they were not at least to be friends. I suppose that's true, and I hope you feel the same. Please, if anything ever troubles you, tell me it, Ralph implored her. Miriam nodded, rising to her feet and offering him her hand. I will, I promise. But come now, haven't we a summit to reach? She asked, pointing up towards the top of the hill, which lay around half a mile further up the path. Ralph smiled. He could not help but like Miriam, her resolute practicality, her gentle ways, her pretty face, her courage and conviction to do what was right. She reminded him of Max, though without the boyish and mischievous streak Ralph's brother had so often displayed. Come along then, I'll race you there, he said, and he set off at sprint through the heathers, as Miriam let out a cry and ran behind him, hitching up her skirts and holding onto her bonnet as she ran. You had a head start, that's not fair, she exclaimed, as they reached the top of the hill, breathless and red-faced. Ralph laughed, doubling over with a stitch. I, I'm not. As fit as I was in the army. The sedentary life of a duke doesn't suit me well. I've spent more time behind a desk than romping across the moors. But goodness me, isn't the view magnificent? Ralph said, pointing out over the moorlands, which stretched endlessly on every side. Miriam smiled, catching her breath, as she stood next to him, holding her bonnet against the breeze, which blew strongly on the heights, despite the clear blue sky above. It's wonderful. Truly beautiful, she said, smiling up at him. And I'm glad to think you'll share it with me, he replied, returning her smile. His words were not empty, but true. Ralph was glad to think of Miriam as his companion, and to imagine the life they would lead together. In his heart, he felt the stirrings of something, an affection beyond mere practicality, and for a moment, he allowed himself to wonder where those feelings might lead. Chapter 15 Ralph was glad of the time he had spent with Miriam that day. They had returned from their walk to find Teresa in far better spirits than the day before, and she had even joined them for dinner in the dining room, where Miriam served a delicious stew of mutton and vegetables, and they ate with the windows onto the garden open, the sweet scent of the heather in the early evening perfuming the room. Ralph had retired to bed contented, and for the first time since arriving at Briar Heights, he actually felt a sense of optimism for the future. I don't fear the prospect of marrying her, that's for certain, he thought to himself, as he rose the following morning to another cloudless sky. The date of the wedding had not yet been fixed, and there were still many practicalities to see to. But Ralph was confident these matters would easily fall into place, and it would not be long before the new Duchess of Lancaster was presented to the ton, along with her beautiful new baby. We need to find a doctor, someone trustworthy to take into our confidence, or a midwife, Ralph said, as he and Teresa sat at the breakfast table that morning. Any pretense of the appearance of a master and servant was gone, and Ralph had invited Miriam to dine with him, as was now the case. She nodded, cutting herself a slice of bread and spreading it liberally with butter and jam. Yes, you're right. I've been worrying about, I have to say. I've sat with dozens of Maras giving birth, but it's hardly the same, is it? She replied. Ralph smiled and shook his head. Not the same at all, it's. He began, but he was interrupted by a loud knocking at the door, startled at this intrusion into their otherwise silent abode. A visitor, at this hour? Miriam exclaimed, rising to her feet. Ralph did the same. He was nervous as to the thought of who should be calling on them at such an early hour of the day or at any hour of the day. Briar Heights was a lonely and out-of-the-way place, precisely why he had chosen it, and the thought of visitors perturbed him. Go and see who it is. But, be cautious, Ralph said. He followed Miriam from the dining room out into the hallway, hiding behind the edge of the staircase as she went to open the door. Ralph was worried, and his fears were justified, 
when the voice of Connor Edge introduced himself. Ah, you must be Miss Miriam. I want to speak to his grace, he said. Ralph peered cautiously between the banisters. And who might you be, sir? Since you know my name, am I not entitled to know yours? Miriam asked. I'm Connor Edge, his grace's land agent. I need to speak to him urgently, Connor replied. Miriam began to protest, inventing a story about Ralph being away, but Ralph knew the land agent would only persist, and so he stepped out from his hiding place, appearing before Connor who looked him up and down with narrowed eyes, and a disdainful look. Connor? Ralph said, angry at having his hiding place discovered, even as he knew it was inevitable it would be so, eventually. Your Grace, I need to talk to you, urgently, and in private, Connor said, glancing at Miriam, as he stepped, uninvited, into the hallway. Ralph was not about to be intimidated by the land agent, and he had fully intended to inform Connor of his intention to marry just as soon as the arrangements were made. He wondered what was known of his betrothal, if anything, and now he beckoned Connor to follow him, leading him towards the study, and giving Miriam a look of gratitude as he passed. As the door closed behind them, Ralph turned to face the land agent, his expression growing angry. Well? What is it you want? He demanded, even as he knew Connor had every right to know the truth. What are you doing your grace? You leave no word, save a hastily written letter, you disappear, and now I hear you're to marry the daughter of the Baron of Mowbray. What about your responsibilities? Your duty to your title and the estate. He said, sitting down at Ralph's desk without invitation. Ralph had not expected Connor to arrive armed with such information, though he knew he could not have expected to keep the matter a secret forever. And what if I am? Why shouldn't I marry the daughter of a baron? He demanded. With any luck, Connor knew nothing of Teresa being in the house, and the land agent could be appeased, albeit with an inaccurate account of the truth. But it's not only that, is it? There's a baby too, isn't there? Connor snarled. Ralph sighed. He did not know how these facts were known. But Connor had discovered them somehow and how he was to use them to his advantage remained to be seen. I don't know how you know all this Connor, but I suggest you say what you want to say and leave. I'm not accountable to you, Ralph replied. He had always kept Connor at arm's length, though he had tried to remain civil in his dealings with him. Max had not trusted him, and Ralph now wondered if he should dismiss the land agent, rather than seek to appease him. But you're accountable to yourself and to your title your grace. Like it or not, you're the Duke of Lancaster. You can't shy away from that and fathering a child out of wedlock with a maid, is a scandal you'll live to regret," Connor exclaimed, banging his fist on the desk. Ralph was relieved to know the land agent knew only half the story, and had got the facts entirely wrong, even as his false belief was just as potentially damaging as the truth. Ralph knew he had to be careful in his response, though he was determined to discover the source of this scandalous rumor. And what makes you believe Teresa's baby is anything to do with me? Ralph asked. Because a certain Mrs. Hill came to see me your grace. She told me all about your arrangements here at Briar Heights. How she was replaced by the daughter of the Baron of Mowbray, whilst you protected the interests of our former maid, a maid heavy with child whom you could not let go as I suggested. Well, it didn't take long for the facts to emerge. It was Mrs. Hill who told me of your betrothal too. A certain modiste, Miss Lillian Squire, was only the other day engaged to make a wedding dress for the baron's daughter, and it was she who informed Mrs. Hill of the betrothal, Connor replied. It was a tangled web, and in it, the truth had become caught, disfigured, and unfurled as only a half-truth. Connor had some of the facts, whilst the others were based merely on prejudice and assumption. As for the wedding dress, Miriam had made no mention of it, though there was no reason why she should have done, given the necessity of arrangements still to be made. And what if I am to marry? 
Why shouldn't I? Aren't I at liberty to do so? Ralph demanded. For all his self-stated failings, he was the Duke of Lancaster, and if he wanted to marry, then so be it. As for the belief in the lineage of Teresa's baby, Connor was wrong, and should the scandal break, it could be denied. But don't you see what she's doing, what they're both doing, your grace? The penniless daughter of an aristocrat attaches herself to you, and what does she want? Meanwhile, a maid holds you to ransom over a meaningless tryst, producing a bastard with a claim to your title, if it's a boy, Connor replied. His tone was suggestive of one who was only trying to help, even as Ralph felt certain he had ulterior motives. But the use of such foul language made Ralph angry, and he drew himself up, facing Connor defiantly. I would hear the child spoken of in such terms, he replied, but Connor merely shrugged. I'm only saying what others will say your grace. You can't hide here forever. And isn't it right to say so? Aren't both these women using you for their own advantage? He asked. Ralph shook his head. It was not like that, not at all, and he would defend both Miriam and Teresa until his dying breath, if only to prove it. No Connor, they're not, and I won't hear you say so, Ralph replied. The land agent rolled his eyes. You're blinded by your own foolishness, he snapped. And I've heard enough of what you have to say Connor, Ralph replied. But it seemed the land agent was only just getting started, and now he reminded Ralph of his responsibilities to the estate and title, and how he had besmirched the good name of his brother and father before him. What did you think would happen? Did you believe you could just disappear and return when you wished? It's madness your grace. You left no instructions. I've had to run the entire estate without you, and these rumors are now rife. You'll be glad to know it's only myself and one or two others who know about the baby. But as for the marriage, it's all across the district, thanks to Miriam's sister and the modiste. What a terrible mess of your brother's legacy you've made, Connor said, shaking his head. How dare you use my brother's legacy against me? How dare you speak of him in such terms? I'm minded to dismiss you immediately Connor, Ralph exclaimed, his anger now boiling over. But the expression on the land agent's face now changed, and an unpleasant smile came over his face. And if you did so your grace, you'd leave yourself open to the possibility of blackmail. The whole county might know the secret. I came here today to help you, but I can see you don't want my help. But you'd be wise to heed my advice. Forget the marriage and send the maid away. Let the bastard grow up in ignorance, and don't try to make things better for it than the lot it deserves. Return to Burnley Abbey, and forget this whole foolish business, he said, rising to his feet. Ralph waved his hand dismissively. He would not be blackmailed by Connor but his threat was very real, if couched in salvific terms, and for now, it was better to keep the land agent on his side than attempt to get rid of him. I'll consider your proposal, he said. Do more than consider it your grace, act on it. Send them both away, shut up the house, and return to Burnley Abbey. The Dowager Duchess returns at the end of the month. I believe she is, as yet, unaware of the current situation. Let it remain so, Connor replied. The threat was gone from his voice, though the possibility of that threat remained, and his tone had returned to that businesslike manner he had so often employed. But for a moment, Ralph had seen another side to the land agent, a side he cared nothing for, and felt certain was the truth behind the mask. I'll consider your proposal, Ralph repeated, even as he had no intention of doing so. Connor rose from the desk, glancing around him and shaking his head. The Duke of Lancaster, reduced to a moorland hovel, he said, grimacing as he left the room. Ralph did not follow him, but slumped into an armchair by the hearth. He was angry with the land agent, none of it was true, even as Connor was in possession of only some of the facts. Miriam had not sought to exploit her position at Briar Heights, 
nor had Teresa blackmailed Ralph into taking care of her and the baby. But now the question of what to do about their plan arose, could they really pass Teresa's baby off as Miriam's? Connor would guess as to the truth, even as he continued to believe Ralph, and not Max, was the father. What a tangled web we weave, he thought to himself, sighing, just as a gentle knock came at the door. It was Miriam, and she was carrying a tray of tea things, which she set down on the desk before closing the door behind her. I heard you shouting at him, she said, and Ralph shook his head. I lost my temper with him. He thinks it's my baby, Ralph replied, lowering his voice, lest they be overheard. And did you dissuade him of that fact? Miriam replied. Ralph shook his head. No, but everyone knows about our betrothal too. There's a modiste apparently. He said, and Miriam blushed. I'm sorry, I didn't mean for the facts to become come knowledge. My sister was so excited. I'm sure she was only too glad to share the good news too. But never mind, it was going to be known, wasn't it? Eventually I mean, Miriam said. She was right. There could be no hiding from the truth, not in terms of the marriage at least. The matter of the baby was something else entirely, and there were bound to be doubts as to its lineage, even as the truth remained hidden. I just wonder, well, about the baby. Will it work do you think? He asked, feeling suddenly doubtful as to the lie they were going to tell. Miriam kneeled at his side and took his hand in hers. I don't know, but does it matter what they think? They can't prove anything, can they? If we say I'm the child's mother, what possible retort can there be? She asked. Ralph nodded. She was right, rumor and speculation may abound, but if they maintained their story and the child was revealed at the right time, no one could possibly know the truth. Connor's own version of the story was distorted, a whisper changed by a whisper, and that was that. Yes, I know. It's just, well, you know how it is, he replied. Miriam put her hand on his and smiled. We're doing the right thing, Ralph. For the baby and Teresa, for your brother's legacy, for you, she said, and he smiled back at her. And for you too, I hope. And for your family. Connor can say what he likes. I won't be intimidated by him, and I won't be blackmailed either. Has he gone? He asked, and Miriam glanced behind her towards the door. He was. Oh, I was making the tea when he left. I thought you'd shown him out. She asked. Ralph shook his head, though he was glad to simply be rid of Connor, even as he knew he would have to face him again in the end. It's all right. I'm sure he's gone. But we can't stay here forever, can we? We need a better plan, for once the baby's born I mean. Teresa needs to hide somewhere, and in nine months, return so that we can pass the child off as our own. It's not going to be easy Miriam, he said. But Miriam squeezed his hand reassuringly. Things worth doing aren't always easy, but we'll do it, I promise, she replied and despite the troubles hanging over him, Ralph could only be grateful for having Miriam at his side. Chapter 16 Connor was angry. He had come to Briar Heights that morning spoiling for a fight, and he had found the Duke languishing in foolishness, a betrothal to a penniless baron's daughter, a bastard child, whose mother was living in the same house, a foolishness Connor was determined to prevent, not only for Ralph's sake, but for his own, too. He had been searching for the Duke ever since Ralph had left Burnley Abbey, but having assumed him to have gone to London, he had followed a cold trail, imagining him in some far-off locale, rather than hiding on the moorland, only a matter of miles from Burnley Abbey. It had been the housekeeper who had come to see him, telling a remarkable story of her dismissal, and informing Connor of what she had observed at Briar Heights. It's not right sir. I would have left anyway. A den of iniquity, a pregnant maid out of wedlock, a penniless baron's daughter, and now I discover they're to be married. A betrothed couple, 
living under the same roof, in a love nest with the woman carrying the bastard, it's wicked sir. I'm a respectable woman, and I've come to tell you this so as to preserve that reputation. The baby must be his, mustn't it? Why else would he protect her? I wanted nothing to do with it, Mrs. Hill, the former housekeeper of Briar Heights, had told him. Mrs. Hill was not entirely correct and she spoke of a desire to preserve her reputation alone. She offered no resistance to the gift of a gold sovereign in gratitude for her information, embellishing the story with further details. She suggested the Duke had already paid out several hundred pounds to the Baron of Mowbray and intended to move his new wife to the continent where, presumably, their scandalous lifestyle would be accepted. They'll take the maid too, sir. Mark my words, Mrs. Hill had concluded. But Connor was sly enough to recognize a kindred spirit in Mrs. Hill, and he took her elaborations with a pinch of salt, thanking her profusely, as he showed her the door. And if I can be of any further help, sir, she said, clutching her gold sovereign. Don't breathe a word of it to anyone, Connor had said, though he suspected the housekeeper would be incapable of doing so. In any case, it served him well to think of the rumor spreading. Ralph had been foolish to think the matter could remain hidden, and whilst Connor knew he was not yet in possession of all the facts, he was determined to use the matter to his advantage. As he had left Ralph's study, a sudden thought had occurred to him. The hallway was empty, and he could Miriam in the kitchen. He glanced towards the stairs, wondering if he might find Teresa alone upstairs, and taking his chance, he hurried up to the landing. We'll see what the little harlot has to say for herself, he thought to himself, as he opened one of the doors off the landing. It led into an empty room, but the second door he tried, led into a bedroom and there, asleep on the bed, was Teresa. She looked different to the last time Connor had seen her, her stomach was far larger, her ankles swollen, and her face puffy. He remembered the day he had dismissed her, the tears in her eyes, and the look of fear on her face. Connor closed the door behind him, approaching the bed, just as Teresa rolled over. Miriam, is that you? Will you bring me some water please? She said. It's not Miriam, but I'll pour you a glass of water, Connor replied, taking the jug and glass from the bedside table. Teresa startled, sitting up straight in bed, and staring fearfully at Connor, who narrowed his eyes and glared at her. I only want to talk to you. Don't make a fuss now, he said, handing Teresa the glass. She stared at him, shaking her head, her hands trembling. I, what do you want? Where's Ralph? Where's Miriam? She asked. I'm sure they're doing whatever a betrothed couple does. But it's you I want to speak to. What brought you here? Why didn't you leave? Isn't that what I told you to do? He snarled, but Teresa shook her head. You sent me away with nothing. I didn't have anywhere to go. Ralph. His grace helped me. He didn't want to see me suffer. He brought me here. He's looking after me, she gasped, and Connor sneered. Looking after his own interests, more like. You're carrying his child. Do you think he cares about you? No, you're nothing to him. An unfortunate vessel, which I hope he'll discard as soon as the bastard's born, Connor snarled. Tears welled up in Teresa's eyes, but Connor cared nothing for her feelings. She had seduced Ralph, and now she was taking advantage of the fact. There would soon be a demand for payment, blackmail, from either her or Miriam. The Duke was a fool if he could not see that, and if he had listened to Connor in the first place, this situation would not have arisen. His child? Teresa asked, and Connor nodded. Don't play the fool with me girl. I know what you did. And now the Baron's daughter knows it too. Hasn't she used it to her advantage? What did you think you were doing, taking her into your confidence like that? Connor said, and now he brought his face close to Teresa's, his anger boiling over. Teresa shrank back fearfully, 
her eyes wide and tearful. But I didn't have anywhere else to go. No money, no prospects. Mrs. Mason wouldn't give me a reference, she stammered. And who would give a reference to a harlot like you? Connor exclaimed. The housekeeper had suspected a liaison between the duke and the maid, but there had been no proof of the matter, not at Burnley Abbey, at least. But now, the proof was right here, Ralph had given Teresa a roof over her head, the prospect of a future, both for her and the bastard child. What was he thinking of? It's not like that, Teresa replied. Then what is it like? What do you expect to happen when it's born, Anne, oh? I see, Connor said, a sudden realization dawning over him. That was their plan, for the Duke to marry Miriam, and for the baby to be their own. It would solve all their problems, both Ralph's and Miriam's. The Baron of Mowbray would be saved, and any question of the baby's lineage resolved. He smiled, stepping back and narrowing his eyes. I don't understand, Teresa said, as a tear rolled down her cheek. You soon will. Do you really think they'll let you have anything to do with the baby? Once it's born, you won't see it again. They might keep you with them as a token gesture, but you can't play happy families with a duke and duchess. They're doing this for their own benefit, to save two families from ruin. Don't you see that, Teresa? But you could ruin them both. We could ruin them both, he said, even as Teresa shook her head. I won't do that. They're not like that. It was you who sent me away from Burnley Abbey. You and Mrs. Mason. The Duke came after me. He gave me money. He promised to protect me, she stammered, but Connor had heard enough. He saw through the plan, it was obvious now. The birth of the baby would be kept a secret. The marriage would be swift, and in nine months, the Duke and Duchess of Lancaster would return to Burnley Abbey with a happy addition to their happy. The baby would be larger than normal, but no one would truly question its lineage. Connor shook his head, delighted in himself for realizing that which was to be, and knowing he could use it to his own advantage. If Teresa could be persuaded to see the folly of her role in it all, then she, too, could be useful. Because you're carrying his child you foolish girl. Don't you think that matters to him? He doesn't care about you, not at all. He cares about the baby, and his own good name, for what it's still worth at least. No, you've been taken in by his lies, and now you're party to an even greater scandal, Connor snapped. He wanted to persuade Teresa to his cause even as she seemed pathetically loyal to Ralph and Miriam. Could she not see what they were doing? Teresa was a pitiful creature, and whilst Connor could not feel sorry for her, he was angry at her misguided sense of loyalty towards the Duke. But it's not like that. You don't understand, Teresa replied. Then tell me the truth. Or are you and Miriam in on this together? He asked, realizing there could be another explanation for Teresa's reluctance to help him. We're not in anything. Why do you have to be so cruel? Why can't you just leave us alone? Teresa exclaimed. Because I won't allow you to bring down the dukedom with your bastard child, Connor replied. Teresa folded her hands, glaring at Connor defiantly. There's nothing more to say. If you won't believe me, so be it. But I'm telling the truth. I know they'll help me, and not just for the sake of the child. I want you to go, and if you don't go I'll scream, she said. Connor waved his hand dismissively. She was a fool, and she could scream all she wanted. He had discovered what he was looking for. Briar Heights was a den of iniquity, one Connor would use to his own advantage. He could return to Burnley Abbey and expose that very day, but he preferred the thought of biding his time, and using his knowledge to an advantage. There were still things he was yet to discover, about all of them. But Connor was cunning, and his cunningness had served him well in the past. Scream all you like. 
I've got what I came here for. But be careful, Teresa. You might not find yourself so sure of things after you hold your baby in your arms, it might not be yours for much longer, he said, smirking at the maid, who still glared at him defiantly. I want you to leave. Get out. She exclaimed, and Connor laughed. You're very sure of yourself, Teresa, but without a reference, and with a reputation like yours, a reputation I'll be certain to promote, you'll find yourself destitute, as soon as the Duke decides he's had enough of you. Or should you be planning to use the child against the dukedom, along with Miriam, I'll make you pay, he said. At that moment, Teresa screamed. It was a high-pitched scream, which echoed in the silence of the lonely house, and brought with it the sound of footsteps hurrying from below. The door burst open, and Miriam and Ralph stood there, looking at astonishment at the scene before them. Teresa, are you all right? Miriam exclaimed, hurrying forward, as Teresa shrank back on the bed. Connor waved his hand dismissively. She's having hysterics, Connor said, stepping back, as Ralph looked at him angrily. You snuck up here, and for what? I thought you'd gone, the Duke said, with an angry look on his face. Connor knew better than to be openly rude to the Duke of Lancaster. He was his employer, and could dismiss him at a whim, even as Connor had implied his threat previously, though not in so many words Connor was cunning, and he was not about to allow his plan to unravel. This would be a waiting game, and the time to strike had not yet come. I wanted to check on Teresa, and make sure she was quite well. This whole episode has been a terrible strain on her, and with a baby coming. Connor said, as Miriam looked up at him angrily. The strain is of your doing, she replied, shaking her head, as she turned back to Teresa, who was breathing heavily. I think it's time you left Connor, the Duke said and Connor gave a curt nod. Certainly your grace. But I wonder, when can we expect your return to Burnley Abbey? He asked, knowing he was twisting the knife just a little further. When I decide to return, the Duke replied, stepping aside, as Connor left the room. On the landing, he turned, catching the Duke's eye, as Miriam fussed over Teresa. Don't forget the things I said your grace. Connor said, knowing he had the Duke in his power. I know very well what you said, Connor. And I won't forget it. Now. I suggest you leave. And if you intend to call on me at Briar Heights again, send a message beforehand, then I might be adequately prepared, the Duke said. Connor gave a further nod, and turning, he hurried down the stairs, smiling to himself at the thought of what he had done that day. He held the power of Tantalus over Ralph, the power to make or break him, and the time for that power to be exercised would be for him, and him alone, to decide. Think of the scandal, Connor thought to himself, as he made his way back along the moorland path, imagining what he could do with the knowledge of Ralph's illegitimate child. But Connor knew better than to reveal the matter immediately. It was knowledge to be savored, and savor it, he would. Chapter 17 What a horrible man! Who does he think he is? Miriam said, shaking her head, as she sat down next to Teresa's bedside. The land agent for the estate. His father was my own father's adviser, and now he does the same, my brother never liked him, and I'm beginning to understand why, Ralph said, standing in the doorway of Teresa's bedroom. The front door of the house had just banged shut and through the window, Miriam could see the retreating figure of the land agent crossing garden and hurrying out onto the moorland. Teresa was terribly upset, and Miriam feared the shock of her encounter with Connor could be enough to bring on her labor. Well, I'm glad he's gone. Why did he come here? Miriam asked, for Ralph was looking perturbed, and Teresa's expression was one of fear. He said such horrible things. He knew I was with child. It was him and Mrs. Mason, the housekeeper, who dismissed me from Burnley Abbey. But now, oh, it doesn't matter what he said, but I wish it was all over, Teresa exclaimed. It will be soon. Don't worry, Teresa. 
He's gone now, and I'm sure he won't come back, Miriam said, even as she was unconvinced of her own words. I don't think he'll forget what he said, Teresa replied. Miriam glanced at Ralph, who appeared sullen and lost in thought. What did he say to you? She asked, fearing the possibility of their secret having somehow been discovered. He, well, he knows about the marriage, but, it's hardly a secret. But as for the baby, well, he thinks it's mine, Ralph said, and Miriam laughed. Well then, that hardly matters, does it? He doesn't know everything. He doesn't know what he thinks he knows, Miriam said, with a feeling of relief, though still alarmed as to the possibility of Connor's threat. But there could still be a scandal, Miriam. I, well, it doesn't matter, does it? What a tangled web we weave, Ralph replied. But how did he find out? Isn't he just guessing at all of this? He can't have any proof as to the child's lineage. He's got it wrong, anyway. Don't you think he might just be pretending to know the things he claims? Miriam said. She did not know Connor Edge, though she had seen enough of him in just a few brief moments to get the measure of him. But it seemed he had come to Briar Heights with only the barest of facts at his disposal and had been intent on causing trouble. Miriam was not worried, rumor was one thing, but if they kept to their story, no one could claim otherwise than the fact of their having married and been blessed with a child nine months later. I don't know, but, I'd better go now, Ralph said, and before Miriam could reply, he had left the room and clattered down the stairs, leaving Miriam and Teresa alone. Oh dear, Miriam said, fearing there was more to Connor's visit than the Duke was letting on. She looked down at Teresa, who had closed her eyes, exhausted, it seemed, by her encounter with Connor. He says we're both trying to take advantage of the Duke, Teresa whispered, her eyes still closed. Oh nonsense, Miriam replied, shaking her head. She rose to her feet, drawing the curtains across the window so Teresa could sleep. And that his grace won't want anything to do with me when the baby's born, Teresa continued. She opened her eyes now, looking fearfully up at Miriam, who sighed. And who do you believe, Teresa? The wicked man who sent you away with nothing, or the good and honest man who took you in and keeps you safe from harm? Miriam replied. Teresa did not answer, and Miriam told her to rest, before stepping out of the room and closing the door quietly behind her. On the landing, she breathed a deep sigh, shaking her head, as she thought over Teresa's words. He's not like that and we're not like that either, she told herself, for Miriam knew her motives to be pure, whatever Connor Edge might say. Trout in a butter sauce, Miriam said, placing the platter on the table. Ralph looked down at it without enthusiasm, even as Miriam had spent the rest of the morning preparing it. Thank you, he said, without making any attempt to serve himself. Old Jackson brought it for me there's a chalk stream a mile or so from here. He went fishing early this morning, apparently. If you like it, I'm sure he can catch more, Miriam continued. She served the fillets, placing the plate in front of Ralph, who took up his knife and fork mechanically, and without interest. She had made a salad of bitter leaves from the garden, and slices of bread and butter completed the meal. Is there anything to drink? Ralph asked, and Miriam nodded. Some cider perhaps? She asked, and the Duke nodded. They ate and drank in silence, the only sound being that of the birds in the trees outside, whose song drifted through the open window of the dining room, and the scraping of the cutlery against the plates. Something was wrong, and when she had finished eating, Miriam sat back, looking at Ralph expectedly. What's wrong? He asked, looking up at her. I might ask you the same question. You seem perturbed by something. What did Connor say? You've not been the same since he left, Miriam said. The Duke sighed and set down his knife and fork. I'm not certain we've thought it through, that's all. Everyone knows about the marriage, and as for the baby, well, 
If Connor can guess as to a scandal, won't the rest of the ton do so too? He asked. Miriam shook her head. Connor had not guessed as to the scandal. He had got it wrong, and Ralph could truthfully deny it if the worst came to the worst, and he was accused of fathering a child with Teresa. But he got it wrong. No one knows about Max, and no one can deny it's my child. How would they know? I'll be the Duchess of Lancaster. They won't dare question me, whatever they might think to themselves, Miriam replied. She was convinced the matter would resolve itself, given time. The important thing was the baby, and whilst Connor might have his suspicions, those suspicions would come to nothing once they returned to Burnley Abbey as husband and wife, with their newborn accompanying them. I suppose so. But I don't trust Connor. He's the sort of man who looks for his own advantage, and I dread to think what he might do with that advantage. There's my mother too. He has her ear, just like his father before him. She thinks he's entirely trustworthy, and if I tried to get rid of him, she'd object. But I can't get rid of him now, can I? I'm stuck with him, he'd only reveal what he believed the scandal to be, Ralph said, pushing his plate aside with a sigh. It'll be all right. I know it will, Miriam replied, even as she did not know it would be all right, not at all. She cleared the plates, pondering the matter to herself as she washed them in the kitchen, the air filled with soap suds, her arms elbowed deep in the greasy water. This was not the life she had ever envisaged for herself, and she knew the coming months would not be easy. As she finished the washing up, she turned to find Ralph standing in the kitchen door. Miriam did not know how long he had been standing there, but he had an apologetic look on his face, and she smiled at him as he stepped forward. I'm sorry about all this. It wasn't ever supposed to be your problem, was it? This was my mess, and I should have dealt with it properly, Ralph said, shaking his head. Miriam dried her hands and crossed the kitchen, taking his hand in hers and smiling. But I think it was, fate brought mine and Teresa's paths to cross, and fate brought me to Briar Heights, too. I know it's going to be difficult. But we can't let the likes of Connor dissuade us from what's right. We're protecting your brother's legacy. Connor knows nothing about Max's involvement, and all this nonsense of our betraying one another or blackmailing one another, he's only saying that to drive a wedge between us, Miriam said, for she felt certain Connor was only interested in his own gain, and not, as he claimed, in safeguarding the fortunes of the dukedom. I'm sure you're right. But it still unsettled me, Ralph admitted, and Miriam squeezed his hand. Come now, let's walk out across the moor. Problems don't seem quite as overbearing outside, or so I always think, she said, pulling him by the hand. He smiled at her, shaking his head, and laughing. I can't imagine doing this without you, he said. Miriam blushed. She did not know quite what to say. Well, I, I've not done anything, not really. But I want to help you, to help Teresa, and to help my family too, she said. Those were her motives. She was selfless in that and wanted to do her best for those around her. How easy it would have been for Miriam to settle for a simpler life. There had been offers in the past, the possibility of a betrothal, even but Miriam had rejected those offers, knowing she could not settle for a life like those of so many of her contemporaries, foolish women who thought only of balls and soirees, pretty dresses, and scandals. You're ever so kind Miriam, Ralph said, and Miriam blushed an even deeper shade of red. Let's walk across the moor. I can't bear to stay inside, not with the sunshine pouring through the windows, she said and she led him out of the kitchen door into the yard. The sun was warm on her face, and a gentle breeze brought with it the scent of the garden and the heathers, where bees buzzed amongst the flowers, and swallows flitted overhead. It was another beautiful day, and even the sour taste of Connor's visit could not dampen Miriam's spirits. They had their troubles, 
but what couple did not? I just fear for the future, and for the child. It's going to grow up thinking something different to the truth. Will we ever tell that truth? Ralph asked, as they walked together along the moorland path. In the end, perhaps, but there's no need to do so immediately. Teresa won't say anything, and why create difficulties for the child? When the time comes, we'll find the words, but at first, well, it wouldn't understand, would it? Miriam said. Ralph shook his head. Despite his previous apology, Miriam could tell he was conflicted, was he having second thoughts? Were doubts clouding his judgment? No, but, are we doing the right thing by Teresa? Is she happy? Ralph asked. Only Teresa could answer that question. But whilst it was clear Connor's visit had unsettled her, too, Miriam had no doubt they were doing the right thing in helping her. Without Ralph, Teresa would be alone and destitute. The world was not a kind place to a woman with a child born out of wedlock. She would not find a position in any household, nor would she be welcome anywhere she went. This was her best chance of future happiness, and Miriam knew it was the responsibility of her and Ralph to take care of the mother of Max's child. I don't know if she's happy, I'm sure she misses Max as much as you do. It must be terribly difficult for her, alone and without anyone else to share her grief with. No one knew she was in love with your brother, and he, with her. She grieves as the widow she never was. That can't be easy. But is she doing the right thing? Yes, I believe she is. And so are we, Miriam said, determined to see the matter through, so that all three of them, and the child, might benefit. You're right. I dwell too much on the consequences. I'm sorry, he said, but Miriam shook her head. It's a momentous decision. You're bound to have second thoughts, she said. He turned to her, and she smiled at him. They had almost reached the top of the hill, where a strong breeze was blowing across the heather, and now they paused, gazing out across the moorland, on that now familiar walk. You're right, problems don't seem quite as big outside, do they? The vastness of the sky, the endless vista of the horizon. It makes everything seem smaller, somehow, Ralph said, and Miriam was surprised as he slipped his hand into hers. His gesture was unexpected, but not unwelcome, and for a moment, they stood hand in hand on the hillside, gazing out across the heather. But do you believe it's a problem we can solve? Can't we solve it together? Miriam ventured, for it still seemed Ralph was conflicted between his heart and his head, between duty and an easy life. It remains to be seen, he replied, loosening his hand, and stepping back. A sudden change seemed to come over him, and a ponderous look spread over his face. What's wrong? Miriam asked, fearful of another change of heart. It doesn't matter. It's something Connor said. I'm sure it's nothing, he said, and he strode on along the path, as Miriam hurried behind him. She knew he was conflicted, but could think of nothing to say to solve the conflict, or make him realize the folly of the thoughts Connor had planted in his mind. What a devious man Connor is, Miriam thought to herself, and she wished she had done more to put her case to the land agent. She wondered what Connor thought of her and what he assumed to be the facts. They walked on in silence now, pausing only briefly at the summit before returning to Briar Heights. Ralph was lost in thought, and it seemed a thought or realization had disturbed him. As they entered the hallway, Miriam caught his arm. Are you all right? Have I done something to offend you? She asked, but he shook his head. I need time to think Miriam. I'm sorry, but, I need time to think, he replied, and before she could respond, the duke had hurried into his study and closed the door behind him. Miriam sighed, taking off her bonnet and making her way into the kitchen. She had dinner to prepare, and took a bowl of soup up to Teresa, who had been sleeping for much of the afternoon. Is Ralph all right? Teresa asked, 
as Miriam placed the tray on her lap. I don't know. I think, he's conflicted, Miriam replied, for she could think of no other way to describe it. Chapter 18 Connor's visit had unsettled Teresa. He had threatened her, both with his own actions, and those of Ralph and Miriam. But would the Duke really abandon her after she had given birth to his brother's child? Teresa had agreed to the plan, but the more she thought about it, the more she wondered if she was doing the right thing. Connor's words had brought with them consternation, and despite telling herself the opposite, Teresa could not help but wonder if they were true. How are you feeling, Teresa? Miriam asked, as she set down a tray with a steaming bowl of soup and slices of bread and butter on a plate. Teresa sat up and yawned. Her whole body ached, and all she wanted was for the baby to be born. She was struggling to move, struggling to do anything without help. Her ankles were swollen, and her head ached terribly. Tired, and, well, Connor's visit unsettled me, Teresa admitted. Miriam nodded. I think it unsettled us all. I've just been for a walk with Ralph Ann. Well, he seems torn. I don't quite understand it, Miriam replied. Poor Ralph, he misses his brother terribly. None of this was supposed to be his responsibility, Teresa said, running her hand over her stomach. Would he really have married you? Max, I mean? Miriam asked. Teresa smiled. Of that question, she had no doubt. Max had told her he loved her, just before he left for Corsica. There isn't another woman in all the world who could steal my heart as you've done dearest Teresa, he had told her, and Teresa could picture his handsome face, his boyish smile, the parting of his hair, she saw him as a portrait, forever preserved in her memories, and still she loved him with all her heart. I know he would have done. He proposed to me. It was in a letter, written just days before he was killed. He wrote to me every day. I had to receive the letters in secret, Mrs. Mason would have realized otherwise. In every single one, he told me he loved me, and I replied in just the same way. When he learned about the baby, he was overjoyed. I'd been so fearful of what he'd say, but he loved me all the more for it, and I loved him too, Teresa replied. Tears welled up in her eyes. She missed him dreadfully, and she wanted only to honor his memory and do the right thing by his child. It was for that reason she had agreed to Ralph's plan, and despite Connor's words, she refused to believe the Duke would abandon her after the birth. How wonderful that sounds, Miriam said, smiling at Teresa, who nodded. It can be the same for you, can't it? You and the Duke, I mean. In time, won't you love him? Teresa asked. She knew how strange their situation was, all of them, but she wondered as to the feelings between Ralph and Miriam. She had seen them together, and she felt certain there was a growing sense of attraction between them. Well, I don't know. It's harder to answer. I hope so, Miriam said, smoothing down Teresa's bedsheets as she spoke. She certainly felt something for the Duke, more than friendship, a deeper feeling, heightened when she was in his company. It was a feeling growing stronger by the moment, one she was only pleased to entertain. I hope you do. There's nothing more wonderful than being in love. I know I've lost him, but I know I loved him, too, and isn't that what matters? Teresa said. Miriam smiled and nodded. That's all that matters, Teresa, she replied, and nodding to her, she left the room. Teresa hoped she had not offended Miriam or spoken out of turn. She hoped Miriam and Ralph would fall in love. It would take time, of course, but the possibility was there, just as it had been for Teresa and Max in the first fledgling days of their relationship. Oh, forgive me, Your Grace. I didn't realize anyone was in there. Mrs. Mason told me to come and lay the fire, Teresa said, 
as she entered the drawing room at Burnley Abbey to find Max, the Duke of Lancaster reading in a chair by the window. He looked up at her and smiled, closing his book and rising to his feet. No, please, forgive me. It's my fault. I shouldn't be in here at this time. Mrs. Mason was right to tell you to come. I usually read in the library, but at this time of year there's more sunlight in here in the early morning. Please continue, he said, still smiling at her. Teresa felt nervous. She had only been in the Duke's employment for a few weeks, and she knew she would be scolded if Mrs. Mason knew she had spoken to him, even by accident. I, yes, your grace, Teresa said, bobbing into a low curtsy. But as she did so, she dropped the coal scuttle, sending the coals across the rug, and causing a cloud of soot to rise. Here, let me help you, the Duke said, rushing to her side. Teresa was flustered, she was certain to be scolded for this, and now the Duke was covered in soot, as was she. Oh dear, I'm afraid I'm not doing very well your grace. I wasn't meant to be a maid, I don't think, Teresa said, shaking her head sadly. The Duke laughed. It's Teresa, isn't it? He asked. Teresa was surprised. She did not think the Duke had ever noticed her, let alone knowing her name. Her eyes grew wide, and she nodded, fearful of his telling Mrs. Mason what she had done. That's right, your grace. But I promise this won't happen again. I shouldn't be here, not with you here. Please don't tell Mrs. Mason. I'll sweep up this soot, then I'll lay the fire, Anne. She began, but the Duke raised his hand. I'm not going to say anything, Teresa. I know just what Mrs. Mason can be like. I noticed you when you first arrived. You've come from the workhouse, haven't you? He asked, and Teresa nodded. Her life had been a tragedy, orphaned at an early age, she had entered the poorhouse with her sister, who had later died of cholera. Life in the workhouse had been hard and unforgiving, but an opening for a maid had arisen at Burnley Abbey, and a kindly clergyman a governor of the poorhouse, had recommended Teresa for the position. She had come to Burnley Abbey determined to prove her worth, and now she was anxious not to provoke the wrath of the housekeeper, who had already scolded her on several occasions. I have your grace, and I'm very grateful for what you've done for me, giving me a job and a place to live, Teresa said, holding her hands in front of her and looking down at her feet. It's all right. You don't need to be scared of me, Teresa. I'm finding my feet, too. It's only a year since my father passed away, and I wasn't expecting to inherit this title for many years to come. Whatever our position in life, we have to learn it, don't we? The Duke said, and Teresa looked up at him and nodded. We do, your grace, and I hope I prove myself worthy of you, she replied. That was how it had begun and as the coming days and weeks went by, Teresa and the Duke grew closer. He would seek her out, and she would allow herself to be sought, finding excuses to sweep the hearth in his study, or dust the books in the library at a time she might find him there. Little by little, their friendship grew, until the day they shared their first kiss. You got away from her then? Max said, as Teresa closed the study door behind her with a smile on her face. She told me to make up the beds, yours first. But if you make it yourself, she'll not know the difference, Teresa replied. She felt no fear in his presence now, and spoke to him as an equal, even as she knew the great gulf existing between them. In turn, he treated her as a friend, and more than a friend, or so it seemed. He would gift her little tokens of his esteem, flowers from the garden, or a piece of lace or a handkerchief, and with each gift, they became closer, intimates far beyond anything Teresa could ever have imagined. I already made it. I suspected she would. Isn't it marvelous, getting away with meeting right under her nose, the Duke replied. Teresa knew Mrs. Mason's wrath would be reserved for her, and her alone if these secret liaisons were discovered, 
but she was enjoying them too much to consider the risk. Rather, she delighted in her friendship with the Duke, and now he hurried over to her, turning the key in the lock, and beckoning her to an open volume on the desk. What's this? She asked, for Teresa had never been taught to read. It's a volume of poetry. I want to read a poem to you, by William Blake, he said, picking up the volume and clearing his throat. Teresa smiled. She had fallen in love with him, completely and utterly. He was everything she had ever desired, a friend amidst the wilderness, and a kindred spirit, despite the vast abyss separating them. You chose it for me? She asked, and he nodded as he began to read. Love seeketh not itself to please, nor for itself hath any care, but for another gives its ease, and builds a heaven in hell's despair. So sung a little clod of clay trodden with the cattle's feet, but a pebble of the brook warbled out these meters meet, love seeketh only self to please, to bind another to its delight, joys in another's loss of ease, and builds a hell in heaven's despite. As he finished, he smiled at her as he placed the book back on the desk, even as his face became mournful. She looked at him in surprise. But what's wrong? Do you read the poem because you wish only to please me? She asked, a shiver of delight and expectation running through her. He shook his head. I do, but, I fear I won't please you with what I have to say, he replied. She had feared this moment was coming. He would tell her there could be no future in what they shared, that it was an impossibility, a fantasy, albeit pleasurable. A duke and a maid could never fall in love, and if they did, it would prove the hardest of tasks to be together. Tears welled up in Teresa's eyes, and she shook her head. Please, I don't know what I'd do without you. If there's another. She began, but he seized her hand, gazing at her imploringly as he shook his head. No, forgive me, it isn't that. I couldn't live without you either, and I never want to. I love you Teresa, but, I have to go away. To fight in Corsica. I'll be away for six months, and how unbearable I'll find those months without you, he said, seizing her hands and raising them to his lips. Teresa was both overjoyed at his words and brought to the depths of sorrow in the face of what they were to endure apart. He had told her he loved her, the only words she needed to hear, and yet that love would now be separated, if only for a time. But you'll return. Promise me you'll return, she said, and he nodded. For you, and you alone, he replied, bringing his lips to hers, and holding her in his embrace. Now, all she had left were his letters, and the diary Ralph had slipped into her hand on the day she had been forced to leave Burnley Abbey forever. Here, take it. He'd have wanted you to have it, Ralph had said, and the words it contained had been like precious jewels, kept close to her heart ever since. Teresa mourned Max every single day. Her love for him would never diminish, and she had vowed to remain true to him her whole life long. The baby was his memory, and she would treasure that memory forever. With a sigh, she pulled back the blankets and got out of bed, intending to read through Max's letters, desiring to feel close to him. They were stored in a box in the next-door room, the only thing she had brought with her from Burnley Abbey, hidden in saddlebag. How I miss him, she thought to herself, as she walked slowly and heavily across the floorboards and out onto the landing. The house was quiet, and she wondered if Miriam and the Duke would be able to reconcile their fears over Connor. They were fears Teresa shared, too, even as she knew they were unfounded. Max had loved her unconditionally, and his brother had vowed to do all he could to protect her and the baby. I know he will, she told herself, as she opened the box containing the letters. But the letters were gone. And so was the diary. The box was empty, and Teresa's eyes grew wide with horror. She let out an anguished cry as tears welled up in her eyes. Teresa? Miriam called out, and her footsteps sounded on the stairs. Teresa sank to her knees, 
staring into the empty box, as though her whole world had been snatched from her. Her memories were gone, the last threads of Max's touch, taken. As Miriam entered the room, Teresa turned to her, dumbstruck, sobbing, as Miriam stared at her in astonishment. They're gone. They're all gone. The letters. The diary, she exclaimed. Miriam stared at the empty box, her face now turning pale. And I think I know who has them. She exclaimed, as a horrible realization now came over Teresa. Connor? She replied, and Miriam nodded. And that means, he knows everything, she said, sinking down to the floor, as Teresa collapsed into anguished sobs. Max had been cruelly taken from her, and now all she had left of him was gone, too. She had loved him, and he had loved her, a love enduring after death, a love Teresa carried in the unborn child. But the theft of the letters and the diary was a violation, one Teresa would never forgive. Connor had taken what was most precious to her, and now he would know the truth about the baby, and the marriage between Miriam and Ralph. What will we tell his grace? Teresa asked, looking up at Miriam fearfully, her eyes filled with tears. I, I don't know, Miriam replied, and in that moment, it seemed all hope was lost. Chapter 19 Ralph was angry, with himself, with Connor, even with Max. The land agent's visit, his so-called advisor, had left a bitter taste in his mouth, and his words concerning Miriam had planted the seed of doubt. Ralph trusted her, and yet he could not entirely bring himself to accept the selflessness of her actions. Did Miriam really want this? Did she really want him? The possibility of scandal was growing ever stronger, and Ralph now knew the power the land agent held over him. But what's he going to do with it? He's always been loyal, though, well, Max didn't trust him, and I don't either, Ralph thought to himself. He was lying on his bed, listening to the sound of the cuckoo in the trees outside his window. Connor was the cuckoo in the nest, and there was little Ralph could do, or think to do, to prevent him from exercising the power he now held. But the storm was one Ralph could weather, if only he felt certain of Miriam's motives. He had grown fond of her, despite himself, and the more time they spent together, the more his feelings for her were growing. But marriage was a finality, and to enter into it was a life-changing decision, one he could not take lightly. With a sigh, he got up, slamming the window shut, and causing the cuckoo to take flight. That's one way to get rid of it, he thought to himself. He could hear voices on the landing, Miriam and Teresa. They sounded anxious about something, though Ralph was in no mood to find out what. There were times he preferred his own company. It had been the same on Corsica, when he had often retreated to his tent for solace, despite the necessity of responsibility all around him. Perhaps that's my problem. I always retreat. Max wouldn't have done this. He'd have sent Connor away, scandal or no scandal. But what am I to do? He asked himself, and still, no answer was forthcoming. The truth was, Ralph was conflicted, torn between duty and heart, suspicion and hope. He wanted to believe Miriam was sincere, he wanted to believe she felt something like he did, he wanted to trust her. And yet that small suggestion of doubt remained, even as Ralph could not bring himself to believe Connor had his best interests at heart. He sighed, pacing up and down the room, just as the voices of Miriam and Teresa became louder. I'll look again, but… It had to be here. I can't imagine what's happened to it. He must have taken it, Teresa was saying. Ralph listened, wondering to what and to whom they were referring. Look again. And what about the letters? Are they gone too? Miriam replied. Everything's gone. It's all I had left. I can't. It's too much Miriam, Teresa said. Ralph stood at his bedroom door, listening to the commotion. Teresa was upset about something, but he was not about to interfere. 
He wanted only to retreat, to close in on himself, to forget this whole sorry business was happening. None of this was meant for me, he told himself, angry with his brother for dying on the battlefield and leaving him to pick up the pieces. Now, he lay back down on the bed, turning on his side, and closing his eyes. He had fled to Briar Heights, hoping it could be a place of refuge, and whilst his conscience had not allowed him to send Teresa away, he was beginning to regret ever agreeing to Miriam's plan for marriage. The future stretched bleakly ahead, even as Ralph could not help the growing feelings he had for Miriam, and the thought of how easy it might have been to fall in love with her, if circumstances were different. But they're not different are they, it was never going to be simple, he thought to himself, sighing, as the commotion continued outside. Miriam and Teresa had looked everywhere, but there was no sign of the diary or the letters. They were gone, and there was only one suspect as to the culprit. He's taken everything. Everything I had of him. It's nothing but a wicked violation, Teresa exclaimed, as Miriam led her back to bed. You mustn't upset yourself, Teresa. Think of the baby, Miriam said, anxious the maid should not induce an early labor through her upset, even as she wondered whether that might have been part of Connor's plan. She was disgusted by Connor's actions, but also confused by Ralph's. After their return from the Moorland walk, he had retreated to his bedroom, and had not even emerged when Miriam and Teresa were hunting frantically for the lost diary and letters. Something had changed, a seed of doubt planted. What had Connor said to him? Miriam feared the Duke now believed she only wanted to marry him for her own advantage, and if that was the case, there could be no marriage at all. But I am upset, Miriam. I want him back, I want Max here with me. He's the baby's father, what cruel fate takes a man at the moment of such happiness? We were supposed to be so happy, Teresa exclaimed, and she began to sob, her shoulders heaving as Miriam put her arm around her. There there, you have your memories of him. A few letters in a diary might seem important, but it's what you remember that counts. The way he made you feel, the tenderness of his touch, the words he spoke to you. Those memories are all in your heart Teresa, Miriam said, as she comforted Teresa in her sorrow. Teresa nodded, shaking her head, and sniffing. I. I just miss him so much. And Connor's words, they were so cruel. I know Ralph, the Duke, wouldn't send me away. I know you wouldn't let him. But you can't possibly marry him now, can you? Not with Connor threatening you like this, Teresa said. It was a question Miriam had tried hard not to think about, even as she knew she now had to. The proposal had been made on a whim, well meant but without either of them fully imagining its consequences. Miriam had been caught up in a desire to do what she could to help both the Duke and Teresa. But now, with Connor's threat hanging over them, she wondered if she had not made a rash and foolish decision, did Ralph even want to marry her still? I. But I've got to. We've got to, for the sake of the baby, Miriam stammered. But it doesn't matter now, does it? If Connor reveals the truth, and he'll know it from the diary in the letters, none of it matters. You can't marry the Duke with such a threat hanging over you. Even if he doesn't reveal it now, he could do so at any moment, couldn't he? Teresa said. Miriam sighed and shook her head. Teresa was right. Connor would know the truth as soon as he read the diary and the letters. He would know he was wrong in accusing Ralph of being the baby's father, but he would hold in his power an even greater secret. That the Duke of Lancaster himself had fathered a child with a maid was a far greater scandal than the second son having done so. Max's reputation would be destroyed, and the child would be an outcast, an heir without respect or adulation. Ralph, too, would be a laughingstock, and marrying him would make no difference, even if Miriam still desperately wanted to help her family. Which means I'm only doing it for myself, she thought to herself, wondering if she now only remained through selfishness. He could, but... I don't see what he'd gain from it. 
He could blackmail the Duke I suppose, but what more could there be for him in revealing the secret? She asked, confused as to Connor's motives. But whatever the land agent intended to do, one thing was clear, he held power over them, and that power had disrupted their plans. There was no point in Miriam and Ralph marrying for the sake of the baby if Connor possessed evidence to the very contrary of their plan. You don't have to do this Miriam. It was never your problem to solve. I know you wanted to help me, and I'm grateful to you. But I think we're beyond that now, don't you? Teresa asked. Miriam sighed. She still wanted to help Teresa, and her family too. They had grown close, but there was another reason why she now felt torn between heart and head, she had fallen in love with Ralph. The feeling was unexpected, though perhaps not unsurprising. In another place, at another time, they might easily have been a courting couple, carefree and with all the hopes and dreams of a happy couple lying ahead of them. But strange circumstances had brought them together, and Miriam could not deny her feelings, even as she felt certain Ralph had his doubts. I promise to help you Teresa, Miriam replied, rising from the bed, even as tears welled up in her eyes. But I don't know if you can Miriam, Teresa replied. Miriam left Teresa's bedroom, urging her to get some rest, and as she closed the door behind her, she breathed a deep sigh, glancing across the landing to the Duke's bedroom door, which was also closed. She knew they had to talk, and now she knocked gently, and called out to him. Your Grace? She said, listening for any sound of life from inside the room. But there was no answer, and with another sigh, Miriam made her way downstairs to the kitchen. She had dinner to prepare, and now she set about lighting the fire in the hearth and bringing in water from the pump in the yard. The remnants of the roasted game birds were in the larder, and Miriam set about stripping the meat from the carcasses, intending to make a pie with the leftovers. I can't see any way out of it, she told herself. Was it any wonder the Duke had distanced himself from her? To marry one another would mean nothing. It would achieve nothing. To return in nine months with the baby would only result in Connor revealing the truth, or threatening to. There could be no advantage in a marriage of pretense, if that pretense was revealed as nothing but a sham. But despite all this, Miriam remained reluctant to give up on the possibility. Her family was counting on her, and if she did not marry Ralph, they would be forced to give up Podmore Grange and descend ever further into poverty. But does he want to marry me? She asked herself. Perhaps Ralph, too, had realized the folly of their situation. He would try to protect her. The scandal was nothing to do with her and if the betrothal was called off, there would be no question of her having been caught up in the birth of the fatherless child. Miriam could walk away, even as she wanted desperately to be of help to her family, to Teresa, and to Ralph. But the question of love remained. She loved him, even as it seemed he did not love her, and it was that love which kept her clinging to the hope she still harbored, the hope of the Duke feeling the same for her as she felt for him. We can weather the storm. Besides, does it really matter if the Tun know the truth? We'd love the baby, and Teresa could be its mother. Let them think what they like, she told herself, with a defiant air. But it did matter if the truth was known. It was the difference between the child being accepted or rejected. Teresa's baby had done nothing wrong. It was the innocent party, and yet the decision they now made would have lifelong bearings on them all. If only matters could be simple, Miriam thought to herself, as she went to the pantry to find flour to make the pastry for the pie. The pantry was at the back of the kitchen. It had only a small, barred window, overgrown by ivy, and despite the early hour, Miriam was forced to light a candle before going in search of the flour. But as she opened the pantry door, she was startled by a sudden movement, and she let out a cry, dropping the candle as a figure pounced on her. Let me go, she cried, imagining it to be a robber, even as a familiar voice now snarled at her. I only want to talk to you Miriam, Connor said, pushing her roughly back out into the kitchen, 
where the afternoon sunlight coming through the window illuminated his face. Chapter 20 Miriam was trembling with fear. She wanted to scream, but Connor now threatened her if she did so. I know everything, Miriam, and I'll tell your parents your sordid little secret if you don't listen to what I've got to say, he hissed. Miriam nodded, backing away from him, as he pointed to a chair by the hearth. How, how long have you been here? She asked, terrified at the thought of him having watched her for so long. I slipped back this morning. I wanted to talk to you, but I knew the Duke wouldn't permit me to enter. It was easy enough to break in and hide. Now sit down, he snarled. Miriam sat, looking up at him fearfully, as he stood over her. You stole the diary, didn't you? And the letters, s he said, feeling nothing but contempt for the land agent, who now smirked at her. I took back property belonging to the estate. Teresa had no right to the Duke's private diary, and as for his correspondence, she should have burned them, lest they fall into the wrong hands, he replied. Miriam could not help but laugh. And you don't think your hands were the wrong hands for them to fall into? She replied, feeling suddenly defiant. His eyes narrowed, and an unpleasant smile came over his face. I suppose it depends on your perspective, Miriam. But I think you realize that already. I know why you're here. I know why you're pretending to care. It's all for your own advantage, isn't it? Your parents and your sister live in destitution at Podmore Grange. I've seen their sorry state of affairs for myself. I understand that's not how you want it to be. What daughter would want to see her parents suffer in that way? He asked. Miriam nodded. That much was true, at least, but if he thought she wanted only her own advantage, he was mistaken. I want to help Teresa, I. She began, but he interrupted her, waving his hand dismissively. Oh nonsense Miriam. You only want to help yourself. And you still can, by not marrying the Duke of Lancaster, he said, fixing her now with a stern expression. Miriam was taken aback. It was her choice who she married, and nothing to do with Connor. And what does it matter to you? You still hold the strings. You've read the diaries, you know the truth about the Duke's brother. Why does it matter anymore? If we marry, you can still expose the truth, and if we don't you can expose it anyway. You hold the winning hand, I admit it, Miriam replied, but the land agent shook his head. I'm still trying to decide how best to use the matter to my advantage. But I don't want you to marry the Duke, and I'm willing to offer you a substantial amount of money not to do so, enough to help your family and yourself. Think about it Miriam, imagine the scandal I could bring on you. But with this arrangement, you can simply disappear, and we need never speak of the matter again. A broken betrothal means nothing but to find oneself in a marriage where a scandal erupts, that's something else indeed, he replied. Miriam knew why he was saying this. He thought she cared only about the money and would herself seek to blackmail the duke without a payoff. He had not counted on her feelings, and now she shook her head, not willing to give up on the matter so easily, and not wishing to see either Ralph or Teresa suffer at the hands of Connor. You think I'm only doing this for the money? don't you? She said, and he laughed. I know you're only doing it for the money Miriam. Why else would you be doing it? Out of the goodness of your heart? But it seems rather a strange coincidence, doesn't it? Your family destitute, and here you are, offering to make everything better for the Duke, for a price of course, he said, fixing her with a sardonic gaze. Miriam knew what it looked like, and certainly the circumstances were to her advantage, but her feelings for Ralph were certain, and this was far more than a mere financial transaction. Miriam was in love with the Duke, and she would marry him, scandal or no scandal. You've got it wrong. I love him, she said, but Connor only laughed. Love? You don't know the first thing about love. You don't love him. Not at all. But very well, 
let me put the matter to you a different way. You can leave with the money I offer you, or I'll ruin the both of you. If you marry him, I'll make good on my threat to reveal the truth. Do you understand? I know it all, and you're right, I hold the strings in this. He doesn't love you, and if you don't leave, I'll reveal his secret, or force him to pay me handsomely not to, he snarled. Miriam's eyes grew wide. What choice did she have? She shook her head, astonished at his vindictiveness. Why did he hate Ralph so much? You'd blackmail him? And send me away, she stammered. I'm protecting him from you. I don't trust you Miriam. You make yourself out to be so sanctimonious, the sacrificial lamb, willing to offer herself up for marriage to save the poor maid and the scandal-ridden duke. But it's all nonsense, isn't it? You just want it all for yourself. You'd do just the same as me. I know you would, he said, shaking his head. I'm nothing like you, Miriam replied, even as she knew she had no choice but to do as he told her. Despite her sincere desire to help Teresa and the Duke, her first loyalty was to her family. Without the marriage, or Connor's payment, her parents and sister would be destitute. But if she did not leave, then Connor would destroy the Duke by spreading the scandal, and Miriam loved him enough to break her own heart if it meant saving him. Besides, there was no certainty Ralph would want to marry her, and if she refused Connor's offer, Miriam felt certain the land agent would carry out his threat. He would ruin them both, whether they married or not. Tears welled up in her eyes at the impossibility of the situation. Connor was wicked, but he held all the cards, and would surely use them to his advantage. Perhaps, or you could use it to your advantage. I'm willing to make you an offer, Miriam, one to save your family, and yourself but I suppose it depends on just how far you're willing to go. I could offer you a substantial payment, or together, we could force the Duke into a far greater one, the land agent said, raising his eyebrows, even as Miriam gasped in horror. No, I won't do it. I won't hear of it, she exclaimed, rising to her feet. She would never sink so low as to blackmail Ralph herself. She knew what Connor thought of her, that she had made the proposal for her own advantage, but it was not true, and as for wishing to blackmail Ralph, the suggestion was wicked. I'll go. But if I do, I want you to promise me that you will destroy the diaries and the letter. To keep the secret. Whatever you might think, I'm not doing this for my own advantage, though I admit I want to help my family. Wouldn't you do the same in my position? She asked. Connor shrugged. I don't know. But I know I don't trust you. I think we're the same Miriam. Each seeking our own advantage. As for destroying the diary and the letters, I won't promise it. Wouldn't I be a fool to do so? He asked. Miriam had to admit it would be foolish to do so, even as she hoped Connor would agree. Then don't punish Teresa. She fell in love that's all. Are you so bitter you'd deny that possibility? But you don't understand, I've fallen in love with Ralph too, and I only wanted to help him in his troubles, Miriam said. It seemed clear Connor did not understand what it meant to be in love. His heart was hardened. He was a cruel and ruthless man, masquerading behind an apparent desire to protect Ralph and his interests. He had manipulated the Duke, and Miriam knew he would only go on doing so as long as she remained at Ralph's side. I admit I got it wrong. I thought the baby was Ralph's, not Max's. But it doesn't surprise me to discover it, nor does it matter either. A duke fathered a child with a maid, and now another duke attempts to cover up the scandal by marrying a woman who would then hold power over him. I won't allow it, Connor said, folding his arms. Miriam knew she was beaten and had no choice but to accept Connor's offer. To refuse it would be to bring scandal on herself, and for no other reason than a love she no longer felt was reciprocated. She had been a fool to think Ralph was falling in love with her, 
even as she thought back to those pleasant moments they had shared together over dinners and walks across the moorland. In the Duke's eyes, this had been nothing but a practical arrangement, one now destined to come to an end. And if I leave, do you promise to take care of the baby, to safeguard Teresa's reputation? Miriam asked, for she owed the maid that, at least. Connor smiled. I don't promise anything, Miriam. But you'll find me far more agreeable if you agree to leave, and leave at once, he said, gesturing towards the door. Miriam felt torn. She could not simply abandon Teresa without telling her the truth. And then there was the Duke himself, how could she explain the matter to him? She could not tell him of Connor's intentions, nor of his offer to pay her off, and now she thought back to the silence of earlier, when he had not answered her knock at his bedroom door. I need to tell Teresa I'm leaving, she said, but Connor caught her by the arm. Don't tell her everything. Tell her you've had a change of heart, that you don't need to marry the Duke, that you're going home to think things over. And if you leave, I might even consider giving her back the letters and the diary, don't promise her as much though, he said. But I... Miriam stammered, even as Connor snarled at her. You'll do as I tell you. I'll speak to the Duke. I'll make him understand, he said. Miriam shuddered. She could only imagine what Connor would say to Ralph. He held power over them all, and it was up to him how he exercised it. She thought about Teresa, close to giving birth. She would be devastated by Miriam's departure, and Ralph, too, what would he think of her? In leaving, Miriam was proving the one thing she had always denied, that she was only doing this for her own gain, and that of her family. But it was not true, and tears rolled down her cheeks at the thought of leaving everything she had come to know and love behind. I'll leave. But I've got to tell Teresa. I can't abandon her, Miriam said. Connor shrugged. Very well, keep up your pretense of caring for her. But I know the truth, Miriam. You only ever cared about yourself. And remember this, we're not so very different you and I, he said. Miriam drew herself up, facing him defiantly. He had won, she knew that, but Miriam was not about to allow herself to be compared to a man like Connor Edge. I'm nothing like you. Whatever you might think, she replied, and with that, she marched out of the kitchen, intent on explaining to Teresa why she had to leave, even as she feared the consequences of doing so. Connor smiled to himself. He had all three of them precisely where he wanted them. The Duke believed the two women could turn on him, blackmail him, and ruin him. Teresa believed the Duke would abandon her after the baby's birth. And Miriam believed the threat of blackmail to be great enough so as to break off the engagement and return home, her obvious love for the Duke used against her. Power lay in Connor's hands, and he had worked too hard to relinquish it to two women. Since the death of his father, Connor had been consolidating his position, money, power, high society, he had them all, and he was not about to let them go. Now, he sat down next to the hearth, pulling out the letters he had stolen from Teresa. Connor had guessed there would be evidence as the baby's lineage. Mrs. Mason had told him of Teresa receiving letters, even as the maid had tried to hide them. Connor had suspected them to be with Teresa at Briar Heights, and had slipped back into the house, discovering them in a chest in the bedroom next to that of the maid. But what he had not expected, and had delighted in discovering, was the truth about the baby's father. He had suspected Ralph, and yet the letters and diary proved the lineage to be far more scandalous. My darling Teresa, what joy your news brought me in this far-off land. I think of you every moment of the day. You are my first thought on waking, and my last as I fall asleep. I did not think I could love you any more than I do, but the words of your last letter gave me such joy as to be unbounded. The news of a child is no scandal to me, and when I return, you shall be my wife." Connor read, folding the letter and placing it back in his pocket with an utterance of disgust. 
He had read it a dozen times, and each time he had marveled at the sheer complacency of the former duke, who had believed his fathering of a bastard should be a cause for such rejoicing. Did he really expect to return to England and marry the little harlot? Connor asked himself, shaking his head, and laughing at the audacity of it all. He was biding his time. Waiting for the right moment to strike. The dowager knew nothing of it, and if Connor's loyalty was to anyone but himself, it was to her, for it was she who had given him his position, and through her he had gained such power and influence over Ralph she had been kind to Connor's father, and it was because of her he held back. To reveal the secret of the baby's lineage would be devastating for her, even if it could prove a necessary evil. But I won't hold back, Connor told himself for even his loyalty to the dowager did not extend as far as sacrificing his own interests. Connor enjoyed holding power over Ralph. He had never liked him, nor his brother. As children, they had played together, the son of the land agent, and the sons of the duke. But Connor had always felt second best. He had no title, and his prospects were tied up with the fortunes of the estate. To see it ruined was not in his interests, but neither did he intend to be pushed out by a duke who believed he did not need the advice of a man who knew the estate far better than he did. When Ralph had disappeared, Connor had known the time for action had arrived, and with his suspicions already aroused, he had taken measures to confirm what he believed to be the case. And I'm not about to allow any of them to spoil my plans, he said to himself, pulling out Max's diary from his pocket and skimming idly through the pages. He had read enough of it to know it only served to confirm the truth of the letters. Max spoke gushingly of his feelings for Teresa, of how they had fallen in love, and of how he missed her terribly. I know it will not be easy, but love is not an easy path to tread. I know I love her, and I love the child, too, my heir, I hope. Max had written, and Connor rolled his eyes, astonished at Max's intentions. Had he returned to England and married Teresa, it would have been the end of him, and the dukedom. No family could survive such a scandal, and Connor knew the former duke would never have asked his advice. I'm saving them all, he told himself, for despite the wedge he had driven between Ralph and Miriam, and the fear he had put into Teresa's heart, Connor believed he was doing the right thing in breaking the triumvirate and sending each of them their separate ways. The very idea of raising a baby in such a way was madness, and the threat hanging over the dynasty was monumental. Connor knew the truth, but it was up to him how he acted on it. If the Duke did as he was told, if Miriam returned home with her payoff, and if Teresa and the baby disappeared, the matter could be forgotten. But there remained one question for Connor, a question he could not readily answer, were Miriam and Ralph really in love? He pondered it now, curious to ask the question, even as he could only believe Miriam was trying to gain an advantage by playing on his sentiments. Well, it won't work, he told himself, smiling as he rose to his feet, intending to show his hand to Ralph and prove his power. Chapter 21 Miriam left the kitchen with tears in her eyes. She was terribly upset, and angry, too. She hated Connor for what he had done, even as she had her doubts as to whether it was not Ralph, too, who had come to the same conclusion. The matter was simple enough, there was no need for a marriage, not now that the possibility of scandal lay open. Connor had made his threat, and his promise, and now Miriam had no choice but to leave, to take the money he offered and return home. At least I'll have helped my family, she thought to herself, even as tears rolled down her cheeks. The house was quiet, and Ralph's bedroom door was still firmly closed. Miriam did not know why she should feel such a need to inform Teresa of her decision. But she still felt a sense of loyalty to the maid, and she was not about to renege on the promise she had made after their encounter in Bluebell Woods. She found Teresa asleep, and closing the door behind her, Miriam hurried to the bedside. Teresa, I need to talk to you, she said, placing her hand gently on the maid's shoulder. Teresa opened her eyes. Her face was still red from crying, and she looked sadly up at Miriam, 
sighing as she struggled to sit up. I was having the most beautiful dream. Max had come back to me, and we were happy together with the baby. We lived in a little cottage in the woods, and there was no one to disturb us or intrude on our lives, she said. Miriam felt guilty for having awoken her from such a perfect slumber, even as she knew Teresa's dreams could never come true. I'm sorry Teresa, but, it's Connor, he's here, Miriam said, and Teresa's eyes grew wide and fearful. Does he have the letters? The diary? She gasped. Miriam thought back to Connor's words, would he really return the diary and the letters if she left? It was a risk she wanted to believe, even as she could not trust Connor to keep his promise. If he returned the letters and diary, he would have no proof of the scandal, but to keep them would maintain the threat, it was all in his power. I believe he does, yes. He knows everything, and I don't know what he intends to do with that knowledge, Miriam admitted. It was true. She did not know Connor's intentions, only his threats, which were certainly not idle. He would wield his power over each of them, and Miriam knew it was in her own power to protect Teresa. If only she did as she was told. Then we're all ruined, aren't we? And especially the Duke. I can't do anything about the baby. When it comes, it comes. Oh, perhaps it would have been better if. She began, but Miriam stopped her. She would not hear such talk. The baby was to be loved and cherished, welcome as a gift and a reminder of the father who had loved its mother with all its heart. It was a terrible sin to think otherwise, and despite the possibility of scandal, Miriam knew the Duke would never desire the willful loss of the child he had vowed to take responsibility for. Don't speak like that, Teresa. You're going to have this baby, and you'll be looked after too. Ralph won't abandon you. And Connor said the same, Miriam replied. It was a dreadful prospect, but one she knew was their only hope. Connor wielded power over the baby, too. He would decide what name the ton spoke of it. Would they call it an heir or a bastard? You mean he'll control me forever? And so will Ralph, and so would you, Teresa said, shaking her head. Miriam gasped. After all she had done for Teresa, to hear her speak in such terms was a bitter and devastating blow. But I wouldn't, Teresa. And neither would Ralph, Miriam replied. And how do I know that? The Duke only wants the baby. He knows it could be the heir, and if it's a girl, he'll cast me out anyway. I'm of no use to anyone. I couldn't remain with you, even if you did get married. It wouldn't work. They'd know, and I'd be sent away. I'm going to leave, Teresa said, and she made to get up, even as Miriam stopped her. You can't. You're about to have the baby. It's me that's going to leave. There's nothing for me here now. If I married Ralph, Connor would reveal the secret. We'd be ruined before we even began. It was a ludicrous suggestion, Miriam said. As she uttered those words, she felt her heart break. This was not about helping her parents or saving herself. It was about love. A practical arrangement had turned into a romance, one Miriam knew now had to end, even as it had only just begun to blossom. Connor had given her no choice, and Miriam knew the time had come to leave. Teresa looked at her in surprise. You're leaving? She asked, as though she had convinced herself of Miriam's intention to remain and exploit the situation to her own ends. Miriam nodded. I've got to. I don't have a choice. There's nothing here for me now. The Duke wouldn't want to marry me, and I can't be a mother to our baby, she said. And what about your family? Don't you need the money to support them? Teresa asked. Miriam had no intention of telling Teresa about Connor's offer of payment. As far as Teresa was concerned, Miriam would be leaving and severing all ties. It was for the best, 
even as Miriam felt a bitter disappointment at leaving under such circumstances. We'll manage. This wasn't ever about the money, Teresa. I wanted to help my family, I admit it. But I wanted to help you and Ralph too. I was always sincere about that. But thanks to Connor. She said, shaking her head with a sigh. Teresa looked at her. She appeared torn, wondering as to the possibility Miriam was telling the truth, even as Connor had planted the suspicion of doubt in her. Miriam could not blame her, she might have thought the same in Teresa's situation. For the maid, all that mattered was the baby, and Miriam knew her leaving would give the child the best opportunity for the future. Well, all I want are the letters and diary back. I want to have the baby and make a new life for myself somewhere far away. I can claim to be a widow. There are lots of widows after the war. I could get a job, perhaps, or enter the poorhouse, I suppose. I'll manage. I always have, Teresa said, shaking her head. Miriam still wanted desperately to help, but she knew there was nothing she could do, not whilst Connor held them in his sway. To remain would be to rouse his wrath, and with the Duke not even talking to her, Miriam did not think he would encourage her to remain. And I wish you all the luck in the world, Teresa, Miriam said, as tears rolled down her cheeks. You've been good to me, Miriam, but, I can't help wonder, well, I don't want to part on bad terms, Teresa said. Miriam knew what she was thinking. Connor had poisoned her mind against her. Teresa believed Miriam only wanted the baby for her own advantage. She had agreed to the plan to further her own ends, to make money, before casting Teresa off. Suspicion was running rife, and Miriam could do nothing but take her leave. I understand Teresa. I've only ever tried to help you. I promise you that, Miriam said, rising from her place at the bedside. I wish you well. Teresa replied, and Miriam took her leave. Tears were rolling down her cheeks as she closed the door behind her, leaning against it with a heavy sigh. She had only ever wanted what was best for Teresa, and for the baby. She had fallen in love with Ralph, and now she would leave with a broken heart, and with the tatters of their plan lying all around her. It was never going to be as simple as I thought it would be, Miriam told herself. She imagined what her mother and father would say when she returned to Podmore Grange. They would be glad of the money Connor had promised her, enough to revive their fortunes and open up the house. But Miriam knew there would be questions, and the breaking of her betrothal would cause even more. The ton would not accept a broken engagement without wondering as to the circumstances. Rumor built on rumor, and Miriam knew there would be difficult days ahead. But what choice is there? She asked herself, glancing across at the Duke's bedroom door. She pictured him, wondering what he was thinking, what he was intending. She had been a fool to imagine he loved her, and a fool to fall in love with him. This had only ever been a flight of fancy, nothing more. It had all seemed so simple at first, marry Ralph, pass herself off as the baby's mother, and help her parents too. But the course of true love never did run smooth, and even a pretense at love had caused nothing but calamity to ensue. I can't talk to him. I don't know what I'd say. I can't tell him I love him, can I? Miriam thought to herself, and it was with a heavy heart she returned downstairs, finding Connor helping himself to ship's biscuits and slithers from a large piece of Stilton. I must say, you appeared quite comfortable as a housekeeper he said, looking up at her as she entered the kitchen. Perhaps, I did what was necessary, Miriam replied, for she had no intention of giving Connor the satisfaction of claiming to have restored her to her rightful place. And you came here by coincidence? He asked. He was pushing her, trying to make her angry with him. My father lost everything. I didn't have a choice. I didn't know what I'd find here. I came here blind, and when I realized the situation, I wanted to help. That's all. But none of that matters now, does it? You won't allow it. 
You could, of course. But you'd always hold the thread over us, wouldn't you? Besides, you don't want Ralph to marry me. I know what you're like, and if he marries me, you'll not be able to control him anymore," Miriam said. But Connor only laughed, cutting a large piece of Stilton, and cramming it into his mouth with a ship's biscuit. He had the manners of a pig, and now he was wallowing in the filth of his own creation, delighting in seeing others suffer because of what he knew. Well, it makes no difference now, does it? You're leaving, and I trust you've said your goodbyes? He asked. Miriam nodded. I need to collect my things, and I doubt you'll provide me with a horse for the journey, or a trap and rider to take me home?" she asked. Connor laughed. Just leave, Miss Watson. That's all you have to do. Just leave, he said, tossing down the cheese knife, and taking a swig from a bottle of claret he had opened. Miriam scowled at him, but there was nothing more to say. She was beaten, and Connor had won. It had all been a fantasy, a remarkable one, but a fantasy. They could not have hoped to have kept the truth about the child hidden, and perhaps it was better for the truth to be known now, rather than later. I'll leave as soon as I'm ready, Miriam replied. You'll leave as soon as I'm ready, Miss Watson. Pack your things. You won't be staying long, Connor replied. With a sigh, Miriam glanced around the kitchen. It was in disarray, the remnants of the game birds, the ingredients for the pastry, and the piece of stilton still all on the table, whilst the fire in the hearth smoldered smokily. The duke would have to fend for himself and take care of Teresa. When the baby came, how would they manage? Do you promise to take care of Teresa? Miriam asked. I promise nothing, Connor replied. But you can't just leave her. She's to have a baby, Anne. Miriam began, but Connor gave an angry exclamation. Don't you think I know that? This whole sorry business revolves around the fact of the baby. If it wasn't for the baby, I wouldn't care. But suffice to say Miss Watson, and despite the circumstances, that baby is the son or daughter of a former Duke of Lancaster. I won't let that be forgotten, he said, and Miriam was relieved to hear even the merest shred of decency in his words. She nodded and made her way out of the kitchen to collect her things. Connor followed her, and she turned to him in surprise. Why are you following me? She asked, and he smiled. Because I'm going to talk to the Duke. Don't worry. I'll tell him you're leaving. I'm sure he won't mind. Connor replied. Chapter 21 Miriam left the kitchen with tears in her eyes. She was terribly upset, and angry, too. She hated Connor for what he had done, even as she had her doubts as to whether it was not Ralph, too, who had come to the same conclusion. The matter was simple enough, there was no need for a marriage, not now that the possibility of scandal lay open. Connor had made his threat, and his promise, and now Miriam had no choice but to leave, to take the money he offered and return home. At least I'll have helped my family, she thought to herself, even as tears rolled down her cheeks. The house was quiet, and Ralph's bedroom door was still firmly closed. Miriam did not know why she should feel such a need to inform Teresa of her decision. But she still felt a sense of loyalty to the maid, and she was not about to renege on the promise she had made after their encounter in Bluebell Woods. She found Teresa asleep, and closing the door behind her, Miriam hurried to the bedside. Teresa, I need to talk to you, she said, placing her hand gently on the maid's shoulder. Teresa opened her eyes. Her face was still red from crying, and she looked sadly up at Miriam sighing as she struggled to sit up. I was having the most beautiful dream. Max had come back to me, and we were happy together with the baby. We lived in a little cottage in the woods, and there was no one to disturb us or intrude on our lives, she said. Miriam felt guilty for having awoken her from such a perfect slumber, even as she knew Teresa's dreams could never come true. 
I'm sorry Teresa, but, it's Connor, he's here, Miriam said, and Teresa's eyes grew wide and fearful. Does he have the letters? The diary? She gasped. Miriam thought back to Connor's words, would he really return the diary and the letters if she left? It was a risk she wanted to believe, even as she could not trust Connor to keep his promise. If he returned the letters and diary, he would have no proof of the scandal, but to keep them would maintain the threat, it was all in his power. I believe he does, yes. He knows everything, and I don't know what he intends to do with that knowledge, Miriam admitted. It was true. She did not know Connor's intentions, only his threats, which were certainly not idle. He would wield his power over each of them, and Miriam knew it was in her own power to protect Teresa. If only she did as she was told. Then we're all ruined, aren't we? And especially the Duke. I can't do anything about the baby. When it comes, it comes. Oh, perhaps it would have been better if. She began, but Miriam stopped her. She would not hear such talk. The baby was to be loved and cherished, welcome as a gift and a reminder of the father who had loved its mother with all its heart. It was a terrible sin to think otherwise, and despite the possibility of scandal, Miriam knew the Duke would never desire the willful loss of the child he had vowed to take responsibility for. Don't speak like that, Teresa. You're going to have this baby, and you'll be looked after too. Ralph won't abandon you. And Connor said the same, Miriam replied. It was a dreadful prospect, but one she knew was their only hope. Connor wielded power over the baby, too. He would decide what name the ton spoke of it. Would they call it an heir or a bastard? You mean he'll control me forever? And so will Ralph, and so would you, Teresa said, shaking her head. Miriam gasped. After all she had done for Teresa, to hear her speak in such terms was a bitter and devastating blow. But I wouldn't Teresa. And neither would Ralph, Miriam replied. And how do I know that? The Duke only wants the baby. He knows it could be the heir, and if it's a girl, he'll cast me out anyway. I'm of no use to anyone. I couldn't remain with you, even if you did get married. It wouldn't work. They'd know, and I'd be sent away. I'm going to leave, Teresa said, and she made to get up, even as Miriam stopped her. You can't. You're about to have the baby. It's me that's going to leave. There's nothing for me here now. If I married Ralph, Connor would reveal the secret. We'd be ruined before we even began. It was a ludicrous suggestion, Miriam said. As she uttered those words, she felt her heart break. This was not about helping her parents or saving herself. It was about love. A practical arrangement had turned into a romance, one Miriam knew now had to end, even as it had only just begun to blossom. Connor had given her no choice, and Miriam knew the time had come to leave. Teresa looked at her in surprise. You're leaving? She asked as though she had convinced herself of Miriam's intention to remain and exploit the situation to her own ends. Miriam nodded. I've got to. I don't have a choice. There's nothing here for me now. The Duke wouldn't want to marry me, and I can't be a mother to our baby, she said. And what about your family? Don't you need the money to support them? Teresa asked. Miriam had no intention of telling Teresa about Connor's offer of payment. As far as Teresa was concerned, Miriam would be leaving and severing all ties. It was for the best, even as Miriam felt a bitter disappointment at leaving under such circumstances. We'll manage. This wasn't ever about the money Teresa. I wanted to help my family, I admit it. But I wanted to help you and Ralph too. I was always sincere about that. But thanks to Connor. She said, shaking her head with a sigh. Teresa looked at her. She appeared torn, 
wondering as to the possibility Miriam was telling the truth, even as Connor had planted the suspicion of doubt in her. Miriam could not blame her, she might have thought the same in Teresa's situation. For the maid, all that mattered was the baby, and Miriam knew her leaving would give the child the best opportunity for the future. Well, all I want are the letters and diary back. I want to have the baby and make a new life for myself somewhere far away. I can claim to be a widow. There are lots of widows after the war. I could get a job, perhaps, or enter the poorhouse, I suppose. I'll manage. I always have, Teresa said, shaking her head. Miriam still wanted desperately to help, but she knew there was nothing she could do, not whilst Connor held them in his sway. To remain would be to rouse his wrath, and with the Duke not even talking to her, Miriam did not think he would encourage her to remain. And I wish you all the luck in the world, Teresa, Miriam said, as tears rolled down her cheeks. You've been good to me, Miriam, but, I can't help wonder, well, I don't want to part on bad terms, Teresa said. Miriam knew what she was thinking. Connor had poisoned her mind against her. Teresa believed Miriam only wanted the baby for her own advantage. She had agreed to the plan to further her own ends, to make money, before casting Teresa off. Suspicion was running rife, and Miriam could do nothing but take her leave. I understand Teresa. I've only ever tried to help you. I promise you that, Miriam said, rising from her place at the bedside. I wish you well, Teresa replied, and Miriam took her leave. Tears were rolling down her cheeks as she closed the door behind her, leaning against it with a heavy sigh. She had only ever wanted what was best for Teresa and for the baby. She had fallen in love with Ralph and now she would leave with a broken heart, and with the tatters of their plan lying all around her. It was never going to be as simple as I thought it would be, Miriam told herself. She imagined what her mother and father would say when she returned to Podmore Grange. They would be glad of the money Connor had promised her, enough to revive their fortunes and open up the house. But Miriam knew there would be questions, and the breaking of her betrothal would cause even more. The ton would not accept a broken engagement without wondering as to the circumstances. Rumor built on rumor, and Miriam knew there would be difficult days ahead. But what choice is there? She asked herself, glancing across at the Duke's bedroom door. She pictured him, wondering what he was thinking, what he was intending. She had been a fool to imagine he loved her, and a fool to fall in love with him. This had only ever been a flight of fancy, nothing more. It had all seemed so simple at first, marry Ralph, pass herself off as the baby's mother, and help her parents too. But the course of true love never did run smooth, and even a pretense at love had caused nothing but calamity to ensue. I can't talk to him. I don't know what I'd say. I can't tell him I love him, can I? Miriam thought to herself, and it was with a heavy heart she returned downstairs, finding Connor helping himself to ship's biscuits and slithers from a large piece of Stilton. I must say, you appeared quite comfortable as a housekeeper, he said, looking up at her as she entered the kitchen. Perhaps, I did what was necessary, Miriam replied, for she had no intention of giving Connor the satisfaction of claiming to have restored her to her rightful place. And you came here by coincidence? He asked. He was pushing her, trying to make her angry with him. My father lost everything. I didn't have a choice. I didn't know what I'd find here. I came here blind, and when I realized the situation, I wanted to help. That's all. But none of that matters now, does it? You won't allow it. You could, of course. But you'd always hold the thread over us, wouldn't you? Besides, you don't want Ralph to marry me. I know what you're like, and if he marries me, you'll not be able to control him anymore, Miriam said. But Connor only laughed, cutting a large piece of Stilton, and cramming it into his mouth with a ship's biscuit. He had the manners of a pig, and now he was wallowing in the filth of his own creation, 
delighting in seeing others suffer because of what he knew. Well, it makes no difference now, does it? You're leaving, and I trust you've said your goodbyes? He asked. Miriam nodded. I need to collect my things, and I doubt you'll provide me with a horse for the journey, or a trap and rider to take me home? She asked. Connor laughed. Just leave, Miss Watson. That's all you have to do. Just leave, he said, tossing down the cheese knife, and taking a swig from a bottle of claret he had opened. Miriam scowled at him, but there was nothing more to say. She was beaten, and Connor had one. It had all been a fantasy, a remarkable one, but a fantasy. They could not have hoped to have kept the truth about the child hidden, and perhaps it was better for the truth to be known now, rather than later. I'll leave as soon as I'm ready, Miriam replied. You'll leave as soon as I'm ready, Miss Watson. Pack your things. You won't be staying long, Connor replied. With a sigh, Miriam glanced around the kitchen. It was in disarray, the remnants of the game birds, the ingredients for the pastry, and the piece of Stilton still all on the table, whilst the fire in the hearth smoldered smokily. The Duke would have to fend for himself and take care of Teresa. When the baby came, how would they manage? Do you promise to take care of Teresa? Miriam asked. I promise nothing, Connor replied. But you can't just leave her. She's to have a baby, Anne. Miriam began, but Connor gave an angry exclamation. Don't you think I know that? This whole sorry business revolves around the fact of the baby. If it wasn't for the baby, I wouldn't care. But suffice to say Miss Watson, and despite the circumstances, that baby is the son or daughter of a former Duke of Lancaster. I won't let that be forgotten, he said, and Miriam was relieved to hear even the merest shred of decency in his words. She nodded and made her way out of the kitchen to collect her things. Connor followed her, and she turned to him in surprise. Why are you following me? She asked, and he smiled. Because I'm going to talk to the Duke. Don't worry. I'll tell him you're leaving. I'm sure he won't mind, Connor replied. Chapter 22 Ralph had fallen asleep. He had ignored the voices of Miriam and Teresa on the landing, wanting only to be left alone to his thoughts. He was thinking about his brother and the last time they had met. Max had told him about the baby, though Ralph had already known about Teresa. He had been happy for him, even as he had warned him of the difficulties the situation would pose. Do you really think they'd allow you to marry? And what about mother? She'd never allow it either, Ralph had told his brother, but Max had been his usual blasé self. I love her, don't I? And if we marry, what harm is there in that? He had said. Max was not the sort of man who always considered the consequences of his actions. He would jump first and ask questions later. In that, the two brothers were opposites. Ralph always thought ahead, and always considered what the worst outcome might be, he was a strategist, and perhaps that was why he was now the one left alive. But he had never imagined his brother might be killed and leave him to pick up the pieces. The possibility of death was not something they had ever discussed. It was taboo to mention it in military circles, as though speaking of the prospect would only hasten its arrival. They won't get me, Max had often said, but they had. Ralph lay on his bed, gazing up at the wooden beams above, the slanting roof reaching down to the window, which was open. There was no sound of the cuckoo, just the gentle rustling of the trees in the breeze which brought with it the sweet scent of the heather. Ralph listened, the house was silent, but then he heard a footfall on the stairs, and footsteps on the landing. It would be Miriam. She would want to talk, and now a knock came at the door. Ralph sighed. He did not want to speak to Miriam. There was no point in doing so now. It had all been a dream, a fantasy, but one they could not continue. The idea of marriage, the very suggestion of it, seemed foolish in light of Connor's threat. 
He held power over Ralph, even as Ralph knew he was right in his assertions concerning the baby. Ralph and Miriam could not live such a life, nor could Teresa. A secret in plain sight would be their downfall, all of them. Go away. Please, just. Leave me alone, he called out, but to his surprise, the door opened. It was not Miriam, but Connor, and Ralph scrambled to his feet, astonished to see the land agent returned. I want to talk to you your grace, Connor said, closing the door behind him. I don't think there's anything more for us to say, do you? Ralph said, but the land agent shook his head. On the contrary your grace. There's a great deal for us to say. You can't stay here forever. Your responsibilities remain. You need to return to Burnley Abbey. Did you imagine the affairs of the estate would cease in your absence? There are things on the Duke himself can see to. I can't manage your estate indefinitely, Connor said, fixing Ralph with a stern expression. Ralph felt like a child, told off by a tutor or governess. He rose to his feet, facing Ralph defiantly. I'll return when I wish, he said, but Connor shook his head. We can contain this scandal your grace. No one needs to know of it. But we can't contain it indefinitely. If you don't return, there'll be questions, rumors, and gossip. But if you make it known you've broken your engagement with Miss Watson, then no trouble need come of it. The baby can be born quietly, and your brother's reputation maintained, along with your own, Connor said. Ralph was taken aback. He had thought Connor believed he was the father of Teresa's baby. Max's name had never been mentioned, and now he stared at the land agent in disbelief. But, how did you know? About Max, I mean? He asked, and Connor smiled. It doesn't matter how I know, but I do know, and if you want to safeguard your brother's reputation, I suggest you return to Burnley Abbey and make good on your duty. Or do you want those women to blackmail you? You're vulnerable to it, your grace. They know everything, Connor replied, raising his eyebrows, as Ralph looked at him fearfully. A sudden, terrible thought occurred to Ralph. What if it had been Miriam who had told Connor the truth? The thought made him feel sick, but the possibility could not be discounted. If Miriam had wanted money, she could easily have revealed the truth, giving power to Connor as well as wielding itself. Perhaps they were in it together? But, the honor of a dead man. It can't be known, the truth can't be known, Ralph exclaimed, but Connor merely shrugged his shoulders. I'm sure it won't be your grace. We've cleared matters up now, haven't we? The baby can be born quietly, and Teresa can be sent away, just as it was meant to be, Connor said. Ralph sighed. He had vowed to help Teresa, and now he wished he had been allowed to do so on his own terms. When he had come to Briar Heights, it had been with the express intention of seeing the baby born quietly. He had promised Teresa a pension and the provision of a cottage where the baby could be raised quietly and out of sight. Miriam's suggestion of marriage had upset those plans, and Ralph cursed himself for getting carried away with the possibility of raising his brother's heir. I suppose you think I'm a terrible fool, unfit for the dukedom, Ralph said, but Connor shook his head. Not at all your grace. We all do foolish things when our passions are raised. It's not your fault she used her womanly charms against you. But it was always to her own advantage, Connor said. Ralph nodded. He had fallen too easily for Miriam's words. He had trusted her sincerity and allowed his own feelings to be carried away. I suppose I was, enamored, Ralph admitted. He knew he had fallen in love with Miriam, even as he had tried hard not to. The matter of marriage had been a business arrangement, nothing more. He knew nothing of her feelings for him, or rather, he could now see the act he had fallen for, and was angry with himself for having done so. And she was clever in enamoring you your grace. But she only ever wanted money, and I'm sorry if my previous words sounded harsh. 
I didn't mean to threaten you, but I had to make you realize the folly you were entering, Connor said. Ralph nodded. He had been a fool, and now was the time to return to duty. There could be no more wallowing in self-pity, if anything, he was far less in awe of his brother's legacy. Ralph was the duke, and it was up to him do his duty. And it was a folly. I see that now, Ralph said, even as he remained somewhat nervous as to Connor's intentions. The land agent held sway over everything. He could hide or break the scandal at will. Somehow, he knew everything, and Connor suspected Miriam of being the culprit in telling him. He felt angry with her. She had betrayed his trust, manipulated him, and used the secret he had shared to her own advantage. He no longer wished to remain at Briar Heights, and taking a deep breath, he pointed to the bedroom door. You'll come back with me then, your grace? Connor asked, and Ralph nodded. Yes, but you must promise me one thing, take care of Teresa. I don't mean bring her back to Burnley Abbey, but I want her taken care of, Ralph said. His loyalty to the maid remained, even as he knew she and the baby had to disappear. Connor nodded. I'll make sure she goes somewhere, quiet. You can go on ahead, I'll see to things here, H.E. said, and Ralph nodded. Very good, he replied, opening the door and stepping out onto the landing. He did not want to see Teresa, his mixed-up feelings would only upset the matter, and he could not help but feel angry with Max as to the mess he had left behind. But as he hurried down the stairs to the hallway, he found himself face to face with Miriam, who was standing in the kitchen door. I need to talk to you, Miriam said, even as Connor came clattering down the stairs behind. I thought you'd left, the land agent said, but Miriam shook her head. I just want to talk to you Ralph, she said, but Ralph had heard enough. I don't need to speak to you. I'm going back to Burnley Abbey. There's nothing more to say, he replied, waving his hand dismissively. He was angry, angry at everything, and as tears rolled down Miriam's cheeks, he pulled on his overcoat and hat, ready to leave at once for Burnley Abbey. I'll have your things sent on your grace, and I'll see to everything here, Connor said, glancing at Miriam, who was now sobbing. Very good. I'll be on my way, Ralph said, and without pausing to even listen to what Miriam might have to say, he left the house. As the door banged shut, Miriam turned to Connor in anger. She had wanted to talk to Ralph and to make him understand, but before she could speak, the land agent grabbed her by the arm and dragged her angrily towards him. The money only comes if you keep your mouth shut, he snarled. But I can't leave like this. I can't, Miriam exclaimed. Then you get nothing. Besides, don't you think he might have listened if he believed you were telling the truth? How did I find out about Max? Connor asked, as an unpleasant smile came over his face. Miriam's eyes grew wide with horror. He thinks I told you? She said, and Connor shrugged. He knows I know. It's up to him how he thinks I know, he said, laughing, as he pushed Miriam roughly away. She drew herself up, brushing away her tears. You're a wicked man. You've turned us all against one another, she exclaimed, but Connor only waved his hand dismissively. He didn't love you Miriam, and if you think he did, you're more foolish than I thought. You've got what you wanted, haven't you? Didn't you come here to help your family? Perhaps you knew about all this before, and this was all part of your plan. Or perhaps you really are an innocent party. Either way, you've got your money and I expect your silence, as does the Duke," Connor replied, and without waiting for her reply, he turned and marched back upstairs, calling to Teresa. Miriam watched him go, cursing herself for her foolishness. She knew what it looked like, that she only wanted money, and it was true, she had come to Briar Heights to earn that money. But as for exploitation, that had never been her intention. Miriam had only wanted to help and her idea of marriage had been a means of doing so. But the stumbling block in all of this, the one thing that could never have been predicted, 
was love. Miriam was in love with Ralph, and to see him go, to hear his anger against her, and to know he believed she was merely a charlatan, interested only in his money, was perhaps the greatest sorrow of her life. And there's nothing I can do to change that, she told herself, as she picked up her bag of meager possessions and prepared to leave. Connor was pleased with himself. He felt like a puppet master, pulling the strings of those around him. He had played the others off against one another, and with the betrothal broken, he had only Teresa left to deal with. Connor knew his position rested on maintaining the possibility of revelation. He would keep Ralph's secret and claim it was for the good of the estate. But the Duke would always know of Connor's advantage. His position as land agent, advisor, and whatever else he might wish in the future was secure. And I certainly won't let him forget it, he thought, as he entered Teresa's bedroom. The maid was sitting up in bed with a fearful expression on her face. What's happening? She asked, as Connor strode over to the bedside. You're leaving Briar Heights, Teresa. That's what's happening. You'll be sent away to have the baby. It's all in hand, Connor replied. Teresa stared at him in astonishment. But the Duke promised, she said, as tears welled up in her eyes. And he'll keep that promise, but without all the nonsense of a false marriage and the claims of a bastard heir. You've been lucky, Teresa. You'll not be abandoned, but neither can you remain here. What did you think others would say? Your pregnancy was known of. Did you really think you could act as the child's mother, whilst the Duke and Miriam made a pretense at marriage? No, Teresa, you can keep your child and do with it as you like. You'll be taken care of, far away from here, Connor said. This was the final part of his plan. The good name of the dukedom would be preserved, and the child would be forgotten. You stole my letters. And the diary too, T. Eresa said, but Connor only waved his hand dismissively. Stole, found, acquired, what difference does it make? Besides, how do you know that? How do you know I wasn't given them? Didn't Miriam know about it all? She's been the housekeeper here. She must have known where you hid them, he said. It was so easy to plant the seeds of doubt. Teresa stared at him in astonishment. She told you? She gasped, and Connor shrugged. I had to find out somehow, didn't I? But come along, hurry up and get dressed. I'll send that old gardener for a horse and trap. You can go to Lancaster. I know a woman there to take you in. You can have the baby there, then you can disappear, he said. Teresa shook her head, looking at him desperately. But I, no, I can't. I can't just leave, can I? What about Ralph? Doesn't he care about the baby anymore? After all he said to me, all he promised, Teresa replied. It was all a foolishness. You didn't possibly think it would work, did you? Anyone would guess the baby wasn't Miriam's, the story of a duchess giving birth a convenient nine months after marriage, when rumors abound of a bastard? No, Teresa. This is the only way. Put such thoughts out of your head and hurry up and get ready. This nonsense is over, Connor said, looking around the room with a satisfied air. He had achieved precisely what he desired, the breaking of the arrangement to hide the fact of the foolishness of the previous duke. It would never have worked, and Connor congratulated himself for saving the reputation of the dukedom, whilst securing his own power, too. There was nothing left but to leave Briar Heights behind and ensure the baby was born quietly and out of the way. Then I'm to be forgotten, Teresa said. Far from it, Teresa. How could you possibly be forgotten? But I warn you, come anywhere near Burnley Abbey, or try to cause trouble, and I'll ensure you regret it, Connor said, fixing Teresa with a glare. If Max was here, he'd never have allowed it, Teresa replied but Connor had no time for such wishful thinking. But he's not, is he? He's dead, and that's that. Enough of this foolishness, Teresa. Get your things ready. 
I'll send the gardener to fetch a horse and trap, Connor said, and with that, he made his way downstairs, smiling to himself at the thought of the power he had wielded, the strings of the puppets pulled precisely as he had intended them to be. Chapter 23 Burnley Abbey had not changed since Ralph's departure, and why should it have done? As he stepped through the door, opened for him by the butler, Mr. Gregson, the familiar scent of wood polish and lilies, his mother's favorite, and the flower of morning, wafted on the air. Good day your grace, the butler said, with the stiff disapproval Ralph had expected. Mr. Gregson would never openly criticize him, but Ralph could well imagine what he thought. Is my mother here? He asked. Ralph was hoping the dowager duchess might not yet have returned from visiting friends. She may not even know Ralph had left, but the butler nodded. She is your grace. In the drawing room, I believe, Mr. Gregson replied. Ralph knew he could not avoid an audience with his mother and now he was resolved to tell her the truth about the baby. It hardly mattered now, and whilst he knew she would be shocked, he wanted her to know the truth, that he had tried to help Teresa and do the right thing by his brother's child. Then I'll see her now, Ralph replied. The butler led him along the familiar corridor from the hallway and knocked at the drawing room door. Ralph felt nervous. His mother would scold him, that was certain. As he entered the drawing room, she looked up at him with both surprise and disapproval. So, here you are Ralph. I can't say I understand what's been going on. I return to Burnley Abbey to be told you've gone, and no one knows where you are. What sort of behavior is that for a duke? She demanded. The butler retreated from the room, leaving Ralph and his mother alone. Ralph took a deep breath determined to explain himself, even as he knew the truth would be painful. I left because I was finding it difficult mother, difficult to take on my inheritance. I'm sorry if you think I've shirked my duties, Ralph replied, pouring himself a glass of brandy from a decanter on the sideboard. I certainly think you did. Your brother would never have behaved in such a way, the dowager exclaimed. She was still dressed for mourning her long black dress and veil standing out starkly against the peacock-covered wallpaper, with its deep blues and golds. No, perhaps not. But if I tell you I was doing it for him, would you believe me? Would you believe me if I told you my brother too, behaved in a way I never would, Ralph replied. He was not about to defend Max, whose hagiography was the stuff of legend. In truth, Max had failed, he had fallen in love with someone he should not have fallen in love with, and Ralph knew their mother would be shocked by the consequences. And what do you mean by that? The dowager asked. Ralph now explained the facts. He held nothing back, telling her about the proposal of marriage and Connor's interference. He was not surprised when his mother sank into an armchair by the fire overcome by the extraordinary revelations concerning her eldest son. But I knew the maid, as far as one does. I never suspected. Oh Max, what foolishness! But don't we all have our failings? The poor boy! Oh, but Ralph, forgive me! How harshly I judged you trying to do the right thing, his mother said, as Ralph kneeled at her side holding a bottle of smelling salts. Ralph smiled. His mother had a forked tongue at times, but she was not one to maintain her rightness in the face of evidence to the contrary. It's all right mother. I'd think the same as you. And it's true, I did run away, but I've come back now, and I hope I've come to my senses, he said, thinking back to the folly of Miriam's plan, and his own foolishness at being taken in by it. But his mother now clasped his hand in hers, setting aside the smelling salts, her initial shock now turning to reasoned consideration. But I can't say I trust Connor. Not at all. He's nothing like his father. A snake in the grass. That's what I've always thought about him. I admit, it seems odd for Miss Watson to seek to help in such a way, but I can't help but think she might have been sincere in her desires. 
Connor, on the other hand, think of the power he now wields, the dowager said. Ralph had thought of little else as he had returned on horseback from Briar Heights. Connor wielded considerable power, and would no doubt hold the fact of that power over the dukedom for many years to come. I know that mother. But think of the alternative. He could ruin us, Max's good name, my own reputation, everything, Ralph replied. His mother nodded. Your father placed his trust too readily in Connor's father. Algernon Edge was a good man, but if he'd been a bad one, well, I wonder as to his son. Are you certain he has your best interests at heart? He spoke of protecting the dukedom. But doesn't he now have it in his power? You've got to make certain you're the one in control Ralph, the dowager said. Ralph knew he had neglected his duties. In truth, he knew nothing of the working of the dukedom, or whether Connor truly had his best interests at heart. The matter of the baby was one thing, but the future of the dukedom also depended on Ralph too. You think I shouldn't trust him mother? But was he lying about Miriam? Did she really only just want the money for herself? Ralph asked. He had thought a lot about Miriam, too, on his ride home. He had felt embarrassed, guilty, even, at having shouted at her, but he had been angry at the prospect of her having manipulated him for her own ends. It was certainly to her advantage to marry you. One can only admire her practicality. But from what I know of her, she isn't the sort of woman to behave as Connor might suggest. Whilst I was away, I met the delightful new Duchess of Crawshaw, a charming young lady named Grace. The Duke's blind you know, and it was Miss Watson who helped bring them together, she was selfless in that. Grace is Miss Watson's closest friend. As soon as you mentioned her, I thought of it. The Duchess spoke so highly of her. It was because of her she and her husband were married. I sense there could be more to this than meets the eye, the dowager said. Ralph sighed. He had not allowed Miriam the opportunity to explain, even as he had thought he knew best. The possibility of marriage could not be entertained, not under the suggested circumstances, but as for Ralph's own feelings, he remained confused. It's foolish of me to say it, mother but I was rather taken with her. The woman you describe is the one I came to know. Her arrival was unexpected, but I thought her sincere, until, well, it was Connor who set a doubt in my mind, Ralph admitted. His mother's words about Miriam and the Duchess of Crawshaw were a sign, if another was needed, of Miriam's sincerity. Ralph had been angry, not just with Miriam, but with the fact of his brother's action. Max had died and Ralph was left to pick up the pieces, even as his brother's virtues were extolled. I'm sure it was Ralph. And now he pulls the strings, doesn't he? I wonder what he said to her. How did he convince her to leave? The dowager asked. Ralph was taken aback. He had not given the matter any consideration. Miriam had left of her own accord, or so it seemed and now his mother was suggesting she, too, might have been played at a game. I don't know, but I suppose, well, if he'd told her I wanted nothing to do with her, which I suppose I did, Anne. Oh, what a mess, Ralph exclaimed, cursing himself for all that had occurred. Teresa should have been sent away, supported, yes, but sent away, and Ralph should have been mindful of his duties, and not wallowed in his feelings of self-pity. We must protect our reputation Ralph. And your brothers, too. We must help Teresa and the child, whatever our sentiments as to how the matter came about might be. And we must ensure Connor's power is checked. There can be no more shirking of duty, Ralph. I understand why you did what you did, but see to it you know how this estate should be run, and run it accordingly. As for your feelings towards Miriam. I wonder if you might consider who's really telling the truth, the dowager said, and lifting her morning veil, she leaned forward and kissed Ralph on the cheek, as the familiar scent of her perfume filled the air. Ralph knew he had been a fool, and too quick to judge, but now he wanted to put things right, beginning with the estate itself. His mother was right. He knew nothing of its affairs, 
nor of Connor's control over it, and before the land agent returned from Briar Heights, Ralph knew he needed to discover the truth of the estate's affairs for himself. We'll say nothing of this to anyone, mother. Right now, only you and I, Miriam and Teresa, and Connor, know the truth. Others might suspect, or think me the child's father, but there's no suggestion of the scandal being revealed, Ralph replied, rising to his feet and taking his leave of the dowager, who now replaced her veil and sat back in her chair with a sigh. Then let's hope Connor's hold on us might be lessened, she replied. Ralph nodded, leaving the drawing room and going straight to his study. He found it in disarray, his own doing, and set about ordering his affairs. The business of a dukedom was complicated, and whilst Ralph had never taken an interest in his father's work, he knew enough about military strategy to ensure he could soon see the wood for the trees. Extraordinary, he thought to himself, leafing through piles of papers, letters, invoices, demands, and realizing just how lax he had been in his own expected administration. Connor had seen to it all. Everywhere Ralph looked, the land agent's signature returned his gaze. He had made serious decisions regarding the estate, selling off a farm and several paintings, too, without even the hint of consultation. Money was unaccounted for, invoices underpaid, demands still to be honored, and payments made here and there, the names of the receiver unrecognizable. None of this makes any sense, Ralph thought, even as he could not fully discern where the trouble lay. He could not put his finger on the problem, but everywhere he looked, discrepancies were obvious. There was no actual proof of wrongdoing, only the suggestion he should not have been so quick to accept Connor's words regarding Miriam's intentions, when his own were questionable. The more he looked, the more he wondered, and as the evening drew in, Ralph was still finding reasons to question the actions of the land agent, who had presented himself as Ralph's loyal and trusted adviser. But then, why was he so keen on my returning to Burnley Abbey? Ralph thought to himself, as he pored over a ledger of accounts relating to the village and its tenants. More discrepancies, more oddities, this time stretching back to his brother's tenure as duke. It seemed the land agent had taken advantage wherever he could, and now, it seemed, he was taking advantage again. Will you dine with your mother your grace? Mr. Gregson asked after the dinner gong had been sounded and the butler had come to inquire as to Ralph's intentions. I, no, is Mr. Edge returned to us? Ralph asked, or her intended to confront Connor as to the discrepancies. A few moments ago your grace, the butler replied. Then have him sent in here. I want to speak to him, Ralph replied. He wondered if Connor had counted on his stepping up to the mark. Ralph had shown so little interest in the affairs of the estate, and it had surely not been difficult for the land agent to make his mark, even as Ralph could not be certain he had done anything wrong. Connor entered the room with a swagger a few moments later. There now your grace. It's all sorted. Teresa is at a boarding house in Lancaster for women of her condition, and Miss Watson is surely now returned to her family, where she belongs, Connor said helping himself to a glass of brandy without invitation. Ralph had lit candles around the room, and now he rose from his desk, curious to see Connor's reaction to his investigations. Is that so? And do you think it was the right thing to do? He asked. Connor turned to him in surprise. Certainly your grace. They intended to blackmail you with your brother's diary. I must say, you were very gracious in seeing Teresa taken care of. I'd not have bothered personally. But if you insist on helping the child, so be it. What's important is this, he said, taking the diary from his pocket and laying it on the Duke's desk. Ralph picked it up, running his fingers along the spine. He had given Teresa the diary as a gift, a memento by which to remember the man she loved. He had not expected it to be used for such nefarious purposes, even as he wondered whether Connor was telling the truth. And you really think she'd have done it? They both would have? He asked. 
Connor raised the glass of brandy to his lips, nodding before taking a sip. I've not doubt of it your grace. But we can rest easily now, can't we? He replied, smiling at Ralph, he returned his look defiantly. And how am I to know of your own honesty Connor? I've been looking through some papers today, and there are things I'd like to know, about the management of the estate in my absence, and during my brother's tenure too, he said. But Connor waved his hand dismissively. Oh don't concern yourself with such things your grace. I've some papers for you to sign, that's all. The duke need only be a figurehead in such matters. But it's important for you to be here at Burnley Abbey. I'm sure you dear mother agrees, he said. Ralph thought back to his mother's words about the land agent. She had told Ralph not to trust him, and Ralph was beginning to his doubts. He could not forget Connor's threat towards him, the angry glint in his eyes as he had spoken of the possibility of revealing the truth about the baby. Connor was a powerful man, and Ralph knew it was he who controlled the estate now. But I want to have a hand in matters, and I'm not so sure about the matter of blackmail, Ralph said, but again, Connor waved his hand dismissively. Don't worry about it your grace, why have a land agent and an advisor, if not to take the strain? He asked. Ralph had asked himself the same question, why keep Connor at all? Something was wrong, very wrong, and whilst he had previously trusted the land agent, the affair with the diary, the discrepancies with the administration of the estate, and the divisions he had created at Briar Heights all suggested there were good reasons for Ralph not to trust him at all. Chapter 24 Ralph was restless that night. He lay awake in his bedchamber, beneath the canopy over his bed, the opulent surroundings a stark contrast to the simplicity of Briar Heights. He was uncomfortable at the thought of all that had happened. He had allowed himself to be angry, and to accept Connor's words as the truth, fearful of the repercussions. It was the coward's way out, he thought, as he rose early the next morning. In every decision, he had thought only of his reputation and of the possible scandal he would face if Connor revealed the truth as to the baby and its lineage. But in doing so, he had sacrificed both Miriam and Teresa, believing them guilty of the threat of blackmail, even as neither had made such a claim. He had not allowed Miriam to explain herself and had shouted her down even as the opportunity for explanation had presented itself. What happened to Miriam? Ralph asked when he met Connor in the hallway the next morning. The land agent looked at Ralph in surprise. She went back to Podmore Grange. I paid her off, he said. Ralph was astonished to hear this. Miriam had taken money for her silence. It filled him with horror, even as he remained resolved to speak to her. Very well, Ralph said, and he hurried off to the stables, intent on riding to Podmore Grange and confronting Miriam for himself. Something was wrong, very wrong, and as he rode across the parkland, Ralph's thoughts to turn to Teresa, too. He thought of her, alone and scared giving birth in a grim boarding house in Lancaster. Max would not have wanted that, and it was not what Ralph had intended either. He had made a promise to Teresa, and now that promise was broken. I was a fool to listen to Connor. None of this is right, H.E. told himself, urging on the horse, and wanting only to talk to Miriam alone, and to hear her side of the story. Podmore Grange lay on the far side of Bluebell Woods, and it took most of the morning to reach it. He had visited the house in its heyday, but now it was a sorry sight. Several of the windows were boarded up, and the garden was overgrown. Ralph dismounted his horse, tethering it on the forecourt before knocking at the door. There was no answer. Miriam? He called out, looking up to the windows above. But only a pair of magpies responded, their cawing echoing across the house which lay in silence. Ralph sighed, sitting down dejectedly on the top step. He felt ashamed for the swiftness of his condemnation, he had thought himself a strategist, and yet he had listened only to the words of one man. Instincts. Trust your instincts, Max had always told him, 
and whilst Ralph knew the value of strategy, there were times when instinct overruled such consideration, as was the case in his feelings for Miriam. Because try as he might, Ralph could not pass over his feelings for Miriam. He had grown fond of her. He had fallen in love with her, and admitting as much to himself only made him feel guiltier for the way he had behaved towards her. The more he thought about it, the more foolish it seemed to think of her as having intended blackmail. He had been suspicious, but only because of Connor having planted the seed of doubt in his mind. I'd no real reason to think it, though, had I? He thought to himself, and the answer was no, but the matter of the payoff remained, and Ralph wondered just how much Connor had paid the Baron's daughter to leave. However much it was, it did not appear to have saved Podmore Grange, and Ralph wondered what had happened to the family in the day following Miriam's return. He was about to leave, intending to ride back to Burnley Abbey and further examine his neglected paperwork, when a mail coach appeared the gates of Podmore Grange. As it pulled up, the horses snorting and stomping their hooves, the driver hailed Ralph, perhaps supposing him to be a footman. I've a letter for Miss Watson. Is she here? The coachman asked, jumping down from the buckboard and holding out an envelope, the writing on which Ralph recognized. It was that of Teresa, he had seen it often enough in her correspondence with Max, she's not, but, I can take it for her. I hope to see her later today, he said, and the driver nodded. You'll save me the task of searching for her. Good day to you, he replied, and climbing back onto the buckboard, he urged the horses on their way. Ralph looked curiously down at the letter, wondering why Teresa should be writing to Miriam. Curiosity got the better of him, and despite his conscientious objections, he opened the envelope. It was from Teresa, and now Ralph read the contents with mounting astonishment. Miriam, I am sorry we parted on such difficult terms, and I want you to know I hold no ill will against you. I said some terrible things, but now I wonder if those things were not mine to say. Connor sent me to a boarding house in Lancaster. I am to have the baby here. I do not know if Ralph had a hand in the matter, but it upsets me terribly to think he might. I refused the help Connor offered me, the money, at least, though I had to accept the circumstances into which he sent me. He told me you refused his offer of money, too. I am glad, for I would not wish anyone to think we had attempted blackmail. It is for that reason I am sorry Miriam. I thought you only wanted money, and now I realize the sincerity of what you tried to do, for me and for the baby. I hope you will find it in your heart to forgive me. God bless you for your kindness, Teresa, Ralph read. His eyes grew wide with astonishment. He could not believe what he was reading. Both women turned down Connor's offer of money, even as the land agent had boasted of their having taken their bribes. But the contents of the letter proved the opposite, and now Ralph could only doubt the story he had been led to believe and could no longer accept the suggestion of Miriam and Teresa being of one mind in blackmail. What a fool I've been, Ralph exclaimed, shaking his head in astonishment. He had taken Connor's word as the truth when all along he had lied. And if he could lie about such an important matter, what other lies had he told, both about the circumstances of the child and the affairs of the estate? Ralph read through the letter a dozen more times, each time cursing himself for having been a fool. It was Connor who had played a game with them all, and now his power was absolute. He had planted the seeds of doubt, and Ralph was under no illusion to think he had surely done the same with Miriam and Teresa. Then I've got to find her. I can't let her think I believe him. But what difference would it make? She can't possibly love me. Not now. She never did. I'm certain of it. But I don't want her to hate me. And perhaps I can still do something to help them both, Ralph reasoned, rising to his feet with a determined defiance. He felt ashamed of having so readily believed Connor's words. The land agent had maneuvered himself into a position of power, one costing much to both Miriam and Teresa, 
not to mention Ralph himself. All three of them had wanted only to help the baby, and whilst the suggestion of marriage had been something of an extremity, its intention had been good. Together, they could surely have found a way, but Connor's poisonous interferences had set each of them against the other, and now they were paying the price. I can't let this rest, not now, Ralph pondered, turning the letter over in his hands. He was still sitting on the steps of Podmore Grange, when a young boy, his pockets spilling over with apples, appeared from the side of the house. He looked at Ralph fearfully, as though he knew he had been stealing and believed he was about to be scolded. They were just windfalls, sir, the boy said. He was perhaps eight or nine years old, with wispy blonde hair and bright green eyes. Ralph smiled and beckoned him over. You can have all the apples you like, boy. But I'll give you a shilling if you tell me where the family went, Ralph replied. The boy's eyes grew wide with astonishment, and Ralph reached into his pocket and brought out a shilling, which he held up to the boy, who grinned at him. They left this morning, sir. I saw them go. That's why I came into the garden. My mother's very poor, and there are so many apples. She's going to make a pie. Apple pies are my favorite, the boy said. Yes, very good, but where did they go? Ralph replied, for he was not about to hand over the shilling until the boy had imparted the desired information. That's easy, sir. They've taken a cottage by the brook. It's three miles or so from here, downstream. The baroness was weeping as they left, and the two sisters were in arm in arm helping the baron. I love to see the two sisters, sir. They're so pretty, and I'm sad they've gone, the boy said. A cottage by the brook, I see. And they're on their way there now, are they? Ralph asked. That's right, sir. They'll be there now, I'm sure. You'll find them in the third cottage in the row, at the far end, beneath the larch trees, where the brook bends its course. I suppose they're just like anyone else now, sir. They're poor, the boy said. Ralph handed over the shilling. He would be able to find the cottage easily enough, even as he felt uncertain what he would say when he did. You've been very helpful, boy. I'm sure the baron wouldn't mind you filling your pockets a few more times. Be on your way, and be sure to give the shilling to your mother, Ralph said. The boy nodded, grinning at Ralph again, before pocketing the shilling and running off around the side of the house. He had dropped one of the apples, and Ralph picked it up, polishing it on his coat and taking a bite. It was tart to the lips, the juices running down his chin. He sat for a while longer on the steps leading up to the house, pondering the words he would say, and wondering what Miriam would say when she saw him. Perhaps she won't want to know me, he thought to himself, even as he knew he had to try. There were a lot of wrongs to right but Ralph was determined to right them one at a time, and now he rose to his feet, tossing the apple core into the shrubbery and untethering his horse. He rode off down the drive, taking directions from a farmhand leading a horse and cart piled high with hay. The brook cottages, sir. Along this way for a mile or so, then across the ford, and you'll find them a mile further downstream on the other side, he told him, tipping his straw hat as Ralph called out a thank you and galloped off. He was determined to discover the truth, and to tell Miriam the truth too, even as he knew she might not want to listen. Chapter 25 It could be worse, Miriam said, glancing around the bare walls of the cottage, as a mouse scuttled across the bare floorboards. How could it be worse, Miriam? Her sister said, beginning to sob as she sank down onto the bed the two of them were to share. A cloud of dust rose, and Claire coughed and spluttered, as Miriam sat down next to her and put her arm around her. We'll soon have it clean and neat and tidy, she said, determined to make the best of the situation. Their parents were in the adjoining room, where their mother was attempting to light a fire, and their father was unpacking the few books and ornaments they had salvaged from Podmore Grange. But what kind of a life is this Miriam? No balls, no soirees, no dinners, no theater. I can't live like this, Claire said, 
shaking her head. But we must make the most of the situation, Claire, Miriam replied. Her sister turned to her with an angry look on her face. We wouldn't have to if you hadn't broken your engagement with the Duke of Lancaster. He'd have given us a dower house. I'd have been invited to every social gathering in the county. But now I'm reduced to this, she said, glancing around her, as her sobs grew louder. Miriam sighed. Her mother had expressed similar sentiments on her return to Podmore Grange. So hopeful had her family been, they had extended their credit with several of the village shops, their debt increasing, and thus their liability, too. There was no money, and their creditors were circling. Miriam's news had been a bitter blow, even as she had not explained the full circumstances of what had happened. It won't be forever, Claire, Miriam tried to reassure her, but her sister was convinced as to the dire future lying ahead of them, and no amount of cajoling could return her to good humor. It's easy for you to say. You had your chance and rejected it. But what chance have I got? Claire demanded. Come on, let's go outside. Problems seem less so in the fresh air, Miriam said, even as she was started to doubt her own words. The cottage stood by a brook, which gushed merrily in the sunshine, a pleasant setting, had they not just left the faded splendors of Podmore Grange. The family's worst fears had been realized, and their father had told them they could no longer afford to inhabit their former home. We can pay some of the debts with the money we make from selling it, he had told them, but it had been of little consolation in the face of all they had lost. The cottage by the brook was a far cry from Podmore Grange, with its opulent decor and sumptuous interiors. Two rooms in a scullery served as their living quarters, whilst a small plot of land to the rear would yield vegetables in due course. Miriam's parents looked tired, they were not used to the labors of the ordinary man or woman, but it seemed their situation was now permanent, even as Miriam knew she could have done something to help them. But I couldn't have taken the money. It would have been as though I really had blackmailed him, she told herself, as she and her sister made their way outside into the fresh air of that sunny summer afternoon. Connor had offered her a handsome payment, but Miriam had refused. She had no intention of being in his debt, or of allowing the land agent to tell Ralph he had paid her off, even though he surely would. Her feelings for the Duke were mixed. She loved him, and yet he had rejected her, and believed the lies of the land agent. It saddened her to think this, and as her mother called to her from the door of the cottage, Miriam knew her life was to be very different from the one she had expected. We'll have to wash these bedsheets in the brook. You and Claire can do it. You'll have to get used to such things. You're not going to be a duchess now, the baroness called out. Miriam knew how upset her mother had been at the news of the breaking of the betrothal. She and Claire had put all their hopes in the possibility of Miriam becoming the Duchess of Lancaster, and with those hopes now shattered, they were both in despair. Miriam's father had somewhat more stoical in his response, shrugging his shoulders, and accepting the situation as he had his own financial demise. We'll manage, we'll have to, he had said, even as Miriam's mother had chastised him. Miriam took the linen from her mother, along with a block of soap, and followed Claire down to the brook. The clear water was flowing fast, and the two sisters waded into the shallows, bringing the sheets with them. Soon, the surface of the water was covered in soap suds, as Miriam and Claire dipped and rubbed the sheets, rinsing them in the flow. The water was cold, but it felt refreshing to stand there, as the water gushed past. Why did he break the engagement, Miriam? Claire asked. Miriam blushed. She had not explained the full circumstances to her sister, even as there seemed little point in holding back the truth. It hardly mattered now, the baby, Teresa, the possibility of scandal. All of it made no difference to their current situation. They were poor, and poor they would remain. He, well, it didn't need to happen, that's why, Miriam said, glancing at her sister who looked at her with a puzzled expression. But why not? You were in love, 
weren't you? You told me you were. It was all rather sudden, but you told me you loved him, Claire replied. Miriam nodded. That much was true. She did love Ralph, and their separation only made that love more apparent. She had not ceased to love him, if anything, her love for him had grown stronger, which was why his rejection had hurt her so deeply. I did love him. I do love him. But there was more to it than that, Miriam replied. Like what? You barely knew him, Miriam. You'd never spoken of the Duke of Lancaster before you went to Briar Heights, and a few days later you return, announcing your intention to marry a man we knew only by reputation, Claire retorted. Miriam dipped the sheet she was holding into the water, watching as the soap suds rose to the surface, before being caught in the current and slept away. It had all been so fleeting, a snatched romance, now disappeared, one she longed for even, as she knew its impossibility. Like a baby, Miriam replied. Her sister gasped, almost falling back into the water in her shock. A baby? But what do you mean? Oh Miriam, you can't mean, no you can't be, Claire exclaimed. Miriam rolled her eyes. Her sister was an innocent in such matters, but even she could not possibly think Miriam had given herself so freely to the passions of the Duke. No Claire, not my baby, Miriam replied, and now she explained the entire situation to her sister, leaving nothing to her imagination. Claire stood in the water, listening open-mouthed, as Miriam recounted her arrival at Briar Heights, her recognition of Teresa, and the unfolding of the story as it had occurred since then. She told her sister of Connor's discovery, and of how he had offered to pay her to keep silent. But why didn't you take the money? Claire exclaimed, as Miriam's explanation came to an end. I couldn't, don't you see? Connor poisoned the Duke's mind against me. He told him I only wanted to blackmail him, and if I'd taken the money, it would be as though I had. But I never wanted that. It was never my intention to blackmail him, Miriam replied. The thought of it had not even crossed her mind. Miriam had wanted only to help Teresa and the Duke too. In that, she was selfless, though there was no doubt her becoming the Duchess of Lancaster would have been to all their benefit. I just can't believe the scandal. A duke and a maid, a baby out of wedlock, what were you thinking Miriam? You couldn't possibly have fooled everyone. We'd have known. We'd have seen you, Claire said, shaking her head. Miriam had to admit the plan was far-fetched and had not been entirely thought through. Out on the lonely moor, hidden away at Briar Heights, Miriam had imagined the possibility of their fooling everyone. But Claire was right, her family would have known, and others would surely have guessed. Little by little the plan would have unraveled, and the scandal eventually been revealed. I just wanted to help Claire, that's all. There was nothing else to it even if the Duke thinks I wanted to blackmail him, Miriam replied. But you really did fall in love with him? Not at first, but eventually. And what about him? Did he love you too? Her sister asked. Miriam was unsure. The Duke had given nothing away. She had sensed his affection for her, the dinners they had shared, the walks on the moor, but everything had changed with Connor's arrival and perhaps the fantasy of possibility had been replaced by the reality of what was to come, had they gone through with the wedding and taken the child as their own. I don't know, probably not. I was caught up in the possibility of it all. I wanted to help you and mother and father, I wanted to help Teresa and the baby, I wanted to help the Duke too, Miriam said. But what about yourself Miriam? You spend so much time helping others but I worry you don't do anything to help yourself. You should be happy, not always trying to make others happy. You didn't need to marry just for us, Claire said. Miriam sighed. She had entered the arrangement with nothing but practical concerns in mind. She had wanted to help her family and marrying the Duke of Lancaster had seemed a sure way of doing so. But in her rejection, Miriam could only feel sorry for herself. She had loved and lost, 
and the boundaries between practicality and her actual feelings no longer existed. She was in love with the Duke, and he had rejected her. It was enough to break her heart, and now she felt a fool for believing a marriage proposal could be a purely practical affair. But I wasn't going to. Not in the end. The rest of it seemed secondary. I wanted to help you. I really did, and at first, I thought I was doing just that. But little by little, my feelings towards him grew. He was kind, generous, and good-hearted, he wanted to help Teresa, even as he struggled with his own sense of duty. I admired him for that, he wasn't like so many other men, arrogant and self-assured. But Connor's words poisoned him against me, Miriam replied, shaking her head sadly. There was nothing more to be said on the matter. The possibility was gone. There would be no marriage, and the baby would be born into obscurity, with Teresa soon sent away. There was nothing Miriam could do to change the situation, and now she was forced to admit she had been wrong, a fool rushing in where angels dared not tread. My poor sister. It shouldn't have been like this. If father hadn't lost his fortune, perhaps you and the Duke. Claire began, but Miriam interrupted her. There was no point in dwelling on the matter any further. This was their life now, and it was not one they would share with the Duke of Lancaster. Miriam wanted only to put the whole sorry affair behind her. They had enough to think about, without worrying about a Duke and his dead brother's child. There's no point dwelling on it, Claire. It's finished. I won't see him again. He can think what he likes about me, but it's not true. I only wanted to help him, and I won't take a penny from Connor. I'll keep his secret. Why wouldn't I? I'm not like that. I don't seek my own advantage at the expense of another. That's for the likes of Connor Edge, and I won't sink to his level. No, Claire, we hold our heads up high. We're respectable women, with a respectable future. I know things aren't easy, but we'll manage, I promise, Miriam said. How they would manage, and what the future held, were questions she remained uncertain of. But Miriam had no intention of being enthralled to the Duke of Lancaster, or his land agent. She had burned her fingers, and she was not about to allow her heart to be broken. We could have managed with the money, Claire said, but Miriam shook her head. I don't want to be in anyone's debt. Not the Duke's, not Connor's, not anyone's. I just want to forget about it, Miriam replied, even as she was struggling to do so. It was not a question of forgetting. She could not stop thinking about Teresa and the baby, had it been born yet? What were the conditions like in the boarding house Connor had sent Teresa to? Miriam had made inquiries for a midwife and had arranged for the woman to come to Briar Heights to assist with the birth. But that would not be the case now. Teresa would give birth alone, and it would be a miracle if she and the baby survived and scathed. But how can you? If you're in love with him, you won't forget about it. You can't just fall in and out of love, Claire said. Miriam sighed. Her sister was right. She could not just fall out of love with the Duke. She had thought of little else but him, Teresa, and the baby since leaving Briar Heights, and still the thought of them persisted. She wanted to know what had happened to Teresa and the baby, and what Ralph was thinking and doing. Don't you think I know that, Claire? Miriam retorted, and now she felt tears welling up in her eyes. None of this was supposed to be as it was. She had only wanted to help, and now she was caught up in the failure of a betrothal, and the loss of future happiness. Miriam had not expected to fall in love with the Duke, but fall in love she had, and now she was to suffer the consequences of rejection. Oh Miriam, I only wanted you to be happy, Claire said. Yes, and perhaps if you hadn't told everyone about the betrothal, it might have been easier to break it quietly, Miriam retorted. She had not meant to snap at her sister, but the fact the betrothal was so widely known had made it much harder for them all. Had the rumors not spread, in part, thanks to Claire, Connor might have behaved differently. 
Claire looked at Miriam in surprise. But I... I was just excited at the prospect, she said, and Miriam sighed. I know you were Claire, and so was I, I got caught up in thinking about it, imagining the dress, and the church, and the celebrations. I wanted to marry him. I was in love with him. I still want to marry him. I'm still in love with him, she exclaimed, wondering if she had been too quick to allow their separation. Where had her fighting spirit been? She thought back to Grace and Henry, they had fallen in love, and nothing had stopped them from expressing that love and being together, despite the obstacles they had faced. Miriam had encouraged the match and helped it to be realized. But in her own situation, she was left feeling woefully inadequate. Isn't there anything you could do? If you still love him, make him realize it, Claire said. Again, her sister's naivety shone forth. Miriam knew she was only trying to help. But as for Ralph, it seemed his decision was made. But I don't think he loves me, Claire. That's the real problem. We were to enter a loveless marriage, at least, a marriage without love as its basis. Each of us knew that, and we were doing it for the good of the child. But all that came to nothing, and nothing I say can change that, she replied. But don't you think he loved you? Even just a bit? Even with the faintest of glimmers? She asked, but Miriam shook her head. I don't know, she replied. Miriam had never fallen in love. Not truly. She knew the love of her parents, of her sister, of Grace, but that of romantic love was a mystery. To fall in love was one thing, but for it to be reciprocated was quite another. She had been a fool, and she would be an even bigger fool if she went begging to Ralph, humiliating herself before him, and breaking her heart even further. I wish you'd try. You've done nothing wrong, Miriam. It's this wicked man, Connor, he's the one who poisoned the Duke against you. Perhaps Ralph really did love you. Wouldn't he feel the apparent betrayal more acutely if he did so? Claire said. Miriam nodded. In this, her sister was right, and it set Miriam to wonder what might have been, had circumstances been different. It could all have been very different, she thought as they finished washing the sheets in the water. Wading out onto the bank, they hung the bed linen on makeshift lines between two of the larch trees. It was a breezy day, bright and sunny. The sheets were a brilliant white, reflecting the sun, and flapping in the breeze. Another line was strung up, and more of the sheets hung up to dry, so that the front of the cottage was surrounded by the large, white rectangles, as Miriam and Claire laughed at one another, bobbing in and out of the lines. We can certainly launder, perhaps we'll have to take in other people's washing, Claire said, as they hung up the last of the sheets. We'll need to do something, that's for certain. I could get another job as a maid, I suppose I could write to Grace and ask if she and Henry needed help, I could be her lady's maid, Miriam said, even as the thought of doing so was quite humiliating. She hauled the final sheet over the line. But as she did so, she was surprised to see a figure moving through the flapping mass of bed linen, and as she pulled the sheet she was hanging aside, Miriam was astonished to come face to face with Ralph. Miss Watson, I, I had to see you, he said, as Miriam's eyes grew wide. Miriam? Who's this? Claire asked, as Ralph turned to her and bowed. The Duke of Lancaster, Miriam replied, even as she could not imagine why he had come and what his intentions might be. Chapter 26 Ralph had been watching the scene by the river for some time. He had dismounted his horse in a copse of trees close to the cottage, and hidden behind a large gorse bush, watching the sisters at work. As they had hung out the sheets between the larch trees, he had waited nervously, wondering what he was going to say and how he was going to say it. He did not know how Miriam would react at the sight of him, would she even want to speak to him? Be bold and admit you were wrong, he had told himself, as he had emerged from his hiding place. The sheets were billowing in the breeze, 
and Ralph had become tangled in one, fighting his way through. Now, he stood face to face with Miriam, his heart beating fast, and wanting only to tell her the truth. I didn't think you'd come. I didn't think I'd ever see you again, Miriam said, but Ralph shook his head. I had to come. I had to speak to you. I was foolish before. I'm sorry, he replied, and Miriam looked at him in astonishment. You're sorry? But what do you mean? She asked. Ralph had no script. He was confused. It was all so confusing, Connor, Teresa, Miriam, each of them represented a different strand to the story, but Ralph wanted to hear the truth from Teresa. I was angry the last time we spoke. I didn't let you explain, he said. From what my sisters told me. Miriam's sister exclaimed, but Miriam raised her hand. It's all right, Claire. Let the Duke and I talk, she said. Her skirts were sopping wet, but the sun was strong, and the breeze would soon dry them. Miriam's sister fell silent, and she slipped away through the drying bed linen, leaving Ralph and Miriam alone. I wasn't sure you'd want to talk to me, Ralph said, as they stood by the gushing brook, looking out across the fields beyond, where swaying corn caught the sunshine. I didn't think you'd want to come. We parted on such sorry terms. I know what you think of me, Miriam replied. Ralph shook his head. But I don't. I can't. It's not like that, is it? But I need to know, did you take money from Connor? To buy your silence I mean? He asked. The thought had been torture to him, even as he had refused to believe Miriam capable of such a thing. She looked at him and sighed. Do you mean, would I have blackmailed you? She asked. Ralph felt ashamed for having even thought of the possibility, but he nodded, shaking his head sadly. I, it's just, you didn't, did you? He asked. Teresa's letter proved as much, but Ralph knew he needed to hear it from Miriam too. Connor offered me money. He wanted to buy my silence. But I wasn't ever going to break that silence. It was him who threatened you. Who threatened us all, Miriam replied. Ralph sighed. He had been a fool to trust the land agent, even as he had had his doubts as to Connor's intentions. You're right, and he threatened me too. He wanted me to think you'd betray me. And Teresa too. But you took nothing from him? Ralph asked, still not certain he could believe what she was telling him. I took nothing. I never sought my own advantage in any of this. What I did, I did for my family, for Teresa. And for you, she replied. Then I've been the greatest of fools, he said, raising his hands to head and cursing his own stupidity. But you changed your mind about the whole thing, didn't you? As soon as the question of blackmail was raised, you pushed me aside and wanted nothing to do with me. This was always only a business transaction, wasn't it? Miriam said. Ralph looked up at her. There were tears in her eyes, and now he knew he could not hold back his feelings. He had loved her before, and now he loved her even more. At first perhaps, yes. It seemed an eccentric solution to the problem we faced, but I was willing to see it through. I was grateful to you, but there's more to it now, at least. I'll admit my own feelings, knowing you couldn't possibly feel the same way about me, he said. Ralph knew he was making a fool of himself. He had rejected Miriam and believed she intended to blackmail him. He had been angry with her and allowed Connor to manipulate his feelings towards her. How could she possibly feel anything for him but contempt? It was because of him her family now resided in this hovel reduced to washing their bedsheets in a brook and eking out a living through menial and soul-destroying work. And despite these sad circumstances, Miriam had refused to offer of money from Connor. She had her pride, and no one would take that from her. Then tell me, Miriam said, gazing up at him, as Ralph blushed. But I've been a dreadful fool Miriam. 
I thought ill of you, when my first thought should have been gratitude. You had every right to tell the world about my scandal, or to threaten me with its exposure should I fail to compensate you. But you didn't, and you haven't. It's far more than I deserve, he replied. Because I'm not like that. I don't care about the idle gossip of the ton or offering up a scandal for them to devour. Their wicked whisperings would concern a child, flesh and blood, and I'm not about to see an innocent child treated in such a way. Or, for that matter, Teresa, or you. Let the secret be kept. It doesn't matter, does it? As long as the baby's loved and cared for, I only wanted to help, Miriam said. In these words, Ralph could hear only sincerity. This was the truth, not with the manipulation of Connor's cruel tongue. Miriam had proved herself loyal, and it was land agent who was at fault. Then for that, I can only thank you, and admire you, Ralph replied. He might have walked away now. Thanked her for keeping his secret and wished her well. Had their previous arrangement been merely a transactional one, it would have been easy to do. But Ralph's heart would not allow it. He had fallen in love with Miriam, and to deny that love would be a betrayal. He did not expect her to reciprocate his feelings, how could she, after what he had believed about her? You don't need to admire me. I wanted to help, and for a short while, I did, Miriam replied. But Miss Watson, Miriam, you mistake me if you think if you think I didn't feel something. That's why what I believed to be the case felt like a betrayal. I love you, and because I thought you wanted to blackmail me, my heart was broken, he said. He had held nothing back. He had told her the truth. Love was the reason he had sought her out, just as love had been the reason for his broken heart. Ralph had felt betrayed, deeply so, and to realize Miriam had not betrayed him was a joy beyond compare, even as he could not expect her to forgive him for what he had done. Miriam stared at Ralph in astonishment. You love me? She asked, and Ralph nodded. More than I can ever tell you, he replied. Miriam had not expected to ever see Ralph again, let alone to hear him speak the very words imprinted on her heart. He had just told her he loved her, and despite all that had passed between them, her love for him remained. She had thought it impossible for him to feel like this. It should have been impossible and if she had done what he had thought she had done, it would have been. But the truth was not as Connor had spoken it. He had lied, and in lying, he had proved himself nothing but a wicked coward. But I, do you mean it? She gasped, and he took her hands in his, as tears welled up in her eyes. I do Miriam, and I know I can't expect you to feel the same way. I hurt you, I pushed you away and all because I thought. Oh, it's too dreadful. I look at you now, and I know you could never have done what he said you'd done. Can you forgive me? At least allow us to be friends. I know the sword of Damocles hangs over me, but I could bear it with you, Ralph said, gazing at her imploringly. Miriam had never imagined he felt this way, and she knew he was taking a terrible risk by admitting as much to her. Connor's power was absolute. He had not wanted Miriam to marry the Duke, for it would have broken his own hold over him. If they were to be in love, Miriam knew Connor would have something to say about it. I, I didn't realize you felt like that. We were growing closer, I know, but as for falling in love. She replied, her words trailing off, as he held her hands in his. I don't expect you to feel the same. But I had to tell you Miriam. I had to make you understand how sorry I am for what I've done, for what I thought. It wasn't true. I know that, and I curse myself for believing it, Connor replied. But Miriam shook her head. It did not matter now. None of it mattered. A marriage for convenience, for mutual benefit, it was all as nothing, now. But if Ralph loved her, then surely they could weather any storm. But I do feel the same, she whispered. A look of astonishment came over his face, and he gasped, 
falling to his knees and gazing up at her with a stupefied expression. But, I, do you mean it? He exclaimed, and Miriam nodded. I wouldn't say it if I didn't. But yes, I do. I love you too. But I didn't think you felt the same, Miriam replied. She had convinced herself the Duke wanted nothing more to do with her, that he believed her capable of blackmail and that she had accepted Connor's money to buy her silence. But none of it was true, and now he rose to his feet, taking both her hands in his and raising them to his lips. How sorry I am Miriam. I didn't, I shouldn't have believed him. I felt trapped, backed into a corner. I thought everyone was against me, and my secret would be revealed. I didn't think you'd ever loved me, and after the way I behaved, I could hardly blame you for that. But can you see beyond my faults? He asked. Miriam smiled. She did not blame him for believing Connor's lies. She, too, might have believed them, had the situation been reversed. She had been taken in by Connor, too, and had believed Ralph had no desire to marry her. I don't blame you for what you did. He threatened you, and he made you believe I was the enemy, and Teresa, too. But can't we put those things behind us? Can't we fall in love as we were meant to? She asked. He kissed the tops of her hands, a smile spreading across his face. Certainly we can. If it's what you want, Miriam. But I won't pretend it'll be easy, he replied. Miriam knew the risk. Connor still held power over them. The matter of the Bay's lineage would not be forgotten, and if Connor wanted to reveal it, he could do so with impunity. But somehow, such considerations seemed secondary now they had discovered the truth of their shared love for one another. The storm could be weathered, and they could still help Teresa, even at the expense of their own reputations. Miriam had never cared for the ton, or its opinions, and now Ralph put his arms around her, and kissed her on the forehead. Was it ever going to be easy? We'll prevail together. I know we will. I don't care what anyone say. I love you, and it's clear you love me too, Miriam said, looking up at him with a smile on her face. This was the moment Claire had spoken of, for Miriam to think about herself, rather than anyone else. She loved Ralph and he loved her. All other concerns were secondary, and now their lips met in a kiss, Ralph's arms around her, and the burden of the past days lifted. They knew the truth, and the truth had set them free. With all my heart. I'm sorry I didn't realize it as readily as I should have done. When we sat at dinner, when we walked on the moorland, in everything I saw, everything I heard, everything I know you to be. How couldn't I fall in love with you? We don't need a practical arrangement, Miriam. We just need love, Ralph said, holding her in his arms, as Miriam let out a deep sigh of relief. And what of all the rest? Teresa? The baby? Connor? She asked, but Ralph shook his head. Just for a moment, let's not think about anything but us, he replied, and as they stood by the brook, their arms around one another, Miriam was content to do just that. Chapter 27 Their moment of shared bliss was soon tempered by the realization of what now lay ahead. There was still the matter of Teresa and the baby, not to mention Connor and his deception. What do we do now? Miriam asked, as the two of them stood hand in hand by the brook. Ralph's expression suddenly turned grave. I hate to think of Teresa all alone in Lancaster. Connor sent her to a boarding house. I've got the address here, but I fear for what we'll find there, he said. Then we should go to her. It's too late to prevent a scandal, and why should Connor have a hold over you as he does? He's only got a single hand, and once he plays it, that's it. We can weather the storm. We don't need to hide the fact of the baby, do we? Miriam asked. Ralph sighed. For my mother's sake, we do, yes. She'd hate the thought of Max's reputation being sullied. 
she'd never live it down. But I've noticed any number of discrepancies in Connor's handling of the affairs of the estate. I don't trust him, and neither does my mother. Perhaps we can use that against him. But for now, we need to find Teresa, Ralph said. At that moment, a commotion beyond the rows of flapping bedsheets caused them both to look up. Miriam, where are you? The Baroness called out. I'm here mother, with the Duke of Lancaster, Miriam said, and her mother's face now appeared between two of the linen rectangles. She looked at the Duke in surprise, as now he turned to her and bowed. Good day to you Baroness Mowbray, he said. Miriam's mother appeared flattered, even as she now drew herself up indignantly. Good day to you your grace, and might I ask why you've come here? She asked. It's a simple enough matter my lady, to ask for your daughter's hand in marriage, he said, turning to Miriam, who gasped. The Baroness, too, was taken aback, and she let out a loud exclamation, calling for Miriam's father as she did so. But I thought, wasn't the betrothal broken? She asked. It was, mother, but we've, realized our errors, Miriam replied, as her father now appeared between the bedlamen. What's all this? He asked. The Duke wants to marry Miriam. You can't deny her Frederick. It's what we've been waiting for, Miriam's mother hissed. The Baron smiled and nodded. Young love has a habit of working itself out. I won't deny it, no, for to do so would be folly, he replied. Miriam rushed forward and threw her arms around her father, kissing him on both cheeks, before turning to Ralph with a look of astonishment on her face. And you really mean it? She asked. With all my heart, he replied. There was no time for more elaborate celebrations. Claire was delighted at the news, and immediately set about talking of the modiste and a new dress. The previous one had to be forgotten, she reminded Miriam. But the matter of Teresa was pressing on them, and with Ralph having offered the family lodgings in Lancaster, by way of ensuring a chaperone on their adventure, the whole family set off in a horse and trap, procured from a nearby farm. I don't understand why you need to find the maid? Miriam's mother kept saying, though she was so caught up in the prospect of her own alleviation from poverty she was somewhat distracted. She's with child my lady, and I want to make amends to her. I feel a sense of responsibility, given she was a maid at Burnley Abbey, Ralph replied, glancing at Miriam, who nodded. Ralph kindly brought her to Briar Heights' mother. I was looking after her there. We simply want to know she's all right. Miriam said. Her mother made a comment about charity, clearly approving of the Duke, and forgetting any past opinion she might have had of him. When they arrived in Lancaster, Ralph had the family put up in a good coaching inn on the high street, taking the best rooms and ordering a sumptuous meal, such that Miriam's parents pronounced themselves eternally grateful, whilst Claire suggested she could go at once to make inquiries as to a wedding dress for Miriam. We'll soon see to all that and I'll make sure Podmore Grange returns to its former splendor, Ralph promised. Further thanks were rendered, and it was not until late afternoon when Miriam and Ralph found themselves setting out from the inn on this, their most important errand. Do you have the address of the boarding house? Miriam asked, as they hurried along the handsome high street, lined with fashionable shops and businesses. It's on a back street, Portland Street, this way, I think. Ralph replied, and soon they had left the hustle and bustle of the city center, finding themselves on a narrow street, lined with imposingly tall houses, casting a dark shadow along one side. What a grim place! And to think she's here and all alone, Miriam said, shaking her head, and feeling terribly guilty for playing her part in what Teresa was surely now suffering. Here we are. Number 22, Ralph said as they stood at the bottom of a flight of steps, leading up to large black door, the paint of which was peeling. The windows were grimy and shuttered, and the only sign of habitation was a small painted sign to the right of the door, Mrs. Ellis Mann Proprietress. Rooms available nightly, weekly, monthly. 
respectable only, it said, an unwelcoming sign for an unwelcoming boarding house. Ralph hurried up the steps and knocked. Miriam followed, shuddering to think of Teresa behind the grim facade. What a terrible place, she whispered, as footsteps echoed beyond the door. It was opened by an elderly lady, whom Miriam took to be Mrs. Mann. She wore spectacles, and her gray hair was tied up in a bun. She looked at them through narrowed eyes, her lips pursed. I don't take runaways, courting couples, or those of dubious relation, she said, looking Miriam up and down. And I wouldn't stay in this hovel if it contained the last bed in the city good woman. We're here to see a resident of yours, Miss Teresa Baker, Ralph said. The woman's eyes flashed angrily and she muttered something under her breath. What's that? Miriam asked, and the woman scowled at her. I sent her away, that's what, she said. Miriam and Ralph stared at one another in surprise. But she's with child. How could you do such a wicked thing? Miriam exclaimed. I won't have a baby born under my roof. Not to a woman like her. I run a respectable establishment. I send her to the nuns at Crossmoor. They can look after her, she said, shaking her head, and with that, she closed the door in their faces. A delightful woman, Ralph said with a sigh. Poor Teresa, sent away in her hour of need. We promised to help her, but we didn't. We left her at Connor's mercy, Miriam exclaimed. But we can still make amends. Come now, we must go to the convent and find her. It's not far from here, on the edge of the city, Ralph said, and it was not long before they were in a carriage, heading out of the city into the countryside. The convent stood in meadows where farmland gave way to the moorland beyond. It was hidden amongst trees, its gates closed, and a high wall running around what was presumably the cloister. A short campanile rose from the end of the church, and it was tolling one of the hours, as Ralph and Miriam hurried to gain admittance. Will we be welcome? Miriam asked, for she feared they would not be allowed to see Teresa, or the baby. We can't be made any less so than we were by the Mrs. Mann, can we? Ralph replied, and knocked at the door of the porter's lodge. The door was not opened, but a shutter pulled back, and a woman's voice, soft and gentle, called out to them. Be you stranger now, we bid you welcome, that you may be friend, and may you find in us the presence of Christ himself, it said. Ralph cleared his throat. Sister, thank you. We come looking for a dear friend of ours, Miss Teresa Baker. We're anxious for news of her, or, if it be permitted, admittance to the convent, that we might see her for ourselves, Ralph said. And pray, who asks for this audience? The sister replied. The Duke of Lancaster's sister, and my betrothed, Miss Miriam Watson. Teresa was my maid, and I harbor fears for her safety, Ralph replied. Miriam could not help but be impressed by his words, even as she feared they might not be granted admittance to the convent. Oh, dear Teresa, bless her. She gave birth to the baby yesterday. But she's quite well. You can see her in the parlor, but only briefly. She needs to rest, the sister replied. Miriam breathed a sigh of relief as the bolts were drawn back, and the door swung open. A habited nun stood before them, her veil pulled down over her face, and her head bowed. Thank you sister, Ralph said, as the two of them stepped inside. The nun led them through a side door, into a room where a grill separated two sides, so the sisters could receive visitors without being seen. Miriam and Ralph were invited to sit down, and the door was closed behind them. I'm so glad she's safe, Miriam said and now, through the partitions in the grill, she caught a glimpse of Teresa carrying her baby in her arms. Teresa, thank goodness you're all right, Ralph exclaimed, as Teresa sat down behind the grill. You came. I didn't think you would. I didn't think you'd know where I was. It's a boy, isn't he perfect? 
she said. He's beautiful, Teresa. And how sorry we are for all that happened to you, Miriam replied. Together, she and Ralph explained everything that had happened since their parting of ways. Nothing was held back, and both of them apologized for what had happened to the maid. I'm so sorry, Teresa. I promised to take care of you, but Connor poisoned my mind. I thought, well, it doesn't matter what I thought. I know you took no money, and I know you wouldn't ever have tried to use the facts against me. You loved my brother, and he loved you. That's all that matters, and I intend to make things right, however difficult it might be, Ralph said as their explanation came to an end. And you've not come to take the baby from me? That's what he said you'd do if I stayed, and if you were to be married as you are now. He said you'd cast me out, Teresa asked, but both Miriam and Ralph shook their heads. He had his own wicked reasons for saying such things. I made a vow to you, Teresa. My brother promised you a good life, and it's a good life I intend to give you, Ralph replied. But I can't let your secret be exposed, Your Grace. I won't allow Max's name to be sullied. Please, let me stay here. The sisters have been so kind. They help women like me. If I came back, I'd face only ridicule and rejection. I don't want that, and I don't want the two of you to suffer scandal on my behalf, Teresa said. It was a noble and magnanimous gesture, and Miriam glanced at Ralph, who sighed. Well, can I really ask that of you, Teresa? We can weather the storm together if that's what you want. It won't be easy but we've reason to believe Connor isn't the man he pretends to be, we might yet prevail against him and prevent the revealing of the scandal, Ralph replied. But I don't want my baby to be a scandal your grace. I want him to grow up well, and that doesn't mean in a gilded cage, not knowing anything of who he is. I know you mean well, and you, too Miriam. But if you want to help him, let me know best. If something happens to me, Promise you'll see to his education and his welfare, keep an eye on him, if you like, he needs a godfather after all. But don't make him a scandal, Teresa said. Ralph nodded, and Miriam slipped her hand into his. Teresa's right. The heir doesn't have to live in such a way, she said. No, you're right, and perhaps it's not what my brother would have wanted either, Ralph replied. Perhaps it's what should have been done in the first place, Ralph said, shaking his head. None of us were thinking properly, were we? Miriam replied, feeling somewhat astonished at herself for having entertained such an idea. But we won't abandon you, Teresa. If you won't come back to Burnley Abbey, I'll see to it you have everything you need. I'm sure the nuns will take good care of you in the meantime, Ralph said. He rummaged in his pocket, and to Miriam's surprise, he took out the missing diary and letters. Teresa peered through the grill in astonishment. But, how did you get them? She asked, her eyes growing wide. If something can be stolen, it can be stolen back. I had a feeling Max would want you to have them, and I overheard the two of you searching frantically for them. There was no one else but Connor who could have them, I found them and now they're yours, he said, passing them beneath the grill to Teresa, whose face lit up with gratitude. Miriam smiled. She was glad to see Teresa happy, for this was surely the best outcome for her and the child. They could live far away from any scandal, safe in the knowledge of Ralph's and Miriam's support, should they need it. He's a beautiful baby Teresa. I'm sure Max would be so proud to be his father and to be your husband too, Miriam said. I miss him so very much. But there's nothing I can do to bring him back. But when I look at the baby, I see him, I see Max. That's why I know I'm doing the right thing, Teresa replied. Miriam smiled, glancing at Ralph, who now rose to his feet. And a name for the child? Have you decided that yet? He asked. William. It was my father's name, and he was a good man, too, just as Max was, Teresa replied. Miriam smiled. 
It was a lovely name, and now they took their leave of Teresa, promising to return to the convent very soon to visit. As the sister let them out, Miriam turned to Ralph, who slipped his hand into hers. It's for the best, isn't it? She's happy, and that's all that matters, Miriam said. She felt a sense of sadness at leaving the baby behind, even as she knew it was for the best. It is, and now we've our own future to face, Ralph said. Miriam nodded. She knew it was not going to be easy. The baby was born, a blessing or scandal, depending on the viewpoint taken, and Miriam knew the task ahead would not be easy. Connor? She asked, and Ralph nodded, a grave expression coming over his face. Connor, he replied. Chapter 28 They spent the night in the coaching inn, enjoying a fine dinner in the company of Miriam's parents, and at the expense of Ralph. Miriam shared a room with her sister, and they sat up long into the night, discussing all that was to come. But despite the happiness of her betrothal, Miriam could not help but feel a sense of foreboding at what lay ahead. They were to return to Burnley Abbey, and there they would be confronted by Connor and the threat of a scandal revealed. Are we to return immediately to Burnley Abbey? Miriam asked, after they had breakfasted. There seems little reason to delay. Besides, it won't be long before Connor discovers what happened to Teresa. I want him gone before he can cause any further mischief, Ralph replied, rising from the breakfast table in the parlor of the inn, just as Miriam's parents entered the room. You're not leaving us so soon, are you your grace? Miriam's mother asked, glancing at Miriam, who had also risen to her feet. I'm afraid I must do. We have much to make arrangement for, but if Claire would accompany us, she might act as companion to Miriam, Ralph replied. Claire clapped her hands together in delight, and it was agreed the two sisters would accompany Ralph to Burnley Abbey and arrangements would be made for the restoration of Podmore Grange. We'll soon have it returned to its former glory, the Baroness said, as she bid goodbye to Miriam and Claire. It was not long before they were in a carriage, making all haste towards Burnley Abbey. Miriam had explained everything to Claire, and now they spoke openly about the arrangements for the wedding. It's surely better you have your own children, rather than take care of someone else's, Claire said, as they left Lancaster behind and took to the high road across the moorland. Really Claire, what a thing to say, Miriam exclaimed, blushing, even as Ralph laughed. I agree with you. It was all going to be rather complicated, though the matter of the air remains. I won't cut the boy off, but if any of our own children are of the male line. He said, shaking his head. But this was a problem for another day and another time. Right now, their problem was Connor and, as they drew up outside Burnley Abbey an hour or so later, Miriam felt terribly nervous at the prospect of confronting him. He'll threaten you, Miriam said, catching Ralph by the arm as the carriage driver opened the compartment door. We'll face him together, he replied. Miriam turned to her sister with an anxious expression on her face. Why don't you walk in the gardens, Claire? It's a beautiful day. Pick some blooms for your bedroom, she said, before following Ralph from the carriage and up the steps to the imposing front door of what was now to be her new home. To think of herself becoming the Duchess of Lancaster was remarkable, even as she knew there were still many obstacles lying in her path. It'll be all right, Miriam. He's going to get a surprise, I think, Ralph said, turning to Miriam, who nodded. I just hope he hasn't already acted, she replied. The door was opened by an imperious looking butler, whom Ralph dismissed with a wave of his hand. Is Mr. Edge in my study? Ralph asked, and the butler nodded. He is your grace, with the Dowager Duchess, T. He butler replied. Ralph looked surprised at these words, and now he beckoned Miriam to follow, hurrying across the black and white marbled hallway, with its portraits of Ralph's ancestors staring blankly down. It had been many years since Miriam had last set foot in Burnley Abbey, and now she gazed around her in awe, imagining herself as its mistress. 
I can't think why my mother should be with Connor at this time, Ralph said, as they came to an oak panel door, from behind which came the sound of raised voices. Don't you think I know about that? Really, Connor, are you so foolish to think I don't know anything about my sons? A woman's voice, whom Miriam presumed to be the dowager, was saying. Ralph turned to Miriam with a look of horror. He's confronted her, he exclaimed, and without knocking, for it was his own study, Ralph opened the door, with Miriam following behind. Inside, they found Connor sitting at the desk, and Ralph's mother standing by the hearth. The dowager was a formidable-looking woman, dressed in black, and with a veil over her face. She turned to them in surprise, staring at Miriam, whose heart was beating fast. Ralph? The dowager exclaimed, as Connor rose from behind the desk. Yes, mother, and I've brought Miss Watson too. We're getting married, Ralph said, and at these words Connor let out a roar of objection. Didn't I tell you what would happen if you went ahead with such a foolish proposal? She knows the truth about you, your grace, Anne. Connor began, but the dowager duchess interrupted him. And we know the truth about you, Connor. Oh, yes, my husband long suspected you, but in my grief over Max, well, I'm afraid I rather let it pass. No longer though, if you threaten me, I'll threaten you, and I'll be the one to win, Ralph's mother said. Ralph looked at her in astonishment. But mother, I, I don't understand, he said. Oh, it's quite simple Ralph. But everything was in such disarray, I couldn't be certain, not until you started looking into it. Your father always suspected Connor of wrongdoing. Connor's father was a good and trustworthy man, but little discrepancies soon entered the accounts, after Connor was apprenticed as the land agent. Money missing from here, a stray invoice there, your father was wise enough to document it all. He was biding his time, but wanted to spare Connor's father the shame of discovering the dishonesty of his idolized son, the dowager replied. Lies, utter lies, Connor exclaimed, but Ralph shook his head. No, not lies, the truth. I've seen it for myself and I'm sure when I look further, I'll find more evidence to incriminate you. I know what you're like Connor. You threatened Miriam, you threatened Teresa, and you threatened me too, Ralph replied. He was very calm, and Miriam watched as he now stepped forward, facing the land agent defiantly, his mother standing at his side. I can ruin you. I know your dirty little secret. The bastard child, fathered by the former duke, I can create a scandal, he snarled. Scandal or not, what you've done would send you to the prison hulks. You can reveal the truth about the baby, and I'll reveal the truth about what you've done here. You might ruin us, but I know where I'd rather be, embroiled in scandal with the woman I love and not chained to the hulks or sent to the colonies, Ralph replied. Connor scowled at him, looking from the dowager to the duchess and back, shaking his head. What are you going to do then? He asked, and Ralph glanced at his mother. Your father was a good man, what a pity he didn't raise a good son. But I'm willing to be merciful, if Ralph is, the dowager said. Ralph turned to Miriam. What do you think? he asked. Miriam did not want to see Connor punished in such a dreadful way, even as she knew what he had threatened to do to Ralph, to her, to them all. It would be better if he simply disappeared, his own destruction assured if he ever breathed a word of the baby or its lineage to anyone. I say send him away. I never want to see him again, she replied, remembering Connor's cruel words to her, and his threats against her. Then I'm willing to act mercifully towards you Connor. You don't deserve it, but there we are. You're to leave Burnley Abbey, and the county. I never want to see you again. We'll catalog the evidence against you and keep it should you seek to threaten us again, Ralph said, adopting a businesslike air. It seemed Connor knew he was beaten, and now he drew himself up, pointing angrily at the Duke, even as his power was lost. I won't forget this, he said. And we won't forget it either. Now leave, and tell Mrs. Mason she can leave too, 
the same promise applies to her if you tell her anything of what you know, or allow her to breathe a word of it. If this scandal gets out, I'll hold you responsible, and you'll suffer the consequences of it, Ralph said. Connor clenched his fists, but he said nothing further, striding out of the study and slamming the door behind him. Miriam breathed a sigh of relief, and Ralph put his arms around her, as the dowager sank into a chair by the hearth. Thank goodness you came back Ralph. I couldn't have dismissed him otherwise. What a cruel and wicked man he is, the dowager said. He didn't realize the power we held over him, though I knew nothing of father's suspicions, Ralph replied. Connor was clever. He only took a little here and there. But he pushed it too far. He grew hungry for power. It's been his downfall. But enough of Connor, you must introduce me properly to Miss Watson, if she's truly to be my daughter-in-law, the dowager said, lifting her veil and smiling at Miriam, who fell into a curtsy, and held out her hand. We've a great deal to celebrate, God bless you both, the baron said, raising his glass in a toast. The two families had gathered to celebrate Miriam and Ralph's betrothal. They were drinking claret in the drawing room at Burnley Abbey, having enjoyed a sumptuous dinner, and were now speaking of the arrangements for the forthcoming nuptials. We can't thank you enough, Your Grace. How happy we are to see Podmore Grange restored to its former glories. It's our home again, and how grateful we are to you for allowing that home to be ours, Miriam's mother said, smiling at Miriam and Ralph who sat together by the fire. I'm only too happy to oblige. All's well that ends well, or so it seems, Ralph replied. I can't wait for the wedding. What a happy day it'll be, and then to be an aunt, oh, how wonderful, Claire exclaimed. Miriam rolled her eyes, but she could not help but be caught up in her sister's enthusiasm, even as talk of children was somewhat overstepping the mark. An aunt to an heir, or so we hope, Miriam's father said. Ralph and Miriam glanced at one another. The baron and baroness knew nothing of the baby, not the truth, at least, and now Ralph cleared his throat, addressing Miriam's father on a matter he and Miriam had discussed earlier that day. Heirs are tricky things, aren't they? He said, and Miriam's father nodded. They are, and whilst I thank God every day for the gift of two beautiful daughters, it saddens me my own title will go to a distant heir I know nothing of, discovered by my lawyer after my death, he replied, shaking his head sadly. What if I were to buy your title, sir? It's not unheard of. If it were mine, I could pass it to a son, the son we hope for, Ralph replied. Miriam smiled. The title was for a son already existent, and it was Ralph's intention to buy the barony for William, who would receive it as a gift when he came of age, providing Miriam's father was not still alive at the time. The baron looked at Ralph in surprise, nodding, as though the thought pleased him. It's a generous offer your grace, but not one you'd benefit from yourself. The Duke of Lancaster hardly needs a barony in his own county, does he? He asked but Ralph shook his head. I disagree. I want to help you, and this seems an excellent way of doing so, whilst also securing the title for your grandson, God willing, he replied. Miriam's father smiled and nodded, raising his glass in acceptance. Then I agree your grace, and I thank you, a hundred times I thank you. You've made my daughter the happiest of women and now you extend that happiness to us all through your generous gifts and proposals. God bless you, he said, as all of them raised a glass in a toast. Later that evening, when the others had gone to bed, Miriam and Ralph remained in the drawing room. Claire had played the pianoforte for them, but she, too, had bid them good night, and they sat together by the hearth, as the last of the embers died down. You did a kind and generous thing today, Miriam said, and Ralph smiled. I did it for William. I can still help him, and I know it's what Max would have wanted, Ralph replied. I hope Teresa will be happy. We'll make sure of it, won't we? Miriam asked, as Ralph slipped his arm around her, 
and she rested her head on his chest. We will, but for now, I want to think about our own happiness. You are happy, aren't you Miriam? He asked, and Miriam looked up at him and nodded. I've never been so happy. We've got so much to look forward to, the whole world at our feet, she replied, and he leaned forward and kissed her, a kiss that lingered pleasantly, before they rested their foreheads against one another, caught up in the moment of happiness they now shared. I love you more than I can say, he said, and Miriam smiled. And I love you, too, I love you with all my heart, and I couldn't imagine my life without you, she replied. Epilogue Lancashire, England, 1795 You've done so well Miriam. I'm so proud of you, Ralph exclaimed, as he entered the room to find his wife holding the newborn baby in her arms. Isn't he perfect? Miriam replied, looking up at Ralph a happy, but exhausted, look on her face. Teresa was there, too for she had come to Burnley Abbey to assist with the birth, and now she smiled at Ralph, who could not believe the feeling of love he now felt for the newborn lying in Miriam's arms. The baby was perfect, a boy, born with wisps of black hair, his little features reminding Ralph of Miriam herself, a dimple in his nose, and his fingers clasped around Miriam's thumb. I've never seen anything so perfect, Ralph replied, kneeling at the side of the bed and gazing down at the sleeping baby, his son and heir. I can't wait a moment longer. I've got to see, a voice at the doorway exclaimed, and Ralph looked up to find Miriam's mother, closely followed by his own, and Miriam's sister, Claire, hurrying into the room. We mustn't crowd the mother, the midwife, who had been folding used towels in the corner, now said, but her words were ignored as the baroness and the dowager crowded around the bed. A boy, how wonderful, a baby boy. You must be so proud, Ralph. Imagine what your brother would have said, Ralph's mother said, glancing at Teresa, who smiled. She did not say anything, but Ralph knew what she was thinking. He, too, was grateful for the thought of his brother, who would surely have been proud to see the dynasty continued, and the happiness of them all. And what are you going to call the child? The Baroness asked as she placed her finger gently on the baby's lips, cooing at her new grandchild. Miriam looked at Ralph, who nodded. They had already decided on the name, though no one else had been told. Max, after his uncle, Miriam replied. Tears welled up in Teresa's eyes, and she turned away, as Ralph's mother let out a deep sigh. Oh how beautiful! What a wonderful way to remember him, she exclaimed, smiling at Ralph, who nodded. It seemed fitting. This Max is the heir, his father's heir, and his uncle's heir. We should celebrate that, Ralph replied. The midwife now became insistent as to the necessity of Miriam having her bed rest, and the others took their leave. I'll come and see you very soon Miriam. I'll bring William too. He'll be delighted to see his, New friend, Teresa said, leaning forward to kiss Miriam, and glancing up at Ralph as she did so. He'll know him as a friend, and as his cousin, Miriam replied, keeping her voice low. When Teresa had left, Ralph sat down on the edge of the bed, looking at Miriam and smiling. He slipped his hand into hers, wanting to be close to her, and feeling more in love with her than he had thought possible. His heart was filled with love for Miriam and for the child. This was his family, and how fortunate he felt to be alive, and to know the joys of this simple, yet profound, happiness. I'm so proud of you Miriam, he said, and Miriam smiled. I'm just glad it's over, I suppose. I was anxious about giving birth, as any woman would be. How glad I was to have Teresa at my side. I couldn't help but think about her giving birth to William at the convent. I wish I'd been there with her, Miriam said, looking down at the sleeping baby, whose head was turned towards her breast, his fingers clinging to hers. It doesn't matter now. It's in the past. 
William's growing up to be a healthy, strong little boy. And so will Max, Ralph replied. And what different lives they'll lead. They're cousins, but, won't it all be very difficult when they're older? Do we raise Max as though he's the heir? And what happens when it's discovered he's not? Miriam asked. These were questions they would eventually have to answer. But for now, it was enough for Ralph to bask in the joy of fatherhood, with his wife at his side. He knew the future would be complicated. William was the rightful heir, but Max would grow up believing himself to be, and believed to be by those around him. But Ralph was certain Teresa would not want a conflict and it came to the inheritance, and Ralph had promised her the title of Baron of Mowbray for William when the right moment came. Can't we simply believe it'll be all right? Ralph asked, and Miriam nodded. But I think we already know what it's like to assume such things. We thought a pretense at marriage would be all right, and that we could raise William as our own. Things don't always work out the way we hope, do they? Miriam replied. Then we leave it up to fate, don't we? Ralph said, leaning forward to kiss Miriam before resting his forehead against hers. He had not believed he could love her any more than he did, and yet in that moment, seeing her with the baby in her arms, he loved her more than words could ever say. They had married only ten months previously, the memories of that happy day still fresh and vivid. Now, with the birth of their first child, the future lay ahead, joyous and filled with possibility. I love you so very much Ralph, Miriam said, as Ralph sat back, placing his hand gently on the baby's head and smiling. And I love you with all my heart Miriam. You're everything to me, and every day I fall more in love with you than before, he replied. For a moment, they sat in silence, and Ralph was caught up in thoughts of all they had shared, and all that was come. He was determined to be a good father to his son, and whether he was to be the Duke of Lancaster or not, Ralph was proud to think of raising him as he himself had been raised. He's going to have a happy life. I know it, Miriam said, as Ralph rose to his feet. The midwife had returned and was making impatient noises at the door of Miriam's bedroom. We'll make sure of it, and we'll make sure he knows of his namesake too, Ralph replied. Ralph had vowed to remain loyal to his brother's legacy. There were times he had resented Max, for what he had done, and what he had failed to do. But those times were past, and Ralph wanted only to remember his brother fondly. He had forged his own path as the Duke of Lancaster, and whilst the previous year had not always been easy, he was thankful to have Miriam at his side, an unwavering support in times of difficulty. Come and see me before you go to bed, Miriam said, and Ralph nodded. I'd stay with you always if I was allowed, he said, glancing at the midwife, who raised her eyebrows. I love you, Miriam said, and Ralph smiled at her. I love you too. And I'm so proud of you Miriam, he replied, filled with gratitude at all he had, and all that was to come. Extended Epilogue Lancashire, England, 1815 Connor Edge had bided his time. His dismissal as the land agent of the Burnley Abbey estate had been a bitter blow. Connor was bitter, but he had put his anger and resentment to good use, at least, in his own eyes. He was now a tutor and had overseen the education of several boys in London, most notably the son of the Earl of Horwich, who was destined for high office, and to whom Connor had taught Latin, Greek, rhetoric, and mathematics. He was an accomplished scholar, and had prided himself on the education he had given to his young charges. But his actions had been directed towards one thing, and one thing alone, revenge. Despite having been sent away from Lancashire, the threat the Duke had made being very real, Connor had not allowed himself to go uninformed of the goings-on at the Burnley Abbey estate. He had kept in discreet contact with the butler, Mr. Gregson, whose disgruntledness towards his employer, Connor had put to good use. In this way, and without revealing the truth about Teresa's baby, 
Connor knew precisely the goings-on surrounding the child and his cousin, Max. My dear Mr. Gregson, I write to thank you for the most recent information you have sent me. I enclose a small payment for your trouble, and ask you to furnish me with any further particulars as to the intention of the Duke to send the son of his former maid to London. Yours, in anticipation, Connor, Connor had written, for the butler had informed him of the Duke's intention to send the boy to London for an apprenticeship. It had been twenty years since Connor had left Lancashire for London. He was well respected there and had just been engaged as tutor to the young son of Sir Harvey Guthrie, a member of Parliament, and favourite to succeed the current Prime Minister, Robert Jenkinson. He had rooms at Sir Harvey's London lodgings and tutored the boy, who was not particularly bright, each morning. His afternoons were his own, and Connor was making plans for the arrival of William in London, an arrival he intended to take advantage of. E.D. too brute? And you too, Brutus. Lines from Shakespeare's play, Julius Caesar. At his death, Caesar gasps, staggering backwards, as he sees the man he believed to be trustworthy, betray him by joining his assassination. Anyway, I can tell you're not listening. We'll finish there for now. But when your father tests you, don't blame me if he gives you the rod, Connor said closing the book in front of him and rising to his feet. The boy, too, rose to his feet, looking sullen, and Connor dismissed him, glad to have the rest of the day to himself. He crossed to the window and looked down at the bustling street below. The house was in Mayfair, but Mr. Gregson had written to inform Connor of William's arrival at an inn lying in the shadow of St. Paul's. Connor smiled to himself. This was his opportunity. The boy knew nothing of his lineage, and whilst Connor knew Ralph's threats against him remained, he had every intention of playing a long game against him. The boy knows nothing of me. He'll think I'm merely an interested party acting in his best interests. He'll be naive, just like that fool of a mother of his, Connor told himself, and putting on his outdoor cloak, for it was autumn, and the chill of winter was not far away, he hurried out of the house. Connor had grown used to London during his exile. He knew all its streets, its inns and coffee houses. He had made many influential friends, and all with the same object in mind, revenge. Connor doubted the Duke of Lancaster ever gave him a second thought, and this would be to his advantage in his dealings with William. Mr. Gregson had furnished Connor with a great deal of information over the years, and whilst Connor had never set eyes on the boy, now stepping out into the world as a man, he knew him well enough to know how he might take advantage of him. William knew nothing of his lineage, for if he did, he would know himself the rightful heir of the dukedom. And what a problem that would be, Connor told himself, smiling, as he made his way towards the Spaniards Inn, where Mr. Gregson had informed him William would be lodging. I'm looking for a young man named William Baker, Connor said, leaning against the counter in the taproom where several men sat drinking, and large, tapped, barrels lined the walls behind. The landlord, a large man, his face ruddy and bearded, nodded. He arrived at noon, but he's gone out. You can wait for him, if you like. What name should I tell him? He asked, but Connor shook his head. Don't tell him any name. I'll wait for him. Bring me something to eat and drink. I'll sit over there in the corner. I'll know him when he arrives, he said, smiling to himself at the thought of waiting for the unsuspecting youth. Despite the landlord's brusque appearance, the inn was a comfortable one, and the taproom pleasantly furnished. A fire burned merrily in the hearth, and the walls were lined with paintings of ancient sea battles. Connor sat down at a table in the corner, which commanded a view of the doorway, and was presented with a dish of steamed suet pudding with beef and oysters, along with a draught of beer. Are you an uncle of his? He seemed a fine young man, he's here to seek an apprenticeship I think. His lodgings are being paid for by none less than the Duke of Lancaster, though he doesn't seem of noble birth, the landlord said, as he set the plate of food down on the table. Connor shook his head. I'm just a friend of his, an interested party if you like. 
I've known the Duke for many years, and I want to help the boy find his feet in London. It can be quite an overwhelming sort of place, can't it? Connor replied. The landlord nodded. It can, sir. And I'm sure he'll be glad of your assistance, in whatever form it takes, he replied. Connor smiled and nodded, taking up his knife and fork and digging into the suet pudding with gusto. He was looking forward to making the acquaintance of William, the baby for whom so much trouble had been caused twenty years ago. He was a man now, or becoming one, but the legacy of that event lived on, at least for Connor. It was because of William he had been sent away, and he harbored a resentment towards the boy, as well as to his family. But at first, I'll gain his trust, Connor thought, mulling over the motter, as he scraped the last remnants of the suet pudding from his plate. He had just finished his draft of beer, when the door of the taproom opened, and a young man, around twenty years of age, entered. Connor knew immediately who he was, he had Teresa's dark hair, and the look of his father, of Max, about him. Strongly built, handsome, and athletic. As he looked around him, Connor rose to his feet and stepped forward with a smile. Ah, young man, I understand you've just arrived in London. Might I buy you a drink? He asked. Miriam and Ralph managed to reach the happy ending they deserved. But twenty years later, a boy unaware of his roots will force them to face the past once again. A boy, whose name is William Baker, has turned into a man who deserves to know the truth. Thank you for watching. More audiobooks are coming extremely soon. Until then, watch one of the following videos. Please press the like button, subscribe and hit the notification bell to not miss any new audiobooks. It helps very much with YouTube's algorithm. Follow us on social media and visit our eShop at www.starfallpublicationsbooks.com to receive hot offers. Save 10% on your first order using YouTube 10 code at checkout.